Chapter 166 Also, Al is now somehow, Yume. How should I say it? Vague? It feels like that. Vague? I can't describe it well but, it's like your presence isn't clear, or became vague. Well, leaving that aside. Why yeah? It's not something to be simply pushed away but, there's something else more important to be discussed now. Ardis who understood that agreed. But you see, that Al said that the last time he met me, after going for the crazy woman, a year and a half had passed. It's absurd right? Absurd or not, in the first place, Ardis already have troubles believing that Rona met a younger version of Ardis. It felt like his identity was slowly crumbling away. The Al over there, since it's annoying, we will just call him young Al, was taking care of a pair of female twins together with another person, near. The twins names are Philia and Rihanna, you said you don't have any recollections, right? None. It should be. Just as he heard the names, it felt like two young children with platinum blonde hair was running towards him. Flashed in his mind. Ardis felt a little soothed in his heart suffering in pain, but he was also confused at that emotion that he had never felt before. Then, the young L, Rona continued the narration of the Ardis that Ardis didn't know. As if fallen into an unknown world and lost in it, Ardis continued listening without saying anything. Rona said. It is a different world than the one they are in. Rona who insisted it is a different world narrated the encounter with the Chlorace, the four years that the young Az spent traveling around, then the war with the neighbor country, and then finally the reason why they are here. That girl is the pupil. That's right. He wasn't really up for it at first but, in the end, he accepted it, nonetheless. And it was young Al who asked me to protect Minerva. And then, after getting assaulted by some people, they were transported here. Ardis who heard that had an indescribable expression. It's natural, considering that someone that has the same name as himself was planning something and did something together with Rona in somewhere he didn't know. Even though he was still skeptical at all of Rona's explanation, it's not something he felt he should pursue now. Ardis decided to postpone the problem for later and prioritize on reaching a human settlement as soon as possible. But even so, the appearance of the two that didn't conform to his common sense still somehow irritated him. Don't eat it if you don't want to. No one forced you to eat anyways, Ardis said so coldly to the man who spat the nedulo meat out. If you choose to starve, then so be it. If you have something else, then just eat that. There's no one stopping you. As for the girl that muttered something with a dark expression after hearing Rona's words, he wasn't considerate either. Certainly. Even himself wouldn't want to eat nedulo meat if it's not a situation like this, but now is undoubtedly a situation like that, people who is familiar with camping in the wild would endure and understand it. That's how it should be living outside a town. The actions of the man and the girl was obviously indicating they are people unknown to the world outside of a town, having a warm bed to sleep in a safe town, having choices for their food, having lived their life without any danger to their life. It's the difference of lifestyle he can't say anything about. Normally, he would have dismissed them as people from a different standpoint, but the current Ardis couldn't. The emotions and impatience that seemed to explode if he wasn't careful was suppressed desperately by his reasoning. Though, Ardis wasn't such an upstanding human that he can do that and be considerate of others at the same time. Finishing the painful meal that is just for the sake of filling their stomach, the group is going to sleep. Night watch? Why bother about something like that? Just handle them if they come your way. He answered to the man that suggested to have night watch in order rudely, while having an expression like it is an obvious thing. Waking up as soon as sensing hostility to oneself. It isn't anything special that only artists can do, it's an essential skill that anyone would need living in the wilderness. In other words, people who can't do that will die early. It's a rule of this world. On top of that, there's Rona whose senses are even sharper than Ardis. It's probably impossible for any normal beasts to take them by surprise. It's fine. Minerva will be safe beside me. No problem even if you slept soundly till morning. Since Rona had volunteered to look after the surroundings, Ardis thought there's no need for him to worry about it any longer and proceeded to lie on the ground. It was about the time when the stars in the night sky is still visible that Ardis woke up from his light sleep. The hostility that was directed towards him surfaced his consciousness. A crawling worm huh? After noticing the presence and opening his eyes, he drew the sword from the scabbard beside him. Ardis looked around and found the man awake similarly holding a sword. It seems like he can at least do that much. As for the girl, 
still sleeping now huh? She was still sleeping soundly while lying against Rona, and of course, Rona had noticed the approaching threat as well. Although he didn't seem like he was getting up, the golden tail was waving in the air. It seems like he was staying still to not wake the girl, in other words, it's up to Ardis to dispose of the worm. While enduring to sigh and click his tongue, Ardis approached the girl. Something is not right. A beast. It seems like the man had realized something amiss, but couldn't pinpoint the cause. His gaze was all over the place while holding his sword. Well, he's better than the girl still sleeping now I guess. What are you doing? Ardis was walking towards the girl with his sword unsheathed. The man asked. Ignoring the voice directed at him, Ardis had walked until just beside the girl and took a stance with his sword horizontally. Oi, wait, eh? Startled from the man's voice and waking up, the iris-colored pupils saw Ardis. Quicker than her comprehension, Ardis's sword drew a straight line above her head. In the darkness that couldn't be fully illuminated by the remains of campfire, the sharp slash resounded across her head, and something that fell down was magnificently cut into halves. The worm that tried to latch onto the girl fell behind her and started leaking out liquid. Kaya, the girl who looked behind her and saw the remains of the worms seemed disgusted for a moment, but then immediately turned around and drew the short sword beside her with a serious face. Thua, sorry, Al. Also thanks Munya. Rona yawned grandly and went into sleep again. Rona would have certainly dealt with it in the end but instead, he had completely dumped his task onto Ardis. It's just what Rona would do. Ardis swung away the remains of the worm on his sword before keeping it back in its sheath. Though the girl seemed to be aware of the danger now, it's too late since there are no other threats nearby already. It seems like, no matter she's awake or not, she can't sense presences. To think that you can't handle this much, leaving a town with such measly power is akin to suicide. Ardis sighed because of their recklessness. Don't ask that from a child that had only started taking up a sword half a year ago. Although the man rebuked so, it only made Ardis firmer. Since you left the city, that kind of excuse is meaningless. No matter who, a weaker opponent is much preferred. If you can't even defend yourself from these things, forget about it all. The beasts saw insects in the wilderness wouldn't spare a single thought about what hardships the human experiences. It's a law of nature that the weaklings will be eliminated. If so, the weaklings should more so not leave the safe area that they are in. If Ardis and Rona aren't around, the man and the girl would have probably become food for beasts in no time. There might be a reason why they are like this but, at the current situation, they're just looking to die. Not now but, I will definitely be stronger, there's no meaning if it's not now. Realize that it is now that your life is in danger. Unable to use magic, not able to sense presence, it's impossible to live outside the city. My advice doesn't mean harm. Just return to a town and live peacefully without taking a sword. He thought that the girl is from a rich family seeing her behavior. Her insensitiveness to danger in her life is the proof that she had only lived in a safe environment till now. She's different from someone like Ardis who has nowhere to depend on. If she has somewhere to belong, and if it's a place that is safe, there's no need for her to be leaping into dangerous situation. Although Ardis wouldn't spare any thoughts to a fool looking to die, as expected. He couldn't ignore a girl who isn't even of age that's surely going to be in a pinch sooner or later. Even if he's being harsh, it's also for her that she has to understand it. That's, I can't do it. But without regards to Ardis's concerns, the girl was stubborn. Do you want to die that much? It's not that I want to die. I just want to protect myself and those that are important to me. Is it wrong for me to wish for such strength? Ardis was shaken a little. After all. Denying that would mean denying himself. Not that it's wrong. There's a saying of knowing your limits. Someone who doesn't know their limits will die in no time. Even if you had that sword, as if averting his gaze from the girl who didn't bend down from his saying, Ardis diverted his gaze to the short sword. Ardis could see at a single glance that although it's a simple sword without any frills, it harbored considerable mana. Ardis could create something like that at his will too but, in any case, it wasn't something that a girl like her should have. That's something too much for you. I don't know what kind of family you are from but, without the appropriate skills, even a treasure is set to rot. I know that much, that this sword doesn't suit me. But even so, it's a treasure my Shizu had given. Even if I'm not a suitable user now, eventually. Shizu, a Shizu you say. The word, 
Shizu that the girl said somehow reverberated in Ardis's mind and his hand unconsciously went towards his forehead as if to ease the pain that's going to come. I heard from Rona your Shizu has the same name as me. From what Rona said, the girl's teacher is a person that has the same name as Ardis. Although he didn't know where Connor was using his name, he felt irritated at someone doing something with his name. A weapon like that would only inhibit the growth of the user. If he really did want his pupil to grow, he shouldn't have given her such a weapon but actually push her into a bunch of nedulos or something. To give some girl like you this kind of sword, what an overprotective shizu that is. He must be living a soft life. Please don't insult my shizu. Although the girl seemed reluctant to rebuke any of his words before, she suddenly became aggressive. I'm not insulting him. I'm just saying that he's too soft. Shut up. I won't allow any more scorn. The girl was glaring obviously with rage head on at Ardis. It seems like she really respects her teacher. Allow or not, what are you going to do? This. The girl swung the sword. It seems like her aim was at the sword on his waist. Although it was commendable of her to be considerate even when she is agitated, in the first place, picking a fight with someone out of her league is already the failing point. Ardis deployed a physical barrier in the trajectory of the blade. Ah, just as the sword almost fell out of her hands, the girl had focused herself on grasping the sword that she had allowed Ardis's hand to reach between her gaps. While holding down the girl's hands forcibly, Ardis was sarcastically pointing out the girl's lacking points. What a laughing matter. Not being able to do anything towards someone who is unarmed in this distance. Q. The girl's movements showed that she wasn't in any way familiar with fighting. If a fight broke down, she would be the first to be targeted. Even if he's being a little harsh, he needed her to understand the consequences and give up living a dangerous life. Oi leave it at that. You're being childish. The man interrupted once again. It felt like the people around the girl, no matter this man or her teacher is being too soft. Something like this must be said before she gets hurt. As Ardis rebuked with the difference of being soft and kind, Ardis suddenly realized something was amiss and looked at the sword in the girl's hand. What? A? Eh? What? Since the girl seemed surprised as well. It was probably something unexpected for her too. The short sword in the girl's hand was surrounded in a bright light. The mana contained in the sword entangled with Ardis's mana, then as if a chain reaction happened, the brightness was only increasing. At the same time, enormous amount of information was flowed into Ardis's brain. After being sent by Elian's arts, waking up in a forest, after repelling the unfamiliar beasts that were aiming for him, he met a tough-looking swordsman, a magician with red hair. Then a young-faced archer, they were the three mercenaries of bright stars of white night. The moonless night sky that seemed to be spread out from the horizon. The faces of the innocent twins laughing. A disrespectful woman with light blue hair self-proclaiming to be his servant. Subjugating the demonics beings known as the three great demons. Reuniting with his partner in an unexpected place. Then accepting the teach role because of a favor he owed in the war. The sudden unexpected change that happened to himself after annihilating the organization that attacked his pupil. It wasn't information belonging to another person. He finally understood that it is his own memories. Yug, what is this? With his fuzzy consciousness. He recalled the memories of challenging the woman general with countless comrades. The humiliation and powerlessness resurfaced, then the rage warped his sense of time. Challenged, defeated, an Ardis who was spared continued to find a human settlement like a puppet. He felt like he was experiencing a dream. My head, dream, now. His left hand was supporting his head while he collapsed to his knees. Ardis who was unable to discern whether it is a dream or reality suddenly felt a piece of something found its place in himself. That moment, his consciousness became clear. It wasn't a dream or an illusion. Himself that had wandered in this world for seven days, and himself that had lived in the other world for seven years. Both of them are undoubtedly himself. He understood that not by logic but instinct. Something that was torn apart from himself forcefully finally returned to him found a place to settle down. If he tried to describe it in words, that's the best he can come up with. How much time had passed. Ardis felt his mind was getting clearer. The pain in his head was healing. After finally being able to raise his head, there was the figure of his serious and dedicated pupil. Although she seemed a little afraid. At the same time she looked like she was worried for himself. And naturally, Ardis asked. Why are you here, Minerva? Chapter 167 Chapter 167 A. Minerva was surprised at the sudden change in attitude by Ardis. Well, 
I see, Rona said it just now huh. There was another attack, but faster than Minerva could answer Ardis, he had come to a conclusion by himself. Al, Rona seemed to be unbelieving as he asked in a skeptical tone. He walked slowly to Ardis, and asked in a voice inaudible to Minerva and more, which Ardis is this, although it would be confusing for anyone who didn't understand the question. Ardis seemed a little embarrassed as he said, both, both, yeah, both army, they're both me, I understand now that both army, although I still don't really understand what's the principle behind it, it's probably because of Elian's arts, Elian, why him, Ardis had sat down and while massaging his eyes in silence, when eventually his thoughts seemed to settle, Ardis started his explanation on what he experienced to Rona, the two are lived different lives, Huh, you're believing me? Well I mean, believe or not, I already knew that both Ally and Met are the real deal, and if that's the case, everything makes more sense. So, the reason is the arts that Elian used? It's highly possible. What the heck did he mean by there were still some detailed parts he hasn't figured out? What detailed parts are there when I was actually sent to another world, and then I was even split into two, rather? It's full of shortcomings. Ardis grumbled towards someone who isn't even here, although he was grumbling, there was a surge of inexplicable emotions from his chest. Leaving aside that, there were things to be worried now. You understand now right, Al? Yeah. The flow of time on the other side is different. Wasting any more time here will mean, many years would have passed in the other world. Ardis and Rona are now on the same page and understood the consequences of wasting any more time. Aren't you capable of getting back by yourself? Un, yeah. So why didn't you do it and check what happened on the other side, or procure some food supplies? Of course I would do it if I can make sure I'm able to come back here. What do you mean? I mean, I can go but, I'm not confident to return exactly here. Leaving aside if we actually chose where we were transported, we were forcibly transported this time after all. Every time Rona crosses the world, it seems like he needs some kind of anchor point on the location he should arrive. Rona can use his own lar on this world, and the house in the forest on the other world as anchor points. Although it's possible to travel without an anchor point, Rona didn't know where would he end up but if he did that. Because of that, it would be purely a gamble if he can return to here where he has no ties to. It seems like having no anchors while departing is not a concern but, returning would be a problem. Rona himself might be able to arrive at the house in the forest but, that would mean Ardis and the others would be left stranded in this world. If that's the case, it would be hard for them to reunite. If it's just Ardis left behind, Rona wouldn't worry much, but thinking about Minerva and more, he couldn't experiment with it. On top of that, if Rona were to try it before they met with Ardis and if he couldn't return, it would mean that Minerva and more would be left to die. Though I can now use Ardis's mana as an anchor point, I never tried it before, so there's no guarantee I can succeed. An anchor point designating the destination hue. Ardis's brows furrowed. They're now faced with the problem of ensuring Minerva and more's safety and also the time constraint. They couldn't rest easy and try when there were too many uncertain factors in this situation. In the first place, when you all were sent here, my consciousness returned here as well. It's too unnatural if both of them happened at the same time. I passed out in the organization's base, and if the timing of you all getting sent here matches, it might mean that the reason behind us here could be the same but since the reason is still unknown. Anything now is just a conjecture. I felt the mana flowing unnaturally just before we were sent though. Unnatural? It felt like the mana was converging at a rapid rate, or was it focusing into one point? Focusing into one point. That moment, it felt like Rona remembered something and suddenly raised a voice. Ah, what is it? No but, we encountered with some polluted water just now. Something like that came out in this season? Un, I thought it was quite out of season. As well but. It mentioned something like a place where vast mana gathers, I didn't give much thought about it at first but come to think of it, it's strange. A place where mana gathers huh? If that had woken up at this time, then it must have came into contact with that? That's certainly something worth checking. What about going after the night? The Al today would have no complaints right? Ardis nodded promptly at Rona's question. Alright, since there are no other clues at the moment, let's head there when it's bright. After the plans had been settled. Ardis stood up and conveyed their intentions to Minerva and more. Minerva, more. We will head out as soon as the day breaks, rest well till then. Rona and I will be on the lookout for beasts, 
since it might be a marathon, recover your stamina well. Moore was having skeptical gazes at Ardis who seemed to have his tone softened all of a sudden. On the other hand, Minerva was confused but decided to ask to confirm. A, um, is it Shizu? Of course, all right. Ardis recalled just as he said something that was supposed to be obvious. After all, his appearance was clearly different from the one they knew and then he was treating them badly until he recovered his memories in the other world. Of course they would be on guard. As for Ardis's answer, it was his apology. Sorry for that just now. I didn't phrase it right. But in other words, although he chose his words wrongly, the meaning behind it wasn't wrong. In this world, Minerva and Moore are both too powerless. As for Minerva and Moore who was spared from Ardis's thorny words now, they were still clueless how to talk to him. With a weirdly awkward atmosphere in the air, the group decided to rest themselves for the departure in the early morning. The dawn breaks, and the sunlight slowly warm the surrounding air. Oi, why so hurry when the sun is barely visible? I mean, it's good to arrive earlier but why are we in such a hurry? Moore and Minerva asked seeing Ardis and Rona who had been preparing just as the morning came in order to depart. There's no time to waste. Of course that's the case but the worse it becomes the more time passes. What do you mean? As Ardis's words were spared from thorns, Minerva and Moore could speak more freely, and they became closer than yesterday. Of course, there's still some distance between them but, Ardis's mind isn't on that now. There's time for an explanation later, as they hurried. Actually, Minerva, the world here and your world has a different flow of time. If we took our time slowly, a lot of time will have passed by the time we return. The flow of time? How much difference is there? Rona answered instead of Ardis, and it was more who asked next. The exact isn't clear but, a day here is approximately a year there. A year. Minerva and Moore were both shocked speechless. That's why. We have to look for a way to return as soon as possible. B but we can't even find any signs of human, how can we return? Hearing the vast difference in the flow of time, Minerva who had finally understood the graveness of the situation voiced out but her voice only died down. After talking with Al yesterday, there was a clue we found. It's the polluted water at the river yesterday. Remember it? Hearing that, Moore had a bitter expression as he said. The water demonic being that can speak? Let's save the details for later but there might be a clue at where that guy was. That's why our only direction now is to head over to where that guy is still around and investigate. Still around? Didn't you manage to kill it yesterday? No way, no way. I'm not a fire user at all. I can't really win against it by myself. After all, they're not small fries like Nedjillos. Rona explained like it was something obvious. Moore's expression only became more surprised as he heard it. It was that strong. It's alright. We have Al here too, I mean. Just take it as a good viewing experience. Leaving aside Minerva and more, you better fight properly. Rona was laughing grandly when Ardis made sure to nail in the fact. Isn't there a need to look after them just in case? Anyways, it's an easy win for the owl now right? Then don't treat it as some attraction, practice some restraint. Yes yes, I do have some restraint. But I will pass fighting it head on. It's too much even for me anyways. I feel like you're being too lazy and have just been living a life of eating and sleeping recently. Isn't it good for you to break some sweat sometimes? What lazy? Look at my amazing proportions. Philia and Rihanna would know my attractiveness. No matter day and night, they would surely stick to me and sleep on my belly. What cuties, that? Isn't that because you gained more fat and became more comfortable to lie on than before? Isn't that the proof of your muscles dwindling and being replaced as fat? Eh? That's impossible, I think. Ahead of Moore and Minerva who seemed nervous that they will be up against the water demonic being, Ardis and Rona were lightly joking with each other. Rona who had peeked at his own belly in silence said so without a speck of nervousness. Should I try dieting? Chapter 168 Chapter 168 We're arriving soon. Rona's words made Ardis to be more aware of the surroundings. To check out the location in question, Ardis and the others had been traveling in the grasslands following Rona. I can't feel anything like strong radiating mana at all though. That's true. I don't feel anything either earlier. So, is that the small river where you encountered that thing? Ardis's gaze was on the small river while he continued talking with Rona. Un, it's that. It's a small river with nothing special at first glance. There wasn't anything he could detect abnormal, nor any alarming presences. If Ardis didn't hear about the story at first, he probably would have thought that way too. It's a scenery without any oddities in it. Here it comes. Just as Rona said so, 
The plain scenery suddenly changed. The small river changed in color, it looked like something sentient was gaining a solid shape. Just as I thought you fled cowardly with your tail between your legs, you dared to return here. What an unexpected fool, four-legged. With a scornful tone, the dark water was provoking Rona. It's easy to infer the difference in superiority from what he said. But Rona only snorted and answered. Look at the polluted water trying to be smart without even knowing what's going on. Quit spouting nonsense. You shall not escape this time. The dark water that was enraged from Rona's provocation created tens of wart needles from his own body. Your opponent is me. Ardas stepped out between the trajectory of the needles. Creating magic barriers as natural as breathing. The water needles that were heading towards Minerva and more were deflected away. A portion of the water needles were blown to other directions, while some that impaled the ground caused it to crack. What terrifying power! Witnessing the destructive power of the water needles dig a hole about 50 centimeters into the ground, more was speechless. Ardis hadn't stopped, after the barrier served its purpose. He pulled out his sword and drew closer to the dark water. Ardis, who had closed the distance in a moment slashed apart the body of water in the horizontal axis. Who, <laughs> slashing mind body with just a sword. Though it's not anything particularly amazing. But the mass of water that had become two parts separated didn't show any signs of being bothered. Since it's a life form made from a body of water, a physical separation would mean nothing and it will regain its original shape in no time. Of course. Ardis realized that already. Ardis who approached the dark mass of water wasn't given a room for breather as more needles were heading his way. Though this time, the countless water needles came for his back while drawing ox. The dark mass of water didn't seem bothered impaling himself with the water needles. The water needles encompassed Ardis, performing a concentrated attack. Useless. Declaring so, Ardis created same number of ice needles of his own as the water needles coming his way. The ice and water needles crashed into each other and disappeared into nothingness. It must have realized Ardis's strength looking at that. The dark water scornfully laughed. Oh I see, you thought you can take on me with two. Eh, it sounds troublesome, I will pass. There's no need for us both to take you on anyways. But Rona naturally diverted the provocation like it's nothing. It seems like he really intends to only stay there and look after Minerva and more. It had probably realized that just water needles wouldn't cut it. The dark water had now compressed water from the small river into small spheres of water floating in the air, making five of them that looked like they would explode at any time due to the unstableness of the compression. It fired all five of them to Ardis. Judging that avoiding all of them is impossible, Ardis deployed magical barriers to defend against three of them and the other two will just be deflected away without any care. Even if one of them headed towards where Rona and the others are at. Kaya. Minerva screamed unintentionally. Don't move okay. As he warned, Rona made his own magical barrier against the water sphere. The moment when the water sphere touched the thin purplish film, the intense pressure behind it caused powerful shaking that could be felt even behind the barrier. The water sphere that unleashed all its energy in an instant shook the atmosphere all around them with a ringing sound to their ears. Following the curvature of the barrier, the water sphere dug into the ground, causing the entire grassy area to be uprooted. The grassy land around Rona and the others turned back into barren earth. Hey! Ardis. One of them came here. Just move a little. Rona was complaining despite being the one not willing to fight despite saying he would. But Ardis did not care any further. Oi, what the heck is that power? The destructive power that was unleashed from a sphere of water not bigger than his palm was unimaginable. At the same time, he felt exasperated by Ardis's power who had defended against three of them head on and Rona who managed to defend one with a barrier. It's not a level I can comprehend at all. Leaving aside more who was shrugging, the battle only became more intense. What? Only this much? So it isn't any kind of mutated or special subspecies huh? Ardis muttered as he seemed a little disappointed all while injecting mana into his sword that had dulled into a blunt weapon and raising the heat nesting in its blade. How daring to be distracted. Underestimating me means death. On the other hand, the dark water only made tentacles out of its polluted body in a stance to receive the incoming attack. Ardis jumped upwards with an invisible foothold in the air. Ardis tried to close the distance while dodging the dark water's attack in the three dimensions. The tentacles came from all directions. Rot here along with your conceitedness. The dark water extended its tentacles in effort to capture Ardis. The ends of the tentacles glimmered like sharp blades, 
and approached Ardis like predators. Who is the one getting conceited here? Ardis said so coldly and dutifully severed the tentacles. The way he fought didn't seem like he is in danger at all. Ardis showed the composure as if only chasing away a dog that was barking at the front of his house, more imagined so with no particular reason. He really makes the demonic being look not very impressive. Yes, that's true. But surely that can't be the case. Minerva agreed calmly at the commentating. Even while that happened, the tentacles regrew and attacked Ardis, but the person himself only proceeded to cut down more as they came. It doesn't matter. No matter how much you slice, I don't feel any of them. So? Do you think I don't know about that? Ardis rebutted emotionlessly at the water that was getting too confident on its victory. The true form of the dark water is a shapeless life form that parasitize a body of liquid. The dark mass of water they can see is nothing more than the river water flowing downstream. That's why, it's natural that it doesn't feel anything even if parts of it are getting sliced off. Although it's a valid tactic to remove the body of liquid in order to quell the parasite, leaving aside maybe a bottle of water. It's difficult to deal with if the body of water is too large. That's why it's a difficult opponent to meet in places like the sea or a pond. Well, it's not hard to erase everything that is in your influence range. What was that? Ardis's mana became agitated. As his hands reached out to the sky, large masses of heat was manifested into the surrounding. Three, four. The masses that increased in number rotated with Ardis's hand as the axis. The mass that was initially red lost its color and turned white. I'm glad we're not in the sea here. As expected, erasing the sea is not possible. After all, I'm possible. Anxiety can be heard from the dark water's voice after it had realized Ardis's intention. The white colored heat left the caster's hand and fell onto the river. A total of seven white lumps of heat were let loose, and drawing arcs. The places it passed through turned back into normal earth. Stop. Ignoring the pleads to stop, four had headed upstream of the river, while two headed downstream, and one of them headed straight into the dark water. With few moments or silence in between, in the next moment, a compression of shockwave was unleashed, causing strong reverberation in the air. The water in the small river were instantly boiled off and became vapors in the air. And then what was left is only a trench that used to be a small river. The originally not very abundant river was reduced into nothingness. See curse you. The dark water that had defended against it with a barrier on itself could no longer say anything. After all, the volume of liquid that did parasitize is akin to its life force. With that completely lost now, there's nowhere to escape, and there's no way for it to recover the damage on itself. W wait, please wait. The dark water had finally realized its position begged to stop, but Ardis naturally had no reason to comply. What are you saying this late? Biding his farewell short, Ardis manifested white flame on his fingertips and faced the dark water. The dark water tried to escape but, there's nothing other than grasslands around. There's no liquid wherever he can parasitize. H help. The white flame on Ardis's finger was released. Although it was far smaller in scale than the large lump that had dried up the small river, it has more than enough heat to destroy the dark water. Easily penetrating the magic barrier that the dark water desperately put up in defense, the white flame pierced its body and evaporated it. After the steam dispersed and carried away by the light gale, what was left there is a trace of what used to be a small river. Chapter 169 Chapter 169 Good work, seriously, you really did nothing other than spectating her. Huh? Ardis was exasperated at Rona who approached him talking with a relaxed tone. Hey, no way that's the case. I properly looked after Minerva and more right? In the first place, you can easily take care of it so there's no need for me to participate right? Rona was looking at the small river where the dark water disappeared without even a sliver of remorse. Rather than that, Ardis, look. Ardis was prompted and looked at where Rona pointed out, and what he saw was something ovular that looked like a puddle of water reflecting light remaining at the bottom of the dried river. Water that's not it, huh? Well, since there's so much mana flowing out, there's no way it's normal water right? Just like what Rona said. It was a mirror-like surface that looked like water but was radiating powerful mana. The fact that it had held its shape even after Ardis's white flames indicated it is nothing normal. That's what the polluted water said huh, dense mana. Leaving aside Ardis who was muttering, Rona walked towards it. Al, let's investigate it quickly. The water will probably start flowing again soon. I know, 
you two stay a little back, it might be dangerous. Ardis replied to Rona and said so to Minerva and more before following his partner in golden color. What they could see as they peeked inside the ovular mirror. It wasn't the color of the riverbed but branches with green leaves waving in the wind. An unimaginable scenery of trees and branches waving in the wind was seen through the gap. What do you think, NNN? Isn't it the jackpot? It looks similar to the portal I can open to the other world. It certainly looks like it's connected to some other place but it's also possible that it's a totally different world right? Can portals to all kinds of world really be made? Thinking about what happened, this thing must have something to do with it. That might be so but it's a phenomenon that Ardis had never encountered or even heard before. And it appeared at a timing like this, it's too unlikely to be a coincidence. On top of that, if Rona said that the portal that he can open to cross the world looks like this, the chances that this is the right gateway to get back to the other side is high. But even so, it didn't mean that they could just jump into it easily, they are still lacking evidence for them to make a judgment. If it turned out to be a completely different world on the other side, the chances of them returning to the world where the twins are waiting would be near nil. Moore's voice was heard while the two was pondering, Oi, what happened? Is it anything dangerous? NN, it doesn't seem like it, you two come take a look too. Since it didn't seem dangerous, Rona invited the two over. You are, what the heck is this? You might not be able to feel it but, there's a lot of mana around this thing. I think that this might be connected to the other world but. But there's no way to know for sure. Moore started thinking after hearing what Rona said. Then Minerva who was looking at the trees reflected on the mirror suddenly exclaimed. Ah, this is. What is it, Oju-sama? This forest, I think I have seen it before. All gazes were focused on Minerva after hearing what she say. Is that true? Yes, it's a forest near my mansion. The big tree there. It's the tree that we often use as a landmark when we enter the forest. There's no mistake. Minerva was confident as she looked at it closely, and so Rona asked Ardis. You heard her, Al. There's still some risk to take, huh? If possible. He would have liked more time to think about it but, there's also a reason why he can't do that. One of the reasons is the difference in the time flow of the two worlds. One day here would mean a year on the other side. The short time that had passed while they are pondering would have probably meant few hours on the other side. And another reason is the ovular mirror seemed to be changing slowly. Somehow, it looks like it's getting smaller. It certainly looks like it. Minerva and Moore also noticed the change, although it was slight. The size of the ovular mirror was getting smaller. The current size seemed like it can fit two persons at once, and looking closely, the diameter seemed to be dwindling. The polluted water must have absorbed a lot of mana. I disagreed at what Rona said with a nod. Although they didn't know how much mana was absorbed from the mirror because of the dark water, at the very least, the mana radiating from the mirror is decreasing as time goes on. When it eventually exhausts all its mana, it's not difficult to imagine that it will disappear into nothingness. So, how is it going to be? Rona prompted for a decision. There's no other choice than to go. There were no other clues after all, and if they let this chance slip, there's nothing to guarantee they will find another mirror like this. On top of that, Minerva and Moore have to return as soon as possible, and the consequences of not is clear. I'll just judge that although there's still some risk, there's no choice other than to jump in. Well. I guess I will be going first. I still can return if it's not the one after all. After saying that he would be the first, Rona showed no hesitation and jumped into the ovular mirror. Then as if getting sucked into the water surface that didn't splash, Rona's figure disappeared. Then following that, a golden beast showed up at the forest beyond the mirror. Rona had scouted out the surroundings with a speed that was absurd, then was waving back to them with his front leg. Even that movement looked strangely too quick. It reminded them of the difference in time flow. I it seems alright. Who will be going next? Minerva looked a little relieved, and Ardis asked. I will go first. Ojusama will come after me. You don't mind being the last right, Ardis? Ardis nodded wordlessly, and Moore showed no signs of hesitation at all as he jumped into the mirror. Seeing that, it is Minerva's turn now. Ardis pushed on his pupil's back. Is it scary, Minerva? The trembling in the girl's hand can be felt. No. I'm fine. Although it was obviously a lie, it's still better than having her freeze in fear. Ardis hit on Minerva's back gently. Well then, Shizu, I will be going first. Minerva who had come to her resolution jumped into the mirror after saying that. Now, 
Ardis is the only one left. The ovular-shaped mirror had obviously shrunk in size, it is almost two times smaller than how they initially found it as. The size would probably be barely enough for a single person if any more time passes. Ardis was hesitating. If he chose to jump into it, he could probably return to the other world. But that would also mean Ardis would bid farewell to this world. What was the result of challenging the woman general? What happened to his comrades in arms after that? He was always concerned with that in the past seven years. He might never reunite with the people he knows in this world if he chooses to go now. Even if no one survived, he probably can meet up with those that never took part in the expedition. And above all, the woman general that is his nemesis still resides in this world. Rather than a legend that he might or might not meet, the person herself is still leading an army in this world. For the past seven years, the person that he wanted revenge on most is on this side. It is an urge hard to suppress. It is so for the artist that had experienced seven years, and also the artist that had experienced seven days. While holding back his urge to find that woman now with his reasoning, Ardis closed his eyes. He must make a decision now. There's not much time left. If it's six years ago, he might have been able to cut clean from the other world easily. But there are figures that Ardis could see even if he closed his eyes now. If before he met with the twins, before he met with Nia, and before he met with Kyril, something he couldn't have predicted, a world that had no ties to him at all, had now become a place he can return to. Although the heart of revenge that was still burning tried to retain Ardis here. There is also the face of Philia and Rihanna he could see. If Ardis chose to stay in this world, what would happen to them both? Nia might look after them in the end, and Rona who can travel between the two worlds would probably help them as well. But that would be wishful thinking. After all, it is none other than Ardis himself who decided to take the two twins under his protection. Pushing that onto Nia or Rona would be too irresponsible of him. Nia for some reason seems to hold Ardis in high regards as her master and abides him and it became that she looked after the twins because of Ardis. Then there's also a possibility that she would abandon them if Ardis disappeared. Although Rona seemed like he would help them occasionally, he probably wouldn't do anything to the point of sacrificing his own lifestyle to look after them. And Kyril is just someone he hired to educate the twins. Even if he owes Ardis favors, it would be too much for Ardis to think that he can look after the twins until they become adults. In the first place, he doesn't have the financial power to do that. About four or five years more and the twins might be able to stand on their own but, if they lose Ardis's protection now, their future would probably be bleak. The time limit approached slowly. Ardis unconsciously tightened his fist. Confusion, hesitation, faltering, conflict, irritation, a wide range of emotions were flowing out of him. The wish to stay here because of his revenge that he has yet to fulfill while wandering seven days in this world and the unwillingness to abandon what he should protect in the other world that he had lived together in the seven years. Words that sounded like cries can be heard, choosing, either. Only few tens of seconds had passed since he shut his eyes, but Ardis felt it was a long and painful time. Eventually, he made his decision. Ardis shook his head as if to cut himself from his unfulfilled wishes. I will definitely come back. That's what he swore on himself. It is an oath that he will never break. After looking up at the sky that had nothing, Ardis stepped out towards the ovular-shaped mirror. The mirror that can fit a little more than a person sucked in Ardis's body. His vision turned over. While being surrounded in darkness that not a single sliver of light can be felt, Ardis felt his consciousness was getting further. Chapter 170 Chapter 170 It was a sudden pain that woke Ardis from his fuzzy consciousness. Rather than physical pain on his body, it was more like a shapeless pain that ripped apart his soul. It felt like something was pulled out of himself. It's the same sense of displeasure when he was sent back into that world few days ago. Although the sensation was same, he was terribly anxious feeling something was lost after being pulled out from himself. What? No, it's natural huh? After acknowledging something was lost from deep inside himself, along with a sense of lost. Ardis was also strangely convinced. There's no concrete reasoning behind his thoughts of getting convinced. Rather than a concrete reason, it was what he thought would have happened considering what happened. After the sense of something lost thinned out, his consciousness became afloat again. It was Minerva's voice that woke up Ardis who was completely in a deep sleep. 
Please, Shizu, the voice pulled Ardis along and woke him up. The smell of the wet forest was intense. The warm sunshine was poking through his eyelids. Ardis felt the small hand that shook his body while he was waking up. It was his pupil's voice that he could hear. Shizu, are you alright? Shizu, Ardis who opened his eyes found Minerva's face in his limited vision. The iris-colored pupils were worriedly looking at him. Why yeah, I'm fine. Ardis waved his hand and answered, while he tried to stand up. He unconsciously scanned the surroundings with mana. Seeing that there are no threats around, he was relieved for the time being. Although still a little shaky, Ardis managed to stand up. Then he heard a sleepy voice with yawn. You were taking quite the nap, Al. I waited so long I'm bored. His closest partner didn't even express any concern for Ardis, but rather displeased with him. It was Minerva who he knew less who showed more concern for him. Are you still feeling unwell? Should we rest for a little longer? Sorry. Did I worry you? Well, I can't say that I'm at my best but, it's not anything serious, I'm fine. Oi, are you really okay? Just as we saw you arriving here, then you passed out. And that appearance, more showed concern at Ardis, then his voice trailed off at the end. Appearance? That, Shizu, you look. Ardis felt a little confused, and asked Minerva but the person herself seemed a little stuck on words as well. Al, your body regressed to a child again. Then there was his partner that thrusted the truth without mercy to his face. Just as I thought you turned back to normal, and here you are small again. Rona, that saying is a little. It seems like Minerva is concerned with how Rona said it, but Rona himself of course paid no mind. No, it's okay. You don't have to be concerned with that. Ardis said so while looking and verifying his own limbs. The three swords at his waist, skies of myriad colors, springtime mist and moon's blizzard helped him to immediately recognize what state he is in. Ardis understood that something happened to his body again, and even if they worried, nothing will change. Rather than that, there's something they should do right now. So, the problem is where exactly are we at? We already found out about that a little while back. It didn't seem dangerous just now, so I scouted around. Since Al didn't come through for quite a long while, Rona still seemed a little peeved, and Ardis of course knew why. Ardis who was hesitating in front of the mirror for not more than a minute must have been quite a long time for them. So, what's next? We can see Minerva's house if we cross that small hill. It's quite near, about 30 minutes walking and we will arrive. Well, that's certainly closer than expected. It's something worth celebrating. Minerva seemed confident but, there was still a chance that it's a different world, and even if it's the right one, they might be sent totally far away from their destination. But it turned out to be connected to the right one, and the destination they're heading to is just a little ways away. Rather, it is quite a fortunate result. Well, since Al is awake now, let's go. We can finally return now. Having Rona said so, Minerva seemed happy as the reality sank in. Although it was only a day, they had spent it in a place that had no proper food or a safe sleeping place. Minerva who had lived a noble life without any inconvenience would have certainly felt that it was long. Moore's expression also loosened up, although it's a normal thing for him as a former mercenary to camp in the wilderness, as expected traveling in a world that he can't return from and has two powerful foes that he can't do anything against is really taxing. Following Rona who is at the front of the group, Minerva and Moore had light footsteps. On the other hand, the last one of the party, Ardis had a gloomy expression and muttered, how will I have to explain it to them? If Ardis's calculation is correct, then a year had already gone by in this world. In other words, as far as the residents of this world are concerned, Ardis and the others had disappeared for a whole entire year without any clues. Being able to return here doesn't mean everything is solved. And just as expected, Ardis and the others who had arrived at the mansion were pointed at with weapons. It's natural. Moore who only looks like a rough warrior. Ardis who has sharp eyes despite looking young, and a young girl. Minerva who is equipping a short sword at her waist. Furthermore, there's Rona, a golden beast that looks like a predator a meter long. Of course they would be on guard, although the figure of their party would be the main reason. The worst thing is that the soldiers guarding the gate didn't even recognize Minerva. Just as the tense atmosphere continued between the party and the private soldiers, an old servant that passed by recognized Minerva and was able to make peace. And then the news of Minerva who was missing for an entire year returning overturning the entire Duke residency. Everything after that is a huge mess. Just as Ardis expected. 
a year had already passed in this world. The touching scene where the Duke rushed back to the residency after receiving news of the return of his daughter, that was what was supposed to happen but, Minerva herself had only spent a day apart from his further after all. As opposed to the Duke who was so moved that he is in tears, Minerva is in a different sense of confusion. After that, Ardis and Moore stayed the night in the Duke residency and were summoned by the Duke on the next day. Ardis wanted to return to the forest as soon as possible to not worry the people waiting for him but, since the situation is like this, he couldn't easily gloss it over either. Yo, did you sleep well? A voice was heard from behind Ardis who was following after a servant. Looking behind and seeing the owner of the voice, he turned back to the front and replied, So so, you're going to His Excellency as well? Moore walked up to Ardis's side and asked, Yeah, you too? Seeing them walking in the same direction in the same timing, Ardis could easily tell, Well, yeah, it's natural he would want to listen from the core people related in the incident, but the problem is whether he will believe it or not. Depending on it, we might not be able to get out of the residency for quite a while. Moore sighed with a complicated face. Ardis also furrowed his brows. Well, a day or two won't make much difference at this point but, being restricted for a long period will be problematic. Since we weren't thrown into a jail or anything immediately, wouldn't Oju-sama already explained what happened properly? They didn't treat us badly last night, and also I don't think we were held forcibly in the house. From the Duke's perspective, Ardis and Moore had gone missing together with his daughter for a year and reappeared. For anyone who isn't insightful enough, there might have thought Ardis and Moore are the reason, or maybe even the culprit of the incident. Though, a duke being that uninsightful probably isn't possible but, a person's thoughts and standings can change rapidly. What kind of judgment will the current duke hand down? Ardis didn't have any ways of knowing. I want to return home quickly too. Well, if it's going to take long. Rona can go back first. Rona in question is beside Minerva currently. A year had already passed in this world, but the person herself had only experienced the raid incident yesterday. Rona is tagging along her for the time being considering her mental state and to prepare for any unforeseen situations. And in the first place, even if Rona tagged along them, he won't be able to speak in front of the Duke. If so, then it's better if he serves as an escort for Minerva. While thinking like that. Ardis and Rona eventually arrived at a grandiose door. Master, I've brought the two here. Come in. Waiting for a response from inside, the servant opened the door. Ardis who was prompted to enter the room saw Duke Nyarestia sitting opposite of him behind an office desk. There were also escorts on his both sides, it's natural considering what had happened. After Ardis and Moore made it to the front of the desk, after a breath, the Duke started talking. Did you two have a good rest? Of course, there's a comfortable bed prepared for us after all. Moore was strangely nervous as he said so. That's good to hear. Then let's get into it quickly. I don't really have the mood to waste time for any prelude, you see. Duke had a rare impatient expression unlike a noble. What I want to hear, I don't have to explain it now right? That's, of course. I heard a little from my daughter last night already but... There wasn't much time then. And the content was too absurd that believing it easily is impossible. Although they didn't know how much he'd heard from Minerva, a normal person probably wouldn't believe what they have experienced and probably would just dismiss it as a bad joke. What happened in the incident a year ago? And where did my daughter and you two went missing for a year? Why was there not even a news from you two? I hope you can provide a good answer that can convince me. Duke Nyarestia who had the same iris-colored pupils as Minerva narrowed his eyes. It was a unique pressure, only owned by someone who didn't walk the path of physical power but political power. I'm not sure making it believable is possible but, the events happened on that day and what happened after will be explained thoroughly. Though. I'm not completely in the clear about everything too, Moore started his story so, and narrated what happened during the night when the residency was raided, and what happened after that, while leaving behind two points. What Moore didn't reveal to the Duke was that the other world is where Ardis came from, and also Rona is able to understand and converse in human language. After all, getting transferred into another world is already an absurd story. Another absurd story of Ardis originating from that world would just make the whole thing more confusing. Not only will he get confused, they would also be suspected unneedly. It's easy to imagine that a bad kind of attention will be put on them. The fact that Rona can speak human language is the same. He's still being recognized as just a big beast that is reared by a mercenary. 
But if people knew that it can speak, only troubles will arise. Because of that, Ardis had arranged in prior to exclude those two points with more and Minerva, and thanks to that, we can finally find a way back. The entire thing was only a day for us. Moore ended the explanation that he himself isn't sure of. Fumo, it's an unbelievable story but... The Duke had an inexplicable expression and muttered. It's natural. After all, someone who can outright believe an absurd story like this is the strange one. But, Ardis' involvement in this case is a little strange. During the incident, I was sure you wasn't in the scene. Of course. The next suspect would be Ardis. Although he served as a tutor to Minerva. It's not like he gained full trust from the Duke. That itself is something I don't know either. During then, I was in the streets but, then suddenly I felt dizzy and then passed out. The next thing I knew, I came to an unknown land together with Minerva Ju and Commander Moore. Although Ardis has his own inference, it's not like he's convicted on it. And judging that there's no point speaking about it now. He just replied vaguely. What a troublesome matter. Although his vague explanation might become a reason for being suspected. It seems like it was safe. The Duke sighed grandly and laid back on his chair. It's an unbelievable story. I would have too not believed it if not for my daughter's appearance. Appearance? Not understanding his meaning. More questioned. You might not know since you're a single child but, a child like her age will quickly grow. She would have grown a lot in just a year. But how is it? Her appearance is nothing different from a year before. Well, a grown adult might be different, but she is still 12 years old. Going without a change in a year is normally impossible. Ah, I see. Certainly, someone like Moore probably wouldn't change much even a year had passed. But Minerva is still at an age where growth is prime. And being a member of a duke family, new clothes will have to custom tailored for her growth. But considering that she can fit in all her clothes from a year ago, it was obvious for the duke that there wasn't any growth. Even Ardis didn't think that Minerva herself will be the best proof. At the same time, what the duke said made him felt cold sweat. Though, believing what you all said is still a little difficult, but there's no choice but to believe something supernatural had happened. I have no intentions to blame you on that. Just, there were things we found out in a year of investigations but, there were also many things that we haven't. I suppose you two will not mind partaking in any investigations in the future. In this situation, they couldn't possibly refuse it, and in the first place they have no reason to refuse it. For Ardis, he might gain some clues about the other world thanks to their investigations as well. So he wanted to get as much information regarding this incident. Of course, Moore replied immediately to the Duke's request of cooperation, and on the other hand Ardis nodded wordlessly as well. Seeing their reply, the Duke's hard face finally collapsed. In any case, I'm happy my daughter have returned. I have to give my thanks to you too, good work guarding her. No, it was the mission I accepted in the first place, it's just a part of it, as for me, well. She's a precious pupil. Ardis managed to squeeze that out after a short while of silence. It probably looked like he was finding a suitable excuse in the Duke's eyes. As the official business is over, the Duke changed to a gentle face of a father towards Ardis. It seems like my daughter is blessed to have such a tutor like you. I will depend on you in the future too. Chapter 171 Chapter 171 Nothing as expected. Huh. Moore muttered as if it was an obvious thing. They're at the forest near the Duke's residency. It is exactly here where Ardis and the others managed to return to this world. After getting the freedom to leave from the Duke, Ardis and Rona came here in search of any clues left behind. Of course, if there's anything left behind, Rona would have already noticed it the moment they returned. They came here just in case but... Ardis had already expected nothing will be found. But there was an investigation a year prior. It's unlikely to think we have missed anything. It was a private soldier that was tasked by the Duke to guide them around that answered. The soldier that's probably also tasked with monitoring them is one of the few survivors of the raid on the Duke's residency a year ago. Ardis and Moore had heard about the incident a year ago in detail from the Duke himself just now. After all. A duke can't possibly be such a kind person that he would leave alone the people that dared to bear their fangs to his family. We already determined the culprits, but considering the opponents, we can't bring them out to the light. I've already taken as much retaliation as I could, but I can only say that they got us good this time. After that, 
They also determined what happened during the raid in the night on the Duke's residency, a curse that made people disappear. That is what was used in the raid, using many sacrifices in order to make people disappear. The existence of such a despicable cursed tool was found. To think that something like that existed, after receiving news of the raid, a portion of the army was sorted and when they arrived at the residency, it was shrouded in a creepy silence. The attackers, the private soldiers, and even the many servants that should be there went missing, and only bloody marks of battle remained in the mansion. While in confusion, they organized an expedition in order to search for any survivors or attackers, and they were able to capture a suspicious person in the forest near the Duke's residency. It seems like there was a box-like item with an unfamiliar shape there. Were they the sacrifices, or did they disappear because of the curse? Either way, most of the people in the residency disappeared overnight. Even my daughter, the battalion commander and you, after using all their hands in order to interrogate the suspect they managed to apprehend. The information they gained, what the Duke thought at the time was an absurd fairy tale, but the reality is a cursed item that caused everyone to disappear, with no way of knowing where everyone disappeared to. The Duke had no hands to pull, in the first place, he had no way of knowing whether the disappeared people are even alive, under that situation. A year had passed to think that it is actually a tool that transports people to another world. Rather than making people disappear, the cursed tool was actually capable of transporting people into another world. But because no one was ever able to return, it was acknowledged as making people disappear. Well, can't blame them. After all, the missing people might be also experiencing a difference in time flow. As for more who tagged along without Ardis even asking, he's conversing with the guiding soldier as if he's the spokesman. Yes, His Excellency thought about the possibilities of other people returning, so it is planned that a small guard post to be built here and have someone monitor the spot. But, there's also a lack of manpower, so finding someone to always stand guard is. Well, there's no helping that. Because of the incident, even servants and private soldiers all went in smokes right? And considering it's a duke's house, it's not like simply hiring people is possible. I can understand that a year is not enough time to gather enough talents. Because of the incident a year ago, the manpower of the duke's residency was critically in the low. That's also the prime reason why the gatekeeper soldiers were pointing their weapons at Minerva. Though, they must have known about the duke's daughter but... There's no helping it since the circumstances is like that. After all, the Duke's residency had hired many new faces in the one year period, and on top of that, it is publicly said that Minerva was sick and couldn't show her face. Though, it was only yesterday for us. Right, Rona? More sighed with a troubled face, and started talking to the golden beast below. One, Rona who was pretending to be a normal beast considering the presence of the soldier replied shortly since he was asked to reply. Tough being a dutiful man huh? Teasingly, Ardis said, seriously, even though I have not the slightest responsibility at what happened, suddenly there was a year of absence. And just as I expected, my position in the army is dismissed, and my name must have been unlisted from the military. But thanks to the Duke, the servants at my house was able to find a new job, so I guess that's the silver lining. What's your plan after this? After this huh? Returning to being a mercenary at this age is tough after all, and spare me from going back to the military and climbing back up from a rookie soldier. Well, since the Duke is willing to provide me a living for the time being, I guess I have some more time to think. And what about you, Ardis? I will return to the forest today. I will depart after greeting Minerva. What? It won't hurt for you to be laid back a little more right? Ah, could it be? A woman is waiting? Then. I guess there's no helping it right. Moore had a smirk as he guessed randomly. However, Ardis's response wasn't the greatest too. It's none of your business. Certainly, there are people waiting for Ardis in the house in the forest. If just by gender, it's true that she's a woman, but at the very least, they aren't in a relationship that Moore imagine. Since there's nothing here anyways, let's return to the mansion. Saying so, Ardis turned his heels. Oi, you don't have to be that shy. Hey. How is she? Aren't we comrades in arms having crossed worlds, tell me won't you? Ignoring Moore's curious questions as he panically chased behind, Ardis left the forest in quick strides. After greeting Minerva, Ardis left the Duke's residency. Not even dropping by the stalls in the streets, he quickly left the capital and went straight for his house in the forest. If he manages to enter the forest, 
Rona as well won't have to be mindful of others' presences. I wonder if Philia and Rihanna is doing well? Ardis had nothing to say, only Rona's words reverberated on its own and disappeared into the forest. It's fine. Nira isn't a cold person who would leave children in somewhere like this and leave probably. That's true. Ardis replied shortly after a short silence understanding that it's Rona's way of soothing the atmosphere. In reality, they had no idea if the house they return to will be the same from a year ago. He had known Nia despite everything for a whole five years. He has no complaints with her abilities to look after the twins, and she's also trustworthy enough. But in the first place, it was Ardis who asked Nia to look after the twins. If Ardis were to disappear suddenly, there's no reason for her to continue looking after the twins. If she had judged that Ardis were to never return, how would she treat Philia and Rihanna? Although he thought she wouldn't abandon them. There's also a possibility she would leave them to someone else and go on a journey herself. Other than Nia, only Kyril and the members of Bright Stars of White Knight knows about the twins. It's too much to hope from Kyril since he's a student after all, and Ted and the others might not even know Ardis went missing. If he knew this would happen, he should have made more connections, as Ardis regretted so but. But in the first place, it's impossible to bring the twins while working as a mercenary huh? he muttered. It's difficult to bring children on a mercenary job. On top of that, if the children they brought are twins, even if they're the bright stars of White Knight, it's still too much. Al, walking with heavy steps in the forest, Rona suddenly said. Ardis immediately cut off what he was thinking and started sensing mana in the area. The many beasts and demonic beings living in the forest. A strong mana presence can be felt right in the direction where they're heading. Mana that is stronger than any living creatures in the area. Is it near? He spoke of the name he thought of immediately. But, the problem is with the two signs of mana beside that. Certainly they're feeble compared to Ardis's or Nears. But it's at a level that can be said as plentiful strong with this world's standard. The size is about a person's. The two moved in a rhythm. Like they approached and separated from near, then took a breather. Are they in a fight? Might be so. But were there any small demonic beings in this forest? Kyril would have a signature about that big butt. There's two of them after all. Well, we will know after we get there. There's no need to worry about near if they're only at that level. The three mana signatures repeated movements akin to crashing into each other, then separating. While being on guard, Ardis and Rona advanced towards the house. Then just as they moved a little closer, the movements in mana suddenly changed. Among the three, the smaller two suddenly turned directions and approached them quickly. What? While being on guard. Ardis's feet didn't stop. After all, the two small signatures aren't significant enough for either Ardis or Ona. Even if it's a surprise attack, they can easily fend off any. On top of that, the opponent haven't bothered hiding their presences at all, but headed straight for them. There's no way they're threatening to Ardis and Rona. Just as they thought the mana signatures are close enough that they will be able to visually see them. The silence in the forest broke with loud voices. Ardis, Ardis. As if already arranged in prior, the voices were together, the voices that originated from the two mana signature were voices that Ardis knew well. Two human figures that ran with their all between the trees in the forest. The bluish eyes with a green tint that Ardis managed to see. The glossy platinum blonde hair that didn't suit their shabby clothes were fluttering in the air intensely. There were the two girls that were bigger than what Ardis remembered. The twin girls that showed themselves were like arrows as they leapt wholeheartedly in a crash course into Ardis. 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 Without even slowing down their momentum, Ardis easily received the two that called out his name. Seeing the twins that hugged him as tightly as they could, Ardis finally felt that he was truly back in this world. Chapter 172. Chapter 172. Ardis. Ardis. As if forgotten any other words than that. Philia and Rihanna were hugging onto Ardis tightly while repeating his name. The platinum blonde hair sticking on him were at one head lower than him. Their height that should have only been around his waist when he first met them had become considerably taller. The strength behind their arms are also stronger than expected. Of course, it's not at a level that would hurt Ardis but, it was enough to let Ardis acknowledge their growth. Ardis suddenly recalled what the Duke said. I see, it's just like what he said. While thinking like that. The twins' voices slowly became muddled. Ardisut Hick, ah, dis, Hick. The happy voice of calling Ardis's name suddenly became cries, then totally became wails the next moment. You, 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 
You are. The twins became wholeheartedly crying while clinging onto him. While being clueless what to do, he noticed someone getting closer. A late return, I must say, my master. With Alice blue hair swaying in the air, there was a woman looking in her 17 or 18 approaching him. The impeccable canvas that seemed to portray a perfect angelic existence seemed to have a strange smile. It was Nia's appearance that had not changed from a year ago. Yeah, sorry. While feeling relieved and apologetic, Ardis said. It's fine, returning safely is the most priority. Nia said so bluntly as well. After the twins eventually calmed down, they still didn't seem willing to let go of Ardis at all. Yume. How long should I keep standing here for? Advertisement. For the past year, they've been terribly worried, isn't it fine to indulge them for a little now? Certainly, Ardis had gone missing for an entire year without any communications, so he had nothing to rebuke. It wasn't because of what Nia said, but he decided to give up until the twins had their fill. That's why, 30 minutes had gone by with Ardis standing still while waiting them to finally stop crying. I'm back, Philia, Rihanna, Hick, Un. Welcome back, Ardis. Sorry for making you worry. Ardis smiled towards the both, then the twins returned a smile with still watery eyes. Finally, he had returned to where he belongs, though Ardis felt a little strange about that fact. Let's go home now shall we? No, here is good. Though, the two seemed to not budge at all and the self-proclaimed servant never did offer a saving boat for him who is stuck in such a situation, and left on her own to the house. With no choice, after much compromising, it became that Ardis lent both his hands to each twin and having them cling on to him along to the house, the Duke residency in the night. Minerva was challenging her homework once again before sleep. Ten minutes had passed while she examined the small stone she was given just as she was instructed. Phew. As her vision started to daze. Minerva started to massage her eyes. A year had passed in this world, even though she herself had only experienced two days. It's not like she could see anything different even if she peered any longer into the stone. But, she felt like her normal life returned because she was doing that. After extinguishing the light and diving into the bed, Minerva suddenly relived the intense experience she had. The unfamiliar scenery, beasts, and even the night. None of them are unmemorable. They were all things that exclaimed another world. And Minerva recalled the guarding eyes of Ardis and his adult form clearly in her mind. A man who looks totally different than the Shizu she knows. With muscles that covered his entire body even more than Commander Greystar, even his posture showed off his unbending will that wouldn't waver in front of any absurd beasts in the other world. However, at the same time, the dangerous atmosphere that were like blades around him rejected anyone from approaching. Is that the real Shizu? Advertisement. She only knew the Shizu with an appearance that is not much different in age than her. It was surprising to find out Ardis was actually about the same age as Commander Greystar but, what was most surprising was the difference in atmosphere around them. She couldn't say the Ardis she knew is all caring towards her, but still, he didn't show any obvious anger or irritation while teaching her. But. If that's the true him, that is probably his true emotions that he buried deep inside himself. That night, when Ardis's hands restrained Minerva's arms, the images and people she saw, and the feelings she felt, she felt like countless shards were cutting into her heart. The hatred seemed to glow ever so brightly and would consume anything in its surrounding. That's the cry of his soul that is buried forcefully, Minerva knew by feeling. That, Shizu, what is it? Um, never mind. It's nothing. She wanted to ask Ardis who went to greet her before returning to his home about what she saw, but couldn't bring herself to in the end. It's probably Ardis's past that should never be touched. She felt that it's not something she can easily ask. She was sure that what she saw were Ardis's memories, and the scars left in his mind. Although she had no proof, she felt that it can be nothing but that. And strangely, she felt like she was somehow similar in nature with Ardis. Oh Jusama. Look out, Layla. Ark. An older servant suddenly jumped at Minerva. Pushing away Minerva whose heart was right in the trajectory of the dagger, she became her substitute, with a dagger in her chest. Advertisement. Kara. Layla. Shit. This woman. Let go. No. Way. Even if I die. Holding on to the dagger stabbing into her chest with both her hands, she used her whole body to hold down the assassin. Layla. S. Someone. Layla is. The guards. That arrived. The assassin that was apprehended. And the body on the ground soaked in blood. Layla. A whisper of someone's name was heard. The person that Minerva considered her own sister had taken a blade for her. From her time view, 
It was an incident half a year ago. The overflowing and uncontainable sorrow filled under her shut eyes. Minerva and Ardis both have the will wanting to protect someone, and also having lost someone dearest to them being their motivation. If Ardis had managed to become so strong because of wanting to protect someone, then she would also, I can become strong too. No, I must. At the same time, she knew the wounds that Ardis carried are much deeper than her own. Ardis must have wanted to stay in that world. After all, Minerva and the others had waited for a few hours for Ardis to arrive, that is surely because he was hesitating. The regrets and remorse, self-blaming and impatience, sorrow and hatred that she had felt from seeing Ardis's past. Cutting off all of them, Ardis had chosen to return to this world knowingly throwing away the chance of getting revenge on his nemesis. It must have been a stupendously tough choice. Minerva's existence should have also played a role even if it's a little in his decision. She didn't intend to take all credits for it, but she was certain that he was looking out for herself and also Commander Greystar. Even though he's suffering so much pain, he would go that far for us. Her gratitude for Ardis is indescribable as well as her sorriness. I hope my strength can be of help one day, though I doubt a time like that can come. There was a large disparity in strength between them. In the first place, it's questionable to think that Ardis would ever need Minerva's strength. What she has that Ardis don't have is at most a noble bloodline and the political power that comes with it. However, leaving aside if she is the acting lord of the house, a lady who isn't even the house's successor would have little to nothing political power. I can't even properly return his gratitude with what I can do. While feeling worthless at her own powerlessness, Minerva's consciousness slowly fleeted away. Chapter 173 Chapter 173 If only something interesting would happen. Yeah, true. Ardis and Rona are conversing idly in the journey to the capital they have last been in a month ago. The sky is clear. The day is still early and the sunshine is still lukewarm, just prior to the noon when it will be uncomfortable and sweaty to walk. After returning to this world, Ardis had been spending many of his days lazing around with the pretense of resting, but in any case, lazing around won't feed him. There's a need to fill his stomach when he's hungry, and filling it means their food supplies would decrease. So naturally, he could not avoid the role of procuring more food supplies in the capital. Receiving a notice from Nia saying the flower will exhaust in the next day, he had no choice but to move. Well, in the first place, I didn't think it would go so well. Just gaining a clue in that incident is more than enough of a result. Ardis was talking about the incident about the path to the other world, or a gate, he supposes. After being transported into the other world, they have managed to return after a year by going through a gate that was open. That incident involved Ardis and the others being forcefully transported into the other world. But now that the gate to the other world had already disappeared, it would most certainly not easily open again. Although he heard that there will be a guard on duty watching the forest, in the first place, Ardis didn't expect anything from that. After all, if gates to the other world can be so easily opened like that, then he wouldn't have spent so much time looking for a clue to return and not finding one at all. In any case, it would be the third time Ardis had crossed between worlds. If so, there will surely be a fourth time. Un. If we can find the magic tool they talked about, then opening another gate should be possible. Ardis nodded at Rona. It had been determined a tool was used in the attempt of assassinating Minerva. In a certain meaning, it was a fortunate event for Ardis. Although how they obtained or used it is still unknown in the details, knowing the existence of such a tool that can connect the two worlds is enough. If they can control its radius and not transport innocent people as well. Ardis will be able to return to the other world by himself, but in any case, there's still too much we don't know about the tool. Don't know, by what? Something like, why was I transported to when I'm not even anywhere near the Duke's residency? Advertisement. Agreeing to Ardis, Rona replied, yeah, that's true, though, I think I can guess why. Guess? Following that, Rona's words piqued Ardis's interest. Un. About Al, you were transported because of Elian's arts right? Yeah. No doubt that Ilion didn't have the intentions to do so but, maybe the art was not complete, or the activation itself failed. And so, 
You are in this world by the time you know it, and in a weakened child form to boot. What Ardis experienced during that event was already explained through and through to Rona in the past month. But the Al still in the other side has the original strength and appearance right? Ardis who had regained his consciousness in the other world was certain that he had regained his former power and appearance as well. But at the same time, when he returned to this world, the two were lost again. What about it? Un in other words, Alien's strange arts made Al's existence fissioned, or something like that. Fissioned? A mirror image, or something similar. Well, it's not clear whether something like that really happened but, if it's like what I think, then the reason why Al would become younger and weak and would make sense. Isn't it that the two Al from different worlds combined the original Al? Rona's unexpected theory confused Aldis. Even if that's the case, that still doesn't explain why I was transported. This is another guess but, wouldn't the two separated existences an irregularity itself? Then when the borders of the two world get closer and a gateway is formed, the two existence would attract each other. And adding on to that, Minerva had the sword with Al's mana in it with her. That sword might have been the key to bridge the two existence together, though a little far-fetched, that's what I think anyways. In any case, now that the gate I open doesn't affect Al in any way, there's a possibility that the sword is a key factor right? For a short period, Ardis thought. Although there were many absurd points with Rona's guess, he couldn't completely rule it out. After all, with him lacking concrete evidence, there's no way to know the correct answer for sure. And so, Ardis put making a conclusion on hold. Well, leaving aside if that guess is correct or not, it doesn't change the fact we have to look for the magic tool itself. Also. Also, it's nice to know that there's no need to hurry. I guess so. After all, a year here would only amount to a day in the other world. Even if Ardis spent ten years in this world, only ten days would have passed in the other world. At the very least, a scenario of his nemesis had died of old age when he returned won't happen. Of course, Ardis himself would want to immediately exact his revenge, but Ardis had chosen to return to this world. Advertisement. Another ten years, no. Five years. He decided to stay in this world until Philia and Rihanna can stand on their own. He didn't regret his choice itself, though. It's actually beneficial for us. That woman would have only experienced few days when we have few years to get the means to deal with her. Either way, with our power now, we can't do anything. Even if he recovered his original strength, Ardis couldn't see any way he can win against the woman general. If so, he should spend more time to obtain the means to do so. At the very least, he should get on an equal foothold. Leaving that aside, they've been quite persistent already, are you sure leaving them alone is fine? Ardis was silently thinking before Ono asked. Ardis who had paused his thoughts sensed the mana in the surroundings again and confirmed that the reaction that had been tailing them for a long time now is still there. The presence was picked up when they were near the capital as it entered from a blind spot outside the city walls. The size is about a human. Seeing that it had not drawn any closer or any further, it seems like it's only surveilling them. Of course. It's not normally a distance where people can detect it, but Ardis and Rona both aren't normal after all. Seeing that there aren't any human or beast's reaction around, that person's purpose must be only monitoring them. It doesn't look like he's coming at all. Well, it's fine if he's not entering the forest. After all, we've been missing for a whole year, of course there would be curious ones. For better or for worse, Ardis is quite popular in the capital. After contributing greatly in the war with the Empire, there are surely presences that he can sense monitoring him whenever he's in the capital, so Ardis thought that dealing with them every time is just plainly a bother. And thinking about the timing now, it's possible that it might be someone sent by the Duke to monitor him. If he's not planning to do anything, there's no reason Ardis has to be violent too. Well, if Ardis says so then so be it. But if Philia and Rihanna would to visit the capital. It's a pain to have them continue looking right? Rona asked so and Ardis unintentionally frowned. After all, this time when Ardis headed for the capital, the twins wanted to tag along. It's still a little early to bring them here. Advertisement. Hey Al, you know that's called being overprotective? Ardis knew it was coming for him when Rona brought it up. They will also one day be living with other people. Isn't it about time for them to experience dealing with other people? I know, though. Rona made sure to remind Ardis mercilessly. When they first met, the twins were afraid of anyone including Ardis, and the twins that were so afraid had proposed to come to the capital by themselves, that in itself showed their growth, 
but also is the proof that the scars left behind in them are healing. The reason for teaching them to magic is probably preparing them for the occasion too, and thanks to Kyril, their speaking had been fixed too. Treating children too preciously isn't a good way for them to grow up. Yeah, even for the entire year when Ardis was not around, Kyril had continued giving lessons to the twins. The peculiar speaking of the twins had been completely corrected, and they have been taught common sense befitting their age. There's nothing wrong with it, or rather it's great. But the fact that both of them can use magic is something unexpected. It seems like Nia had been showing them tips and guiding them for the past year. Though it was not something he asked, as Ardis's face showed and Nia said, Though you might not like it, there's no better way. If we knew my master would return, then it might be fine but, there wasn't any guarantee then. Kyril was still there then but, it's not like he will stay in the capital forever right? Then who would to procure food supplies then? It seems like during the absence of Ardis, Kyril had been the one helping them by necessities along with teaching them. But just as what Nir said, Kyril is not going to stay in the capital forever. He would graduate from the academy in a few years and most probably would return to his hometown in Reiton. If that happens, the twins would have to stay in the house by themselves when Nia goes out to hunt. Ardis understood that they would need to be able to protect themselves if that happens. Although he understood the reason, it's not like he agreed fully. You don't have to be so worrying though, with that pace, they can easily learn to protect themselves. The two of them are now, I'm 13 right? Being able to use magic at 13, isn't that something amazing in this world? It's just as Rona said. In the past month, Ardis had seen the twins practicing arts. The two were using spells not in the chanted magic way that is taught in the academy, but more of the same as magic, the phenomenon brought forth by manipulating and understanding the principles of mana, similar to what Ardis and Nia uses. Without the need to chant, although it's an irregularity in this world, it's also a massive advantage at the same time. Of course, it's not like they have reached Ardis's or Nia's domain but, he was proven in the past month that they can handle a twin swords on their own without any problems, their strength is already a league above any students studying in the Mariules Academy. The twins learning the means to protect themselves aren't bad in any way. He also felt happy seeing Philia's and Rihanna's growth, but on the other hand, the consequences of that made Ardis have another brand new headache. Chapter 174 Chapter 174 Ardis and Rona who were conversing on the way to the capital eventually arrived and found their way into the inn they're familiar with, says Ragi in. Welcome, ah, isn't it Ardis San? Where have you gone for an entire year? Opening the front entrance, the signboard girl of says Ragi in exclaimed after seeing Ardis. Sorry, there was some trouble I had to tend to. While making his way to an empty spot in a corner, Ardis vaguely explained his absence. After all, he couldn't exactly say that he was transported into another world because of a magic tool. There was a troublesome organization that I had matters with. And on top of that, there were nobles involved in it, so I couldn't return to the capital until everything calmed down. I feel sorry for not saying anything though. Is that so? Not knowing that almost all of what he said were lies. Miller seemed worried about Ardis. As Ardis found his seat at an empty table, Rona as well naturally curled up on the ground. Ah, but your belongings. Miller recalled something and looked really apologetic. Oh, were they disposed? It's not anything important anyways, so don't mind it. Sorry, it's a rule of our inn. After all, Ardis couldn't blame them not looking after a customer's belongings that had gone missing for an entire year. And for Ardis who only originally used this inn to stay for short periods of time, there were only daily necessities that he wouldn't be troubled without. Ah, but as an apology, let me treat you something today. I have a new recipe that I came up with today. Hearing that, Rona's ears seemed to jump and quiver. No, it's fine. Just serve your father's dishes as usual, don't be reserved. It's something I'm confident in today. I will bring Rona's portion too. Although Ardis tried to respectfully turn down her offer, Mela totally ignored him and pushed on the offer anyways, before disappearing into the kitchen. Al, I did refuse already. Ardis tried to justify himself after receiving a hateful stare from his partner. Mela's creations, which are well known for its difficulty is even titled Ultimate Weapon of Sezragi in by many guests. If not for the unimaginable destructive power it holds to completely overturn someone's stomach, says Ragi Inn would have already made it to one of the best inns in the country. Since Miller's fur there is a good cook as well as the inn's reasonable prices, 
There are many fresh mercenaries and explorers that stay here often. But just as the inn was getting so popular that it would always be booked out, Miller's cooking duty was arranged as if waiting for that. Of course, countless people who had tried her creations collapsed at the dining table, and as a result, rooms would get emptied and new guests would find their way here. It is such a cycle. Though it's a problem simply solved by not letting Miller cook, it seems like the inn owner is quite doting on his daughter. As Ardis surveyed round, there were two young men sprawled on the table. Advertisement. They are the victims who had fallen prey to Miller's cooking that would be served twice a month. Well, since she's treating us, we should gratefully accept it right? Gratefully? Are you serious about that? With a gaze that only said that towards Ardis, he became silent. And eventually, Miller had reappeared from the kitchen with a tray with food on it. Please don't be reserved and dine in. A plate that has a deep bottom was put on the table. It was filled with something that looks like stew. There were root vegetables cut in small pieces and chicken meat submerged in the cream-colored liquid. It looked normal at the very least, as Ida spooned it up and tried it. Sourness that immediately numbed his taste buds. The urge to vomit arises at the same time. As if noticed Ardis's expression that had twitched, Miller started explaining her grand dish. Ah. Are you worried about the taste? But I'm sure it's fine, fermented food all tastes like that. And it's also said fermenting food brings out more flavor. Certainly, Ardis had known about the existence of fermented food in the world. But is it even correct to call something like this fermented? He could feel his mouth rejecting it as purely rotten vegetables. A something that is right on the verge of decomposing would better describe it. That's not anything like fermenting. As Ardis swallowed the questionable thing along with his words. Just as Muller left the spot, Rona started complaining. Hey Al, isn't this totally rotten? It feels like, it's critically on the safe borderline. It's not, inedible. I just really wanted to have something nice though. Don't complain. It's better compared to nedulo meat right? How underhanded of you to compare it to that. Even while grumbling about it in a soft voice that won't be heard by the others. Rona flattened the questionably fermented dish. Is this in going to be okay? Won't it go under after a food poisoning incident sooner or later? Regarding that, it seems like her father is properly looking. He stops her before anything critical is done. Though it would be better to completely stop her from cooking. After finally finishing the plate, Miller had once again come to them. As expected from Ardis San. It's only Ardis San who would ever finish my dish. Should I bring more? No. It's enough. I'm not that hungry after all. So really, you don't have to bring more, is that so? Was it nice? Should we add it to the menu after all? Mew, rather than asking me, isn't it better to ask from your father? He's a pro in cooking after all. Eh, but father would only mew or I'm even if I asked him. At least properly tell her it's impossible, as I disgrumbled about the owner in his heart. Well, it's fine. Since it's a busy period now, a new menu won't be coming anytime soon. Busy, un, after all, the Lotus Cup is coming soon. We have to attract new customers to Lotus Cup. What's that? Eh? You don't know about it, Ardis San? Advertisement. Ardis asked about the term that he'd never heard before. Though, it seems like Muller was a little surprised at that. They do it annually right? It was cancelled last year though. What do I see here, countless swords? You never heard of the Lotus Cup? Did he overhear their conversation? A mercenary at two tables away said, Well, if you're not around during this period in the capital, then it can't be helped. There are mercenaries and explorers who always travel around after all. Ardis recalled just as it was pointed out. Certainly, just as he pointed out, he realized that he was never around in the capital during this period after moving here from Thoria. It was purely coincidence. So, what is this Lotus Cup about? Lotus Cup is a martial arts tournament organized by the army. Many martial artists gather from around the kingdom and decide who is the strongest. There are many amazing mercenaries, soldiers, and even explorers that will participate. Ardisan should not miss out on this year. Fu, N, a martial arts tournament ha. Huh? Well, that's the pretense of it anyways. Meaning? The mercenary hinted meaningfully. And Ardis asked. It's just something for putting out Marquis Holgin's name out there. Marquis Holgin? Ardis felt like he heard that name before. After all, it's the name of the noble that he had heard from Duke Nyrestia who is behind the assassination of Minerva. On official papers, it's said that it's an event held by the army, but it's actually by Marquis Holgin, 
an authority in the army, even when they say they gather martial artists all over the kingdom, it's not like anyone can freely participate. Mercenaries and explorers that want to participate will have to get a recommendation from the organizer. So of course anyone who is on bad terms with Marquis Holgen can't participate, and those that are from the army are all under his banner anyways. But that's just a rumor right? Vomala asked. The mercenary flatly rebuked. It's not just a rumor. In reality, there were only people under his banner winning the championship every year. I mean, the one that wins are capable, but there are more talented mercenaries and explorers out there. But they would never be allowed in the Lotus Cup. This time, Ardis raised a question. Isn't it more like there are not much interest in it? It's not like everyone wants to make a name for themselves. Advertisement. After all, Ardis in the past is like that. He didn't think that every mercenary or explorer in the world wishes to be popular. There should be many who don't want to be known as well. I mean, that's a possibility as well. After all, the championship is only fame, and a measly 50 gold coins. Although 50 gold coins might seem much for the average people, for any experienced mercenaries, it's not worth that much. It's an amount that Ted's party can earn in a single request depending on the content. Because of that. There aren't many complaints about the limited entry, and since there are not many strong people that participates, Marquis Holgen's people win in it every time, and those who are in the top 10 are mostly his men as well. He has his face to keep as well, coming from a house that produce military figures every generation, though it's really boring for people like us to spectate. After all, all it boils down to is the Marquis's men trying to decide who is the strongest. So, in other words, I'd suddenly have an evil expression. If someone unrelated to the Marquis won, then his face would hurt. That's the case but, there's no one with that caliber who is going to participate anyways. And participating requires permission from the organizer as well. And the entire army is mostly under his banner. No one is going to go out specially on their way to challenge someone like that right? Ardis who heard that decided. It sounds interesting. I guess I will try taking part. It's not like he needs any more popularity than this. And of course, the 50 gold coins is just a bonus. But when it comes to Marquis Holgen being involved, it's a different story. Minerva who was his target went missing for an entire year in this world. Because of that. She was publicly announced as being sickly and couldn't show her face. In the end, she absented from the royal tea party for choosing an empress candidate, and of course she wasn't chosen. And after a year, the candidates had gnawed at each other, and one of the two candidates that is left is the third daughter of Marquis Holgen who is the perpetrator behind the incident with Minerva. In other words, Marquis Holgen had successfully retired the Lady of Duke Nyrestia who has the most potential to be a candidate. Although the Duke had said that I had retaliated as much as I could but, it's obvious that he couldn't bring someone who has mighty power over the army into judgment easily. Of course, it's a regretful thing for the Duke, and Minerva who had been publicly missing for a year won't have good reputation. It seems like information about the magic tool was leaked from somewhere, and there's a rumor about a curse. She would have a hard time finding a marriage because of that. Of course, Ardis wasn't particularly fond of the idea, although it wasn't for a long time, Minerva is his pupil that he had taken care of. Being so openly hostile towards someone he considers dear, in other words, he's Ardis's enemy. Though of course, considering that his opponent is a noble with a Marquis title, and an authority over the army to boot, he couldn't just rush in straight for him but, there's no need to worry if he just let him taste some pain in a totally legal manner. The proud members under his banner, Ardis would outmatch them with just a sword despite being publicly known as a magician. For the Marquis who has a powerful authority over the army, there's nothing else that can give a better blow on his reputation than this. In other words, Ardis had thought to participate in the Lotus Cup as a means of retaliation of his own. He Ardis San. Magic is not allowed in the tournament though. Even if Ardis San is strong, a magician without magic can't compete with soldiers who are warriors right? Muller is right. Since it's a tournament only using a weapon, there's no using your powerful sword magic. Better rethink since it's just going to soil your image. Subjugating the three great demons, and even contributing greatly in the war. Ardis's name is known as one of the best mercenaries in the kingdom. But that is merely his feats as a magician. Just as his second name of countless sword sorcerer, 
There are many who misunderstand Ardis as a magician. It's natural why Malaya and the mercenary thought so. And in the first place, it's not like you can easily participate even if you want to. You will need a recommendation from the organizer. A normal mercenary wanting to participate, they probably won't even spare a glance at you. Well, I have an idea for that. If the opponent is going to defend with his shield of political power, Ardis has his spear of political power as well. Fortunately, Ardis has Duke Nyrestia on his side. No matter if Marquis Holgan is the organizer of the event, it's impossible to have everything under his control. With the Duke's power, it should be easily to let Ardis participate in the event. I will just go wild, of course, without the magic part. With Muller looking at him worriedly, Ardis said so as a matter of fact. Chapter 175 Chapter 175 I heard you want to enter the Lotus Cup, a lord. Someone who has to fulfill his duty as a public servant. The Duke's residency is truly only somewhere to sleep for Duke Nyrestia. Just as he stopped by between his work, he heard a wish from a mercenary who is an instructor for his daughter. It was that he wanted to enter the Lotus Cup that is held by the army. Yes, I will have to enlist Duke's help for that. But why the Lotus Cup? It's not like there's anything for you to gain there. For the Duke. Ardis and more other benefactors that had brought his daughter back from missing after a year. Of course, he was suspicious of Ardis and more at first but, after his own thorough investigations and Minerva's story, he had already confirmed that they're innocent. Now only his gratitude for the two as a father remained. And a wish coming from Ardis, he would agree to it if it's not anything excessive. But Ardis who wanted to enter the Lotus Cup was unexpected even for the Duke. He couldn't grasp Ardis's intentions at all. I have heard that it is the best show stage for those of Marquis Holgin's faction. But his question soon dissolved. He managed to connect the dots between Marquis Holgin that Ardis mentioned, and the Lotus Cup. I see, that's your intention huh? The Duke understood without Ardis needing to explain any further. Marquis Holgan is the perpetrator regarding the incident with his precious daughter. Of course, as a Duke, he had pulled as many strings as possible to retaliate within the rules but, without proper evidence, he couldn't have him judged in the light. Although he's still unsatisfied, it's not like he could do anything more. Luckily, Minerva had returned without any injuries, so he probably has no choice but to soon put an end to the incident. It was an opportunity given thinking about that. For Marquis Holgin, the Lotus Cup is the best stage for showing off his power. In reality, the Lotus Cup is only a stage for Marquis Holgin and his men to display their prowess. And if someone hailing under Duke Nyarestia's banner, who is seen as their enemy, what would happen if Ardis managed to place well? On top of that, the participant is albeit famous in the capital, is not any more than a magician. Marquis Holgin's public face would probably be crushed into nothingness. But, that's a story only if Ardis can advance in the Lotus Cup. Thanks for your thoughts. I understand your intentions. But isn't the Lotus Cup a martial arts tournament? And of course, the use of any magic or arts will be forbidden. I know. Ardis had replied plainly at the Duke's confirmation. Then don't take this personally. It's not like your swordsmanship isn't up to par, but the participants are all talented martial artists chosen from the army. There are many top fighters chosen from the army, and also many from mercenaries and explorers. I have known that as well. Then, I already know, it was rude, considering a mercenary had just overwhelmed a duke's speech. The servant beside him frowned, but the duke raised his hand to stop him. So what about it? And then, the words that Ardis spoke can be even considered arrogance. Are those martial artists you speak of have the ability to even deal with even one of the three great demons? After a short period of silence, the Duke's voice reanimated the room. Of course not. But aren't them opponents you can defeat only by using sword magic? If it's just about a bell chaser, then a sword is enough. Hearing that, the Duke lost his words. But he is also one of the residents of the higher society. Without showing surprise on his face. He only muttered, just about a bell chaser, huh? Even with subjugation squads sorted by the kingdom, a strong demonic being that couldn't be subjugated. To refer something like that as just about, it can only be self-confidence, or plainly arrogance. Fine. If you're going that far, then for your participation in Lotus Cup, I will do something about it. After sighing deeply in a way that wouldn't be noticed, he agreed to Ardis's wish. Of course, 
he didn't forget to add on a condition. But I will be troubled if you're going down in just one or two runs with my name. Do you understand that as well? Since he was to use the Duke's name, of course, he must not show a pathetic sight. Don't worry, or would you like to test my capabilities? If you gathered maybe ten elites from the escorts in the residency, Ardis mentioned so plainly. Of course. The Duke is not against the idea of our disproving his strength. If he can fight on the same footing with the elites in the residency, then winning and advancing in the Lotus Cup is not impossible, and the Duke can rest easy recommending him. Are you going to show that you can best ten of my men? I'm saying that I can best all ten of them at the same time. Although the Duke thought he was challenging Ardis, it seems like it was the opposite, and so, immediately, the Duke had given orders to the servant beside to gather the people to verify Ardis's strength. Heading towards the training grounds where Minerva would practice under Ardis's guidance while the people are getting gathered. Is something interesting happening? What wind did he catch? It was none other than Moore who was offloading in the Duke's residency that called out to Ardis. Whether if it's going to be interesting depends on the opponents. Ooh, Jack and Kane and Andre, quite the members, is gathering her. After naming out the escorts that were gathered, Ardis asked more in a just-in-case manner. Are they strong? They are, though, not anywhere close to you. If it's you, how many can you go up against at once? How many at the same time? Huh. Un. Three. I think it would be about even then. If it's against two, then I should win eight or nine out of ten times. Four of them would be difficult, just not losing will take my all. But if it's somewhere narrower than here, maybe in a forest or a building, then I guess there's some chance. They are all either strong former mercenaries or former soldiers that had gathered. Just managing against two or three of them at once is already impressive. Even in the army, it's not far-fetched to say that less than ten can do that. But conversely speaking, even someone as strong as more couldn't win if it's against four of them at once. And against them, if it's just defeating all ten of them in a row finding someone capable of that in the kingdom will be difficult. While Ardis only replied is that so at Moore's answer, he swung the sword with a sharp edge handed over by a servant in a manner to familiarize with it. If you're asking me that, then how many of them are you planning to take on at the same time? It's annoying, so all of them, eh? That's too much even if, at Ardis's unexpected answer, Moore's eyes became round. But his expression immediately changed after, and said in a bitter smile, No. I guess it's easy for you ha. Huh? As one of the servants messaged the Duke that the preparation is completed. The Duke signaled the servant that is acting as the judge. The sword play test will now commence. Take front, both sides. Prompted by the judge, under the eyes of the Duke, eleven people gathered at the center of the training grounds. On one hand, there's Ardis with a composed expression, and on the other, the escorts are all grumpy. It's natural. After all, their mercenaries or explorers or soldiers that had lived so far thanks to their own strength. Even if it's an order from the Duke, a fight of ten against one, and even against a magician that had declared that he wouldn't use any magic, of course they would be displeased, but the escorts would have never guessed something more outrageous is awaiting them. It will be ten matches in a row. Are there no objections? The judge who had thought that it would naturally be ten matches was called out by Ardis. It's not like there's a need to have ten matches right? Why not all ten of them at once? What? The escorts' faces became darker. They must be feeling humiliation. Although the Duke had heard of his intentions already, he asked again to reconfirm. Is that fine? There's no going back on your words? No problem. Actually, it's fine even if Commander Greystar wants to join. As for that, it was once again more than what the Duke had expected. Not just ten on one, he had now said that eleven on one with more joining wouldn't be a problem. The Duke wordlessly sent a gaze to Moore. Responding to that, Moore's answer was simple. There's no meaning, although that answer was enough for the Duke. He asked for the others to understand. Meaning? The result won't change even adding one or two more people, is what I meant. What about the result? Ardis is going to win. It was the escorts that is going to be Ardis's opponents that reacted most to that. Impossible, is what their faces wrote. Fume. His swordplay, is well known in Gran. More that is once strong enough to have his name known, although indirectly. He acknowledged that Ardis isn't someone he can win against. Moore's judgment on Ardis is as such. Well, fine. If you can win against ten of them, at the same time, then it's enough to earn the right to participate in the Lotus Cup. Begin. The Duke signaled the servant. With that much information given, 
Even the escorts wouldn't underestimate Ardis as just a magician. Anyone who still underestimate their opponent despite knowing so much have no rights to be eating the residency's rice. At the same time, Ardis is serious on taking on ten of them. It's a situation where both sides can't spare to be careless. It's a fine chance to discern his strength as the duke smiled in his mind. Yes sir. The test will now start. Are both sides ready? After calling out to both sides, the judge raised his right hand straight to the sky. Begin. Just as the judge's arm swung down, the eleven people started moving. Chapter 176 Chapter 176 Three of them ran straight for Ardis. As the two sides closed in, the three spread out in a half-encompassing manner. A big sword escort at Ardis's front, another wearing a gauntlet coming on the right, and a long-haired escort on the left. At the same time, another three went in a larger radius circling to Ardis's back. Surrounding him, seeing their action, Duke Nyarestia was able to make out what the escorts were trying to do. Three at the front, and three from the back. They probably thought to surround Ardis. And the four are on standby just as expected huh? Even if it's a widened obstacle less training grounds, there's still not enough room for ten people to be swinging their weapons without obstructing each other. Six surrounded Ardis, the four will be substitutes, or follow up on any gaps. The Duke thought, as for Ardis who is against three people at his front, he showed no signs of stopping, thought so. It seems like the Duke understood his actions. After all, with his opponents many times himself, stopping at one place will be disadvantageous. There's a common tactic used in a 6 or 7 against 10 situation, to slowly wait for a critical mistake from the opponent while holding down their defense. But rather than 6 or 7, Ardis is by himself against 10. If so, there's no point for Ardis to hold his position. It's much more reasonable to actively go on the offense. Ardis clashed frontally with the three ahead. The first to take action was Ardis. The training sword provided without a sharp edge drove into the escort ahead sharply. It seems like the escort tried to parry the sword with his big sword but the much heavier than expected sword completely crushed his stance. Who? Oh. He has more strength than his looks huh? But at the same time, there's surely a gap when he attacks. Aiming for the gap when Ardis attacked, the two escorts on both sides slashed. It would be unavoidable normally. But as if falling towards the front. The sword by the gauntleted escort passed by him just as he performed a half spin. He dodged it. The sword that was dodged was redirected by Ardis's sword, and its trajectory changed, heading towards the long hair escort on the opposite side. To avoid friendly fire, the long haired escort pulled back, but Ardis would not miss the moment when his foothold is not the best. The sword that flowed naturally found itself at the long hair escort's abdomen from the side. Gahak, following that, Ardis released the sword on his left hand, and with his now free left hand, he delivered a firm punch right into the gut of the gauntleted escort. Usually, and just as his back almost fell on the ground, his left hand pushed on the ground, and with that as the axis, he spun around, utilizing his centrifugal force to drive a sword into the escort at the front. Q. After managing to defend against it, the big sword escort saw the situation wasn't going well and tried to retreat some distance. But of course, he wasn't allowed to leave at will. My foot. The escort found his foot stepped on by Ardis's and couldn't move. Ardis held down the escort's arm with one of his hand momentarily, and the opponent whose hand for counterattacking was stopped found the blunt edge of the sword mercilessly dropping on his head. And that's three. Ardis's mutter between the running footsteps reverberated loudly for some reason. It just meant that the atmosphere there was drawing everyone in. Ooh, what magnificent movement. Is he really a magician? Even though the three that circled to the back rushed towards him, they're far too late. Of course, Ardis would have to strive to gain more advantage before they come. Within one breath, Ardis had kicked off the ground towards the four on standby, and responding to that, the four escorts split into two teams at two sides. Not bad. With few words, the Duke appraised. Since the four in a group would only make one target, splitting into two groups will force Ardis to choose between one of them. If the side getting attacked can hold against Ardis, then the other side will be able to attack from Ardis's back, by supporting each other. They should be able to buy enough time for the remaining three to catch up. Though it will depend on if the two getting attacked can hold out. Similar to the Duke's thoughts, Ardis must have known that there's no time to waste. Ardis chose the two on the left, 
With a swift attack, the sword along with his momentum lunged towards one of the two escorts. Ardis grabbed the arm of the escort stunned by the heavy stab, forcefully pulling and throwing him at the two coming from the right. A skillful move. Then for the one remaining on that side, his sword came from overhead in a natural trajectory. Though the escort managed to receive it, the power behind it brought him to knees in just a moment. Seeing that, Ardis loosened his strength on the sword. The escort's sword that had lost its counter-force moved to the front. His already collapsing stance fell forward. With that, there's no way he can regain his stance. Just one exchange is enough for him to crush their stance huh? Not letting the chance slip by, Ardis's sword tip smacked at the escort's hand. Then in quick succession, Ardis swung his sword upwards crashing into the escort's sword's handguard in its trajectory. Not able to grasp on the sword that had lost its grip, the escort had lost his weapon. Then just as Ardis swung his sword downwards, another escort magically jumped into its trajectory. He must have thought that there was a gap, but it was actually a trap that he was baited into. The escort that fell into Ardis's misdirection found himself a heavy blow from the side. And the goes for, realizing his disadvantage. The remaining escort tried to retreat but couldn't. After all, without even looking, Ardises managed to land a hit on the escort leg. After lightly tapping on the escort head with his sword's blunt edge, Ardis is now prepared to welcome the three who had finally caught up. The outcome is already decided. The Duke's prediction was right. After all, after easily dealing with the three vanguards in the beginning, then the four in no time, there's no way Ardis would be troubled by the remaining three. And in the end, the three was easily finished off as well, and the judge finally announced the end. Only 30 seconds. It was truly overwhelming. Even though there were 10 times the number of his, he easily overpowered them with just a sword. I see. You have the backing to say that, right? The escorts that were facing him were not at all weak. Even among the elites serving in the Duke's residency, they are 10 of the most powerful escorts. Without even taking a single blow, Ardis had basically insta-killed all 10 of them. There's no one who would argue Ardis's victory. It makes sense why someone of a caliber like Moore would say he could never win against Ardis. There's a need to renew their perception on Ardis as a magician. At the same time, the Duke thought, sending the countless sword sorcerer who is no more than a magician in the public eyes, climbing up the stage hosted by Marquis Holgan without using magic nor arts, and then smacking down the soldier or martial artists under his banner one after another. For Marquis Holgan, it would be no less than a nightmare, even though he had retaliated as much as he could. He's not a duke to easily forgive someone for laying their hands on his dear daughter not just once but twice. If Ardis is able to win in the Lotus Cup against his opponents one after another, it would be the best chance to deal a blow to Marquis Holgan who is an authority over the army. The duke asked Moore who was similarly spectating the match beside. Is this what you expected too? Though I didn't think it would be overwhelming to this point. Well. It's the expected result. Recalling the conversation prior to the match, the Duke asked again. Even if you join them? I bet it's just going to last 10 seconds longer. Moore who replied so shrugged. It seems like the instructor for his daughter was much more than he expected, as the Duke concluded so, he gave his word to Ardis who was approaching without any signs of rough breathing. Fine. I will see to let Ardis gun participate in the Lotus Cup. I shall expect your victory in it, right? Yeah. I plan to answer your expectations. Though it depends on Marquis Holgan if it's going to be interesting or not. The Duke smiled at Ardis's answer which had no fighting spirit at all. Chapter 177 Chapter 177 About twenty days had passed since the Duke had promised Ardis his entry in the Lotus Cup. Meanwhile, the capital had increased in foot traffic more foreigners can be seen walking on the streets, with colorful stalls lining up both sides of the main street. The inns in the capital are all fully occupied. The first day of Lotus Cup, it is the opening ceremony of the event that would make the capital grand lively every year. The venue, the Royal Arena is packed with spectators as the opening ceremony is about to begin. Oi! Did you see the participants this year? Yeah. The Vice Commander of the 3rd Army Division, then the commander of the assault squadron and his rumored son. And from the explorers there's the sword demon and axe saint, the twin horn nagger, and also a female mercenary that's quite famous recently. They have gathered quite the members this year. In one corner of the arena, few men were looking at the participant list and gossiped. 
Beside the man who were getting excited seeing multiple names of famous participants, another man muttered while tilting his head, Hey, this name here, more grey star. More? You mean the former mercenary more? Another man asked after hearing the name. That guy is coming out, albeit he never participated in any prior. But why only now? Of course, they would be doubting it. Although Moore is known for his strength that is in the top ten of the army, neither during his mercenary days nor soldier days did he participate once in the Lotus Cup. Isn't it because he couldn't stay idle for any longer? I heard that he was dormant for a year and even fired from the army. That's why he want to get famous from the Lotus Cup. What a selfish guy. The group who didn't know what really happened only criticized more. But he's strong right? Wouldn't he easily get to the semi-finals if his opponents aren't the worst? Moore's strength is quite well known in the kingdom, regardless of whether he's liked or not. The expectations on him are the same. That's true, the other men agreed and nodded. Rather than that, another man changed the topic. What? This Ardis here. Who is it? One of the men noticed the name after seeing the participants. Ardis? Was there someone like that? Isn't that the countless sword sorcerer? Ardis's name is well known as the subjugator of the three great demons in the kingdom. Although it's not like those people didn't know Ardis, but in a martial arts tournament like the Lotus Cup, the name made a big question mark appear on their head. One of the men had successfully linked the name Ardis with the famous magician but, the others didn't seem convinced. Huh? Why would a magician even participate in a martial arts tournament like this? I don't know even if you ask. Isn't magic banned in the Lotus Cup? Needless to say, they shared their doubts with each other. Isn't it just to fill the slots? Many warriors died in the war with the Empire after all. Certainly, the Kingdom Army had suffered losses because of the war with the Empire, and because of that, many strong warriors in the army were lost. That's why. The Lotus Cup this year compared to previous ones have more explorers and mercenaries. Just because they don't have enough people, that doesn't mean they have to find a magician right? There are many others who are qualified. Even if the number of strong warriors had decreased, there are still many other talented people to fill the slots. For example, the leader of Bright Stars of White Knight, a party active in Thoria, Ted would be a good choice. They didn't know what was the reason they have to find a magician to fill the slots even though there were talented warriors out there. That's true too. So why a magician? In the end, no one from the group was able to make a guess. The men all became silent while still having an unsolved question. Changing the location. The VIP section of the spectating area. A place that is specifically for high-ranking nobles were built with three walls surrounding them. Only the front is open to see the arena and a roof is over them to shield them from the weather. A duke would deserve such special treatment. Any nobles that have a rank lower than a count wouldn't be given a special isolated spectating space. They would have to sit with other nobles in a special area if they want to spectate. Of course, they won't have to pay for any entrance ticket, and their seatings are spaced enough unlike the common seatings, so their treatment are still much better than the common folks. On the other hand, Nobles who are above the Marquis rank are given the privilege of watching from a spacious place along with their families and escorts. In an aristocracy society, it is the norm for such separation. And in one such place is the acting head of the Nyarestia Duchy, his daughter, Minerva, their servants and five escorts. Then Minerva's instructor who is going to participate in the Lotus Cup, Ardis, and also more standing beside. Leaving aside Ardis. Moore who is not even an escort has no reason to be present. That's why he was confused. Why do I have to participate? The person had grumbled in a soft voice to Ardis beside. But the duke who managed to hear it interrogated him. Displeased? N no. Certainly not. Moore panically denied it. It wasn't much different sneaking in one or two persons. Yes, Moore's doubts weren't solved at the duke's vague response. The reason why Moore was confused is that his name was also listed as one of the participants. It seems like the duke had registered for him without saying anything, Minerva thought. In the first place, Moore was caught up in an incident and sent into the other world because of protecting Minerva. Fortunately, they managed to return, but a year had already passed in this world, and so Moore who is absent for an entire year was of course fired from his position in the army. The Duke and Minerva both understands that Moore isn't to blame for his absence for a year, but since it's not an incident they can let the army nor the kingdom know, and also not like it's something believable. In the end, Moore was treated as a disgrace who had abandoned all his duties and got fired from the military. Of course. 
Both Minerva and the Duke feels guilty about it. After all, Moore was the person that protected Minerva along with Ardis, and for the Duke, they're both his benefactors that had managed to bring back his daughter. And so, the Duke thought to use this opportunity to let Moore have a chance to get back his reputation. While sneaking in Ardis as a participant, he had also secured a place for Moore. The plan is to let him show his capabilities in the Lotus Cup. But the problem is that the person himself was not told anything about it. Moore who was invited with the reason of only spectating found out that he is participating just now. It can't be blamed that he's feeling unwilling. Certainly I'm not happy with the people of Marquis Holgin, and Lotus Cup was something I couldn't participate even if I wanted to, so I appreciate your excellency's thoughts but it's only the warriors from Marquis Holgin's banner participating in the tournament. It's said that any strong warriors can take part but outsiders were all eliminated by Marquis Holgin who is the actual organizer, and of course, although Moore's name is well known, he wasn't able to participate because he wasn't Marquis Holgin's men. The Duke prompted Moore to continue since his sentence had dropped off. Speak as you wish. If only at a time when Ardis is not participating, is what I thought. The Duke laughed at Moore's frank words. Ha ha ha. I see. But since you're going down there with my name, I can't have you look so depressed. At least show the spirit that you intend to win against Ardis Khan. Since he was encouraged to have more spirit, Moore tightened his expression. Of course. I will be going with the intention of winning, at the very least, I won't be showing any pathetic sights that would put a dot on your excellency's reputation. I'm expecting it. The duke nodded satisfactorily at Moore's answer. Well, I guess it's time to go to the waiting room, Ardis. Yeah, there's a need for all the participants to move to the waiting room. It's about time they have to make their way there. Moore voiced out to Ardis, then just as he wanted to move. He remembered something. Oh, before that, dot. You can't use your own weapon here. Since it's probably not a good idea to leave it in the waiting room, wouldn't it be better to leave it with His Excellency? That's true. Since it's going to be a fair fight, all mana-infused weapon or tools are banned in the Lotus Cup. Of course, just normal heavy iron made sword would be no problem but, the broadsword and short swords Ardis uses aren't something that can be found in stores. Of course. He wouldn't be allowed to use them. Ardis today had only brought a broadsword with him. Minerva recalled that it was a sword with the name Skies of Myriad Colors if not mistaken. Ardis who took off Skies of Myriad Colors all together with its scabbard handed over to the servant standing by at the back wall as Minerva interrupted. Ah, Shizu, if you don't mind, I will look after it. The sudden proposal made Ardis pause for a while. He asked with a gaze towards her father, and the duke responded not with words as well. He only showed a small affirmative gesture with his chin, and a hard to notice bitter smile. All right, I will leave it to you. After agreeing to it, Ardis handed his sword over to Minerva. Yes, I have certainly received it. I will take care of it even if meant for my life. No wait, it's just a sword, there's no need to be saying that. Ardis said with a troubled face to his pupil who exaggerated before leaving for the waiting room. Oh Jusama, shall I look after it? After Ardis and Moore left the place, one of the servants offered to take over but Minerva hugged the sword in her arms and shook her head with a resolute and stubborn manner. No, it's a very important sword from my Shizu. I will hold on to it until it's time to return. It meant that she's intending to carry the sword in her arms while spectating the Lotus Cup. Unlike her training days, Minerva today is wearing accessories that wouldn't shame her standing as a daughter of a ducal family. But of all things, no one expected that a noble ducal lady wearing a beautiful dress would hug a dirty sword for the entire time. The troubled servant requested help from the duke. Master, phew, let her do as she wish. As for that, the duke answered with a mix of bitter smile, and it was the approval that Minerva most thanked for. Chapter 178 Chapter 178 Originally. The Lotus Cup is used as a form of draining of sorts for the army in the royal capital. Although it was originally held whenever, it became grander every time, and so they decided to publicize it, becoming the Lotus Cup. This is why even after the event became official, the organizer is still the army, and many of the participants are still from the army. Although there were times the tournament was called off because of warring times with the Empire. It will be the 27th Lotus Cup this year. It is now a festival of sorts that is expected in the capital every year. Although there are people who laugh at it being just a stage for Marquis Holgin to flaunt his power, 
It didn't matter for the majority of the kingdom's citizens, especially for the merchants, for them. They wouldn't care less what is the real purpose behind the event as long as there were more customers to earn from, and so, there were many merchants arriving in the capital, not letting a chance to earn slip by. The Lotus Cup was put on hold the previous year because of the war, so it had been two years since the last. Since it's a martial arts tournament originally, no magic is allowed, and mana imbued weapons or tools are all banned. To prevent cheating, all participants will have to use weapons that are provided by the officials. A total of 32 names are on the participants list, and among them, 18 are soldiers either from the royal army or territorial armies of various lands of the kingdom, and the remaining 9 and 5 are mercenaries and explorers respectively. Moore and Ardis both participated as mercenaries. Normally, the participants from the army would be more than 90%, and only 3 or 4 are not from the army. But because of the war last year, the talents in the army had decreased, and because of that, the non-soldier participants this year are unusually more. Well, that's probably one of the reasons why we can participate even though we have no ties with Marquis Holgen at all. More inferred. Is it like that? If they're taking this as a method to flaunt the army power, then they would never let any outsiders participate being an uncertainty. I bet the Marquis and the army thought so as well. They wouldn't let any outsiders participate normally, but since they're saying any strong warrior can take part, and then the Duke recommended us, the Marquis must have no choice but to allow us. The first match is already ongoing on the Royal Arena. On the circular arena with radius about 30 meters, two soldiers holding sword and spear each are against each other. Moore and Ardis are camping at the participants' entrance way spectating with their back leaning on the wall. Although there's a spot for them as participants, there were too many soldiers, mercenaries or explorers of Marquis Holgen there, so they couldn't speak freely. And so the two are standing at the entrance like gatekeepers. Oh! The match is over. Seeing the soldier with the spear is sure to win, Moore got up and patted dusts off his body. I'm up next, see ya later. Greeting Arda slightly. Moore made his way to the center with steps like on a stroll. Which weapon will you use? One official asked while showing a table with various kinds of weapon on display. A single-handed sword and a light shield will be good. And so, Moore took a sword and a small round shield with him. Fixing the shield on his left arm, he grasped the sword and tightened his grip a few times. Un, this one's good. Saying so, he walked towards the arena where his opponent and the judge is waiting. The judge looked like a soldier in his forties. Although it's not someone more recognizes, he must be of considerable position given that he's serving as a judge in the Lotus Cup. As for his opponent, he's clearly showing hostility towards Moore. To think that you would appear here. His opponent that had been glaring him approaching said, Oh well, it's not like I expected myself to be here too. Beware of your words, commoner. His opponent is a non-commissioned officer in his mid-twenties. Just like how he no more. Moore knows him as well, although he's not Moore's direct subordinate considering they're in different battalions, he is still someone Moore had crossed swords with in training sessions. It seems like he's not fond of Moore who climbed the ranks despite being a mercenary, and also because Moore didn't really care about pointing it out, all Moore remembers is his hostility. He was a platoon leader if Moore recalls correctly. Don't be so uptight, we're comrades that had undergone the same training right? You're no longer my superior. You are no more than a cowardly commoner that had abandoned his duties, and in no position should I listen to you. Unlike Moore who is a mercenary, he's someone with a background, and he had always been thorny towards Moore. It seems like he wouldn't even try to hide his animosity towards Moore who has now lost his position and power within the army now. How cold of you. Someone here is filled with sadness losing his job. He would appreciate more concern. Shut up, 34 years old child. For someone so simply like you to be a battalion commander, it is damaging the reputation of our proud Nagra's army. I shall personally teach you to not show your face in the capital anymore. The judge finally decided to interrupt the two prolonged greetings. Stop there. This is no place for an argument. Glaring at the two equally, the judge couldn't bear them any longer and decided to just do his job. Are you familiar with the rules? There's no time limit. Magic and arts are forbidden. And of course, outside help are not allowed. The outcome is decided if an effective attack on a critical spot landed, or if one side is incapacitated, on the occasion of losing your weapon. It will continue until you express your loss verbally. Again, no weapons or tools other than the ones supplied in the event is allowed. 
The judge took out two armbands from his pocket and handed over to both Moore and his opponent. This is imbued with a special barrier that would prevent any outside support with magic. Taking it off mid-match is forbidden. Taking it off willingly will be seen as a loss immediately. Clear? Moore nodded silently, and put the armband on his left arm. Then both sides take five steps back. After glaring Moore for another time, the officer silently turned around and started walking. Similarly, Moore took five steps back and muttered in monologue, Good grace, if someone like him is participating, they must be really lacking people in the army. The army is in a bad spot more than I expected huh? As he walked, the footstep sounds he made were dry. After both sides have backed off five steps and faced towards each other again, the judge announced the start. And now, start. The opponent took the first step and rushed in at Moore. He's with similar equipment like Moore a sword and a shield, but unlike Moore who chose a round shield, he is using a kite shield that covers his whole left arm. Would anyone really choose those gear facing a mercenary in a one-on-one -on -one fashion? Muttering softly, Moore took half a step ahead matching his opponent's stride. Take this. The attack with momentum was redirected by the round shield. TCH. Was he confident in his first strike? He clicked his tongue while dealing the second and third. Moore observed his opponent calmly while dodging the attacks. He, you became more skillful. Obviously, unlike you idling for a year, there's no more than the number one hand can count who knows the incident that Moore was transported to another world along with the daughter of Duke Nyrestia. It wasn't his intention to be absent for a year but, it can't be helped that everyone thought he had abandoned his duties for a year. In any case, it's not like Moore took it easy at all. Rather, albeit just a day. Moore seriously thought that his life was in constant danger. Of course, it's not a venue for him to explain specially for his opponent, nor did he had the intentions to do so. Moore ignored what he said and responded with something of his own. But aren't you too focused on offense? As if an instructor pointing out his mistakes, Moore counterattacked at the same time. After defending against three attacks, Moore decided to counterattack and swing at the kite shield in his opponent's hand. A dull metallic rung and the kite shield in the officer's hands shook. Q. He tried to turn his body left in panic but, Moore was already gone. Moore had changed his position just as his opponents turned, then another heavy blow was aimed for the shield again. The attack that came from an unexpected angle stumbled the non-commissioned officer. Stop running around. I mean, you should have expected this the moment you have brought out a shield this big. Answering the irritated officer. Moore swung at the shield again. Contrary to the officer who only stood in place defending, Moore moved around swiftly and attacked from all directions towards the shield. Who was the one holding an upper hand? It was obvious even from a distance. Are you so cowardly to avoid a fair fight? Are you stupid I say? I don't see a need to put myself in danger more than needed. We are proud soldiers of the Royal Army. So, rather, I'm not a soldier already, remember? Didn't you say that yourself just now? Moore unintentionally smirked at the officer who looked like he had forgotten what he just said. Whatever. If you want a fair fight so much, then I guess I can do that. Moore stopped his leg after saying, Good decision, commoner. Yes yes. It's my honor for such a praise, little young master. Quiet. Even though you're speaking whatever you like, what selfishness. Words are unneeded. Redirecting the sword that came his way again with the round shield. Moore swung his own sword as retaliation. Knowingly that it will be blocked by the kite shield, Moore decided to kick up the sand with his left foot. What? The officer shrunk away at the attack that came from an unexpected direction. Of course, Moore would not let that gap slip. Pulling his leg and making him fall, Moore stabbed out and stopped his sword just before his neck from behind. Match. The judge declared in a loud voice. It's obvious that Moore had won. Look here. Your view is really narrow. Which shield to choose, what kind of attack to use, you probably never thought of handling multiple opponents with that. Even if it's in the Lotus Cup, even if it's just against one person, it's a mistake to think that you're only going to get attacked from one direction. Anyways, if you're falling for small tricks like that, you will die early. Shit. It's cowardly to use a blinding attack. Not sparing an ear to what Moore said, he only complained. After sighing a little. Moore stood up and decided to take off the armband and return the weapon before going to where Ardis is. Judge. That attack just now is cheating. It's against the rules to use a weapon other than the one provided. It seems like he wasn't convinced at his defeat and complained at the judge. 
but the response he got was cruel. You're saying the sand at your feet is a weapon? What stupidity. In the first place, if that's against the rules, it would mean countless winners of the past Lotus Cup will be invalidated. Who would dirty the name of our past winners just because of you? Right. There were past cases in the Lotus Cup where someone had won because they used sand or rocks at their feet. Using the sand and rocks at their feet are recognized as the ability to discern the situation and is not seen as a weapon. It's his wrong to have participated in the Lotus Cup without even verifying that in the first place. Will he ever realize that what Moore said about his vision being narrow doesn't just refer to the opponent he can see? Well, it's not my obligation to look after him. Moore left the arena not giving another thought about him. Chapter 179 Chapter 179 It's your turn next. When is it again? Moore returned from his first match and asked Ardis the eleventh match. Then there's still a lot of time left. Wanna return to the spectating room? Looking away from Moore's suggestion, Ardis's gaze was on the nobles' seatings. What's the matter? Similarly, as Moore looked at where Ardis was looking, he became oh my. That's quite a glare. Not even looking anywhere close to the arena where the third match is currently ongoing, there was a middle-aged man who had been glaring at Moore ever since the end of the Moore's match. He was a thin person with a flimsy impression. His appearance didn't seem dignified at all, but since he's sitting in the noble's seatings and wearing good clothes, he must be some higher-ranking noble. Someone you know? Rather, that's the Marquis Holgan in question. Well, he must be thinking of us as pesky bugs. Have you not seen him before? He is the perpetrator and the reason behind why Minerva was targeted and Ardis and more missing from this world for an entire year. That's the Marquis huh? Since someone not under him like me won, he must be really irritated. I mean, your turn to get that glare is not far from now but, well, it's too late to say anything now right? Yeah. Replying simply to Moore's word of warning, Ardis switched his gaze onto the fight happening on the arena. The match between the mercenary and the explorer are still undecided, the spectators are even more fired up than when Moore's match was easily decided. It was about past noon when Ardis's turn finally came. After being sent off by Moore, Ardis had chosen a sword about the same size as skies of myriad colors and headed off to the arena. His opponent is a mercenary active in the capital. With leather armor covering himself, he's holding a slightly longer sword. Seeing the handle and even the blade is several parts longer. Ardis thought that it must be a sword intended for two-handed use rather than one. I know of your stories, having the strength to subjugate the three great demons by yourself. But sorry, is this a joke or what? This is a martial arts tournament. Why a magician like you is here? The opposing mercenary was appraising Ardis. Why huh? It's a simple reason to win. Since he would be making troubles for the duke if he said his real purpose, he had no choice to make one up. Even if the weapon are blunt. It will still kill someone if hit the wrong spot. And having no protective gear, are you stupid or what? Unlike the mercenary who had armor, Ardis can be said totally naked. Not even a shield in his hand, he only had clothes that looked like a robe befitting a magician. It's too uncertain to even refer something much like that as wearing defensive gear. Even a blunt weapon could easily shatter bones with its weight. It's natural why the mercenary was pointing that out. Defensive gear is only useful when you actually take a hit though. I gave my warning. The mercenary's brows quivered at Ardis' arrogant words, and showed that he wouldn't care anymore and turned around. Similarly, Ardis took distance, and as if their timing matched, both of them turned back towards each other at the same time. Ready, begin. The judge declared the start. The first to move is the mercenary. But as expected. He didn't underestimate Ardis to not have any countermeasures against himself rushing, so he's approaching very carefully. I don't know how a magician like you plan to fight but, the mercenary took his sword with both hand and swung. Don't underestimate a swordsman too much. The target of the sword was Ardis's wrist. It seems that he plans to disarm Ardis with a strong blow and win by that. Who's the one though? Ardis had a bitter smile as he was underestimated. Perhaps he was suspicious of a magician participating in such a martial arts tournament, so he approached carefully, but still he must have underestimated Ardis somehow. The moment when he thought he can end the match in just one move without even a feint showed his misjudgment in Ardis's strength. Ardis tilted the blade of his sword, and redirected the blow that came for his wrist. I see, so you're not a total amateur huh? The mercenary took distance while a little impressed. After breathing once. 
The mercenary dashed in once again, three continuos slashes. The horizontal slash for his right flank was avoided with a backstep, the diagonal slash coming at his shoulder was parried, and the last aiming for his abdomen was dodged with a sidestep. I will have to acknowledge that you're not just a magician. It was a combo that would have finished anyone not on par easily, having dodged all of them easily. The mercenary renewed his appraisal on Ardis. I'm going serious now. Suit yourself. The mercenary's attack became even more furious than before. It seems like he had decided to go all out having recognized Ardis as a worthy foe. But for Ardis, it's not something he cared anyways. The countless times when his sword was swung, Ardis sometimes dodged, sometimes parried, and sometimes redirected them. It would appear that Ardis is disadvantageous at first glance since Ardis is only on the defensive side. But even the spectators could probably notice that Ardis is easily dealing with all the attacks without breaking a sweat, at the very least. The opposing mercenary had realized that. Why are you not attacking? I don't want them to think I won by chance you see. How are you going? At the very least, I'm intending to not let my guard down. A short exchange while their sword didn't stop. On one hand, the expression is becoming a little anxious, and on the other hand, the expression is still completely calm. It's about time for me to go. About five minutes had passed since the match started. It wasn't a long time by any means. But having defended against his opponent's sword for that long, the spectators would recognize that Ardis has considerable experience in close quarters combat. Though, it might look like he's barely holding on to the match defending against the offensive mercenary. In any case, that ends here too. Ardis switched his defense into offense, parrying the mercenary sword up into the air strongly. Ardis stepped in seeing a gap. What? Although the mercenary tried to retreat seeing Ardis approached him suddenly. Ardis wouldn't easily let him go. Another blow towards the mercenary sword that is one beat later than the retreating mercenary. Q. If it's an actual battle, if the mercenary had a spare weapon, he wouldn't have to forcefully grip the sword even with an uncertain stance. But in this match, losing his weapon would basically spell defeat. And of course, knowingly it's a bad move, the mercenary did not let go of his sword, causing his stance to collapse. Although Ardis added on a kick onto the mercenary's leg, He's still a warrior who had trained in actual battles. Seeing through Ardis's intentions in a moment's notice, he let Ardis's kick boost him and take distance. That's not how a magician moves. The mercenary looks surprised. Is that so? Ardis stepped forward while acting oblivious. Ardis swung towards the mercenary left shoulder from his right leg. What? Although managed to block it, the mercenary looked surprised. After all, he almost fell because of Ardis's unrestrained blow. Panically taking few steps backwards, he firmed his grip on the two-handed sword. Was that strengthened with magic? Although the mercenary suspected it, Ardis simply denied it. No way that's the case though. I think this armband is supposed to prevent that. But, the armband that the participants need to wear are for the reason of preventing any outside interference with magic. The effect is very simple. Within a radius of three meters of the wearer, all mana is disabled. The same mechanism is present on the shackles for criminals, slaves, or castaway people. It was the same pattern on the circlet of castaway people that he saw on Philia and Rihanna when they first met. The only difference being that Ardis can easily remove it at will. It's different from the shackles that would cause immense pain if removed forcefully. We both can't use magic. But it's not like physical strength is sealed to right? Although under the same conditions, the mercenary was easily overpowered by Ardis. In other words, without magic, Ardis's raw strength is on par with the mercenary, or much greater. The mercenary looked speechless. He must have realized Ardis's strength after exchanging swords. Well, let's resume. Without waiting for an answer, Ardis stepped forward. His legs kicked against the ground, and easily closed the distance to the mercenary in a moment. Fast, delivering a punch into the guts of the mercenary who swung his sword by reflex. Ardis like flowing water circled around to his opponent's back. Although the mercenary struggled to counterattack towards his back, something like that wouldn't work of course. Before the blade even reached, the mercenary's wrist was held firmly with one of Ardis's hands. It's the end. Saying that, Ardis's sword was touching the mercenary's neck. Seeing Ardis suddenly turned around the fight in just a few moves, the whole of the spectators went up in cheers. Match. The judge declared Ardis's victory. Just as Ardis heard the judge, he withdrew the sword and his grip on the mercenary's wrist. Ah, uh, a loss. A complete loss.
The mercenary who accepted his defeat massaged at his neck where Ardis's sword was touching just now. A magician with that kind of moves, it's plain cheating. While delivering a grumble to Ardis, for the mercenary, all he could do is curse at his bad luck for encountering Ardis at the first match. In the public eyes, if the news of him losing against a magician in the tournament spreads, it would hinder his future work. Of course. Ardis understood why he was grumbling. Though I don't recall having named myself a magician before. What? Aren't you the sword magic user? Isn't it because of it that you can subjugate the three great demons? The mercenary tilted at Ardis's unexpected words. It's true that I can use magic, too, but I never said that's the only thing I can do. Hearing that answer, the mercenary looked convinced. It's something like that huh? Something like that it is. Losing in a sword fight with a magician would mean his reputation will reach rock bottom. But if Ardis is not just a magician, then it's a different story. Then, at least win your second match. If you go down after this match, I will be even worse than a clown. Don't worry. I will make sure you won't be ashamed of losing to me. Ardis's purpose in the Lotus Cup is not to smear the reputation of his opponents. But Marquis Holgins, even more so since the mercenary is an outsider as well. Leaving aside if Ardis didn't personally like him, Ardis didn't intend to make enemies out of anyone. Seriously, the world is wide huh? Saying that, the mercenary hit Ardis's shoulder lightly, before going down the stage to the waiting room. Chapter 180 Chapter 180 The second day of Lotus Cup, 16 matches were done in the first day and 16 participants were eliminated already. Eight matches is planned for the second day. Ardis's match will be the sixth. Moore who had already won in the first match of the day obligatorily sent out Ardis. Apparently, it's the famous kid from the Assault Platoon. Since the Assault Platoon is set up by Marquis Holgin, they're literally reared by the Marquis. Be careful since it's certain they will target you. Don't worry. I know. Likely brushing off Moore's warning, Ardis stepped towards the arena. The spectators that had been with cheers started murmuring. It's natural. Although Ardis is famous as a mercenary, that only amounts to his title of countless sword sorcerer. It's already considered weird he would participate in the Lotus Cup despite magic is forbidden. On top of that, he had won in his first match. Most of the spectators must have seen the spectacle of Ardis's match yesterday. Despite that, they must have thought that it might have been a fluke. Rather than cheers. The murmurs indicated that the audience had not grasped on Ardis's strength. Like yesterday, Ardis brought a sword with dulled edge onto the arena. His opponent that entered from the opposite is a young man. His age looks to be in the early twenties. Although his face wasn't the prettiest nor the worst, his large eyes gave off a strong-willed impression. His weapon of choice is a short spear about as long as his height. From his clothing which is the uniform of the Royal Army. It's easy to guess that he's affiliated with the army. The same explanation from the judge as the first match took place, and the match started with the both taking five steps away from each other. The two took few steps towards each other in silence, albeit short. The opponent holds a spear. His reach is much longer than Ardis's sword. As the distance between them closed within three meters, the soldier asked suddenly, I don't know what tricks you used but... A magician treading on the glorious stage of the Lotus Cup. Stupidity has its limit. The soldier that had been quiet so far was spiteful. In the first sentence, have you not seen the match yesterday? Ardis had known from the start the people's perception of him being a magician participating in the Lotus Cup. That is why Ardis had made it obvious in the first match. It was not a victory by chance. Anyone who had paid attention yesterday would have understood that. You might be able to get by doing deals under the table with another mercenary. But it won't work against us from the army. R, there's that thinking too huh. It seems like his first match was suspected to be just a show of backroom dealing. Since his opponent was another mercenary, he was suspected to be match fixing. I see, as Ardis was weirdly convinced. The murmurs from the spectators as well would make sense if they're suspecting that too. I shall not let you defile the Great Lotus Cup any longer. The Marquis had ordered directly to not show any mercy. If you have a grudge, Blame it on your own arrogance to take part in a martial arts tournament. It seems like the first match was not enough to overturn the perception on Ardis. Ardis shrugged inwardly as it seemed like the preconceived opinions on him was greater than he expected. That's so, I won't hold back either then. He showed that he can easily defeat his opponent without using sword magic in the first match. He managed to defeat his opponent after receiving attacks from the mercenary. But since it's the second match, 
Ardis had no reason to put up a show just to appeal his strength. All that left is to fulfill his purpose. It's easy to win, but just winning won't calm his irritation. After all, as well as the incident of targeting his pupil, Ardis intends to return his regards of getting separated from this world for an entire year forcefully. Blowing away the short spear? No, that would decide the outcome instantly. Beat his opponent with his sword? No. If it hits a critical spot, then the match is over, and even if any wasn't hit, the match is over if he's incapacitated as well. Ardis's choice was to break the opponent's heart and force him to forfeit. Unlike the mercenary yesterday. He need not spare mercy for the soldier that is hostile towards him. There's no need to play along with him who had been disrespectful from the start. The next moment, Ardis kicked against the ground. Closing the distance instantly, Ardis hit the short spear up in the air. Ardis who had suddenly closed in had a sword at the soldier's throat. The soldier swallowed his breath at the sudden attack. But that's just a short moment. Ardis immediately withdrew his sword. What? Are you not coming? Ardis took a few steps back and provoked. Provoked by that, the soldier who already was full of fighting intent stabbed with his spear sharply. It was not a shabby stab. Since he's in the Lotus Cup, it is enough to be a sight. But his aim was too straight. It's a young stab. Ardis had a bad remark on him. Although it's sharp, Ardis could read its obvious trajectory and redirect them easily. Stepping forward, while the sword in his right hand pinned down the blade of the spear, Ardis yanked the soldier by the arm and made him fall forcefully, and within the flow, Ardis's sword touched the opponent's neck. But since it was such a short moment between the fast-paced movements, the judge nor any spectators managed to notice it. Second, Ardis immediately released him and retreated before saying so. The soldier who understood the meaning behind that was filled with rage, regardless to whatever he was feeling. Ardis dashed in, dodging the two spear attacks that came his way by swaying his body. Ardis hit on the spear handle towards the ground and dived deeper. In a distance that the two almost crashed into each other, Ardis's left hand stretched, grasped and released the soldier's neck in only a moment. However, from the judge's perspective, Ardis's body was blocking that action. Third, Ardis was counting the number of fatalities that the opponent would have suffered. That would mean he would have died three times over in an actual fight. It's exactly that the soldier understood that that his face looked like he swallowed dirt. But Ardis didn't stop there. Skillfully manipulating his position to not let the judge see the decisive hit, he would repeat touching the opponent's neck either with his sword or his hand. Of course. He never forgot to count each time it happened. 16. No matter how foolish his opponent might be, he would be forced to understand the difference in ability after getting shown that his vital spots can be hit that easily. The rage-filled face that was apparent in the beginning too had lost its color by the tenth time. It had now surpassed white and in the blue territory. And of course, with that many exchanges repeated, there were spectators that noticed the irregularity as well. Hey. Wasn't that on a vital spot? Really? The judge would have said something otherwise. Since the judge hadn't said anything, then isn't it a no count? But it looked like the sword stopped just at his neck or chest multiple times already though. Yeah, they're vital hits no matter how I see it. The spectators started to murmur in a different meaning than in the beginning. Ardis had aimed for the vital spots only when the judge couldn't see it from his angle. But in other words, Anyone who is looking other than from that angle saw it as bright as the day. For those who are familiar with martial arts or those who have good eyes, they must be starting to realize what's happening. The murmurs were heard by the soldier too. Even an amateur could tell Ardis is overwhelming him. And of course, for those who lives by fighting, they must have noticed Ardis's true abilities long by now. It can be said that the soldier's reputation is hitting rock bottom. What an untasteful personality I have, Ardis smiled bitterly inwardly. But since he had participated with the purpose of humiliating Marquis Holgin, he wouldn't show any mercy for those that are on his side. 17. Dodging the soldier's attack and circling to his back, Ida spoke behind him where his heart would be. If that was a dagger, then it would have meant the soldier died instantly. Although Ardis immediately retreated in preparation for his next move, did his opponent finally lose his will? He collapsed on the ground listlessly. Even though the match will end if Ardis put a sword at his neck now, Ardis decided to stay back and watch. An awkward silence ruled a few moments, then he declared, I forfeit. The words that were rung out were that the soldier admitted his own defeat. All his attacks were dodged, or invalidated, and the counter-attacks that came for him easily reached for his vital spots. The league is apparent. 
But his opponent didn't seem like he wanted the match to end. His heart that would be shaved off whenever the count raised finally broke at the 17th time. The humiliation of him forfeiting in the match, needless to say himself, the master of the faction, what would Marquis Holgan be feeling now? Of course, it's not my intentions to stop at just this much. Looking at the nobles seating where the Marquis is at, Ardis muttered the words that wouldn't reach match. Among the noisy murmurs of the spectators, the judge finally declared Ardis's victory. Chapter 181 Chapter 181 Cheap, cheap, sweet apples from calves are on sale now. Any details you want to know in the second match of the Lotus Cup is all in our Lotus News. It's the latest news having only printed just now. The people that came to watch the Lotus Cup and also merchants who wouldn't want to miss the chance to earn had mingled together in the capital and created a bustling scene. Having no bright events after the war with the Empire two years ago, the event this time is especially more successful. Smiles were on the pedestrians, and the stall owners were busily trying to attract customers. Within such a bustling atmosphere, there was a girl dressed just like any town girl seemingly left behind from it. Her medium short hair are closer to black. Her brown pupils are directed at a certain person past all the crowds. The girl had no name. Having no knowledge of even her age or her origins, she was raised by a group whom she only knows as the organization. And the parents that had raised her only imparted her the ways of surviving and also outwit enemies, and also killing people. Eventually, the girl had been given the code name of Crimson Osprey and the organization, and moved according to the wills and orders of the organization. It was a year ago that the life of Crimson Osprey who had been living such a life without any doubts to her situation was turned upside down. It was an assassination job targeting a certain noble's daughter. That time, Crimson Osprey had participated as the observer, not partaking in direct combat. However, the nine assailants excluding her, all of them are not any assassins but the bests of the organization. Even though it was a gather of the organization's powerhouse, all of them met the dirt instead. Beside the target, there was a powerful mercenary that is known as Countless Sword Sorcerer. Everything became strange after that. Crimson Osprey concluded after recalling the past. After the failed assassination attempt, a new order from the organization came for Crimson Osprey. Her new order was to monitor the main reason behind their failure, the Countless Sword Sorcerer. And so Crimson Osprey focused on monitoring this mercenary. She had constantly surveilled his movements, and reported it to the carrier pigeon that would appear every so often. That man, where could he have gone after getting away from me? After a few days of constantly losing her eyes on her target, she encountered something that she wouldn't expect to ever happen. The countless swords had made a move on the organization's base in the capital. I never expected him to rush in the front door of the organization. Heading straight into one of the organization's base in a street that even homeless people would avoid using, the countless swords had easily overpowered everyone. Crimson Osprey had watched it happen from afar. The mission I have is to only monitor that man. It's none of my concern what happened to the base and the people inside it. The mission is the highest priority. There should have been at least few that are used to fighting in that base. Although it might be few, there should be one or two capable people on her level. But the countless swords had easily trampled on the base without any effort. Fighting with something like that. Fortunately, Crimson Osprey's mission was to only monitor, and not assault. I would if they ordered to attack but there's no chance to win at all. He isn't someone that simple to handle like what Jan Crank who died said, it was obvious to Crimson Osprey. Another, then another base that the countless swords destroyed after passing through. The bases of the organization that is infamous for having immense control over the capital's dark society were all destroyed except for one in a single day. She felt like she wouldn't believe it if not seeing with her own eyes, but at the same time, she felt the pain of having the difference in strength shown to her plainly. It all feels like a dream but, it's the undeniable reality. And then the countless swords marched into the last and the biggest base in the capital. Even though some of the best men were lost in the assassination attempt, the countless swords still had to face many of them. The boss's place have many skilled ones. He should have prepared enough combat power to handle even the army and his escape route should have been secured in the first place. Despite so, this result, even though she thought that the number of people would give the countless swords some difficulties, looking from the roof of a building three blocks away, it was completely a trample. The raid ended in the building filled to the brim of corpses. Of course, 
The corpses are all people of the organization. In the end, just making one man their enemy destroyed the organization. Crimson Osprey who was monitoring the situation with a cold gaze as usual witnessed another strange happening. The countless swords that is the only person alive in the building suddenly looked like he was in pain, collapsed to his knees on the ground. Under her surveillance, it looked like his body turned misty. The decorations on the wall that couldn't be seen before started to show through the countless swords body. What a pathetic thing, recalling it now standing the stunned and then losing my target. The countless sword that became thinner like mist eventually disappeared into nothingness as if he wasn't there in the first place. What was left was the organization's base that is filled with corpses. Losing her surveillance target, Crimson Osprey had searched for him continuously. A year had passed since then her. Huh? A year ago, Crimson Osprey who had lost her surveillance target returned to her hideout and waited for further orders. But no matter how she waited, there wasn't anyone from the organization including the carrier pigeon that came. Even when she returned to the base according to the emergency guidelines of the organization, there wasn't anyone there. It's natural. After all, she had witnessed the incident where everyone in the base was slaughtered herself. It was the first time when Crimson Osprey felt like her life was uncertain. After following and executing every order and instructions that came from the organization, she couldn't do anything by herself if not for an order. Then the best course is to continue the last order. Crimson Osprey had managed to find a purpose of monitoring the countless sword sorcerer to suppress her confusion of nowhere to go. But her surveillance target had disappeared into nothingness with no traces, even when she wandered the capital regardless of night and day. She could never find any clue to where the countless swords had gone. A year had passed while she repeated that. With no further orders, Crimson Osprey's life of executing only her last order can be said cruel. The girl that was only taught to live within the organization was suddenly thrown into the wilderness. For Crimson Osprey to focus on her missions, her needs were all provided by the organization. That's why she had no need to earn for her own. I wasn't taught any of it, albeit familiar with the arts of killing people. She's in no way familiar with how to live like a normal person. Although she was taught various common knowledge, it's not like knowing it will help her use it. Living normally is a concept too foreign for Crimson Osprey. Her utmost priority is still monitoring the countless sword sorcerer. She must find out her target's location in order for that. Execute the mission if there's any time for anything. Crimson Osprey had been living her life with no time even to sleep. All her time was only dedicated to her mission. Crimson Osprey that had lost the organization's support had troubles even finding food. No different from the daily life of the abandoned children in the slums living by finding leftovers and stealing from the stalls. No strength and my vision is shaky. And my head feels light for some reason. Everything was fine when the organization was there to feed me. Having spent no time for her own sake. The current Crimson Osprey looked barely like a town girl. Her face is shaped that doesn't look like any young girl, her thin body, and the messy dark brown hair that had lost its luster. Even under such conditions, Crimson Osprey was bound under the last order of monitoring the countless sword sorcerer. Crimson Osprey's world was only the organization, and living meant following their orders. It had been about a year she had lived searching without a clue because of her mission. And suddenly... The countless sword sorcerer reappeared in the capital. Her doubts regarding where he had been, when did he return didn't disappear. But finally after catching sight of her target, Crimson Osprey felt an indescribable happiness that even made her tremble. I won't lose sight of you again. Crimson Osprey muttered softly as she melted into the busy streets. Chapter 182 Chapter 182 the Lotus Cup entered the third day. The initial 32 participants had now only left eight. Participating in the Lotus Cup is already an honorable achievement. But anyone who had won till the third day is considered glorious enough in the martial arts world. Despite so, more who appeared in front of Ardis on that morning looked a little awkward. Hey Ardis. What? Ardis replied after being called out by more who looked like he wants to sigh. Those people with political power are really tyrannical and selfish. Are you sure you can handle them? They're all about like that but, what's up? Well, I think I know. Seeing Moore's appearance, Marquis Holgan must have done something. It's about the most important time for the Lotus Cup, 
and the Marquis is sure to be pulling some string behind now. My opponent was changed. That's so. I just didn't think much of it. That's quite the uninterested reply. Aren't you interested in who is it? It's not like I'm the one fighting right? That might not be the case. Meaning? I just asked the meaning behind Moore's words. I mean, the opponent I'm facing was changed to none other than you. Ardis. Me? Ardis looked a little surprised at the sudden revelation. That's strange though. What happened to the match up yesterday? More had come out the second match of the day, and Ardis's was the sixth. From how the order goes, they should only meet up at the finals. There should have been no way they will match up in the quarterfinals. Is there any past cases where the match up is changed? No. This should be the first time as far as I know. Ardis's expression looked a little sour. It must be Marquis Holgan's doing. Huh. Nine out of ten it is. We're no more than annoyance to him. Since we've won our matches so far, he must have thought of doing something and eliminating either one of us is the best idea he thought. It must be the Marquis Holgan wanting to eliminate even either one of them that he had altered the matchup of the tournament. It was obvious why he would set up Ardis to go against Moore. His intentions are clear like water. Well, considering it's his stage of performance, it's no doubt we're no more than annoyance. If they're advancing in the tournament, Moore would clash eventually. That's something inevitable. The original matchup can be said best for them. Might as well fight each other at the finals to thoroughly defame Marquis Holgin, so the sudden change in the brackets was undesirable. But then again, I thought Marquis Holgin would be more shrewd. I was even on guard for it. While joking around, Moore's eyes were still serious. Small fries would always try to do something that makes it looks like they're unrelated at first. They would only do something more direct after failing. Though I didn't really want to fight with you until the finals. Moore spoke what Ardis thought too. In the first place, their purpose on this stage is different. After getting transported into another world together with Minerva, he must have understood Ardis's strength with his own eyes. Moore sighed again, looked down and shrugged. It seems like he was convincing himself. Well, it's no use grumbling over it now. That's right. One of my always caught with trouble acquaintance said that going with the flow of life is essential. Who? Oh, you're speaking like you won now, isn't that being careless? Towards Ardis who spoke like not towards his opponent, Moore was criticizing. Did you not know, I'm a swordsman right? Moore clicked his tongue after hearing the black-haired young man saying that as a matter of fact. It's hard to believe but, it seems to be the case. Either way, we will know when we fight. Talking this and that here won't change the fact that our matchup is decided. That's true. Moore understood that too. With a change of pace, he agreed with Ardis. But since I'm also here thanks to His Excellency. I can't go down without a fight. Expect me to try my best. Of course, Ardis is short answered with a grin. The time for the match have come, Ardis and Moore walked out towards the middle. TCH, that guy is snickering up there. Moore was grumbling hatefully, and Ardis was prompted to look at the nobles area. It is the same lame looking person that was glaring at Moore when he won the first match. Marquis Holgan is the perpetrator behind the assassination incident on Minerva. He must have waited happily for Ardis and Moore who are annoyance participating under Duke Nyrestia's power to fight each other. Rather than a smile of anticipation for the match, it was obvious to Ardis that it is a smirk proud of his own actions. It's irritating to have it his way. But that's just how it is with someone that has power. I don't think His Excellency can do anything to the sudden rule change as well. Why? I bet that face is going to be red in flames by the time Lotus Cup is over. Let him be happy now. After all, it was the purpose why Ardis participated. Ardis and Moore met eyes for a moment, before returning them forward. Another two steps and it looked like Moore realized something and looked at Ardis with a dubious look. Did you really participate because of that? Hey, keep the talk later. We're opponents now. Ardis chose the same weapon as the two prior matches while shutting Moore up and move to the starting position indicated why the judge. What a pity. Moore who was left behind shrugged, and took up his shield and sword without a choice and moved to the starting position as well. Same to Pryor, the judge reiterated over the rules, and finally the start signal rang out in the arena. Here I come. Just as the match started, Moore leapt out in a straight line. Ardis as well did not stay passive this match and went forward. One of the dulled swords came from overhead, another came from the side. The two met each other and produced a loud ringing noise. It felt like the true starting signal for the match. The two took some distance after the first exchange, then as if planned in advance, 
they took three steps counterclockwise. Two swords exchanged again after the angle changed. Can you dodge this? Moore stabbed outwards after taking half a step back. Ardis tried to deflect it and counterattack it with a downward slash. It's my turn, but his counterattack stopped halfway. After all, reading Ardis's counterattack, Moore's shield were ready. Rather than defending using it, it was more like a shield bash towards Ardis. TCH. By a hairbreadth, Ardis managed to stop it with the handle of his sword, and went for a kick from the side as retaliation. Too obvious. Against that, Moore didn't dodge or avoid it, but instead advanced even more. A kick's force leverages the lever principe with the body as the fulcrum. Because of that, the power is at its maximum when the target is at the very edge of the attack radius. Conversely, getting closer to the fulcrum would mean losing power and of course the speed behind it as well. Then, Ardis whose kicking power was dragged to a stop changed his target but, at the same time, seeing that Moore moved his shield in defense, he made his stop. That moment, the role of defending and attacking reversed. The side where his shield was, Moore opened his fist, and a rock was let loose from his hands towards Ardis's eyes. From there, Ardis who had understood Moore's intentions tilted away his head to avoid a direct attack towards his eyes. Of course. Moore wouldn't let that chance slip. Ardis realized he was at a disadvantage as he tried to retreat. Stopping the shield bash with the handle of the sword, Ardis managed to make use of its momentum and take some distance. The countless exchanges happened in just a short time brought intense cheering to the arena. Among a gather of exceptional talents, Ardis's and Moore's swordsmanship aren't that exceptional. Every single sword that the elites of the army swung were like refined stories that drew the spectators in. On the other hand, their swordsmanship were underhanded and the most human-like. Their swordsmanship were trained and mixed with blood and sweat. Kicking, blinding attacks, feints, it can be said like the fangs of a wild beast called human. There wasn't any beauty nor elegance behind it. However, many were still captivated by its vitality and wildness. A tense moment between the moves linked like flowing water. The gallant figures of the two looking and aiming for each other's gap were standing out, as expected from a mercenary. Ardis was impressed at Moore's adaptability. Well, I have my experience fighting with those that have weird screws before I entered the army. I suppose so. A mercenary got to have that experience. Unlike nobles who are taught from young as an obligation, or those soldiers that received training with discipline in a group, standing on a battlefield with just oneself, Ardis had been living a life where it's uncertain a friend from yesterday will become an enemy today. Although he didn't know if Moore who had been living in a world without many wars had such experiences, he could tell that the lives of mercenaries that are used only as convenient gophers are not that blessed. They're not fighting for fame nor name, nor was it for someone else, with just a beautiful way of fighting. It can be said a mercenary's way of living is too harsh for that. I don't know how those elegant people fight as well, so I will have you know that it's my forte too. Moore replied lightly to Ardis's declaration. It's not like I have any complaints about that. I thought so. With a slight smile on their face, Ardis kicked against the ground and resumed the fight again. Chapter 183 Chapter 183 Ardis who had closed the distance rapidly made his move first. Drawing back his sword with both hands, twisting his waist, he stabbed along with his running momentum. It was a straightforward attack from an outside perspective. Moore easily dodged it by twisting his upper body in an angle. But in the next moment, Moore would immediately realize that his opponent is not that straightforward but a shrewd bastard. Ardis's thrusting trajectory changed, and then moved inwards to Moore's right arm. Ot, too. Moore panicked at the unexpected feint from Ardis. But Moore is not an average swordsman as well. Immediately turning his arm away and avoiding his sword being deflected by Ardis, he tried to strike against Ardis's sword with the blunt of his shield. Ardis immediately released one grip off his sword. With one hand now free, he directly grabbed at the edge of the shield and stopped its movement. Oi, what the heck was that? What kind of reflex do you have? Nope, it was really close. Just as Ardis said so, he tried to pull the shield towards himself in hopes of making Moore stumble. Not that easy. Moore didn't go against that force, but instead used it to his advantage and got closer to Ardis in one go. At the same time, from behind the shield. He tried to attack from Ardis's blind spot. I thought so. Ardis who had expected there will be something coming in advance easily released his grip on the shield without hesitation and retreated. This time, it's Moore's turn to pursue Ardis as he retreats. As if shoveling, 
Moore's attack came from below and aimed at Ardis's head, but Ardis deflected it easily by swinging his own sword downwards. The sword exchanges continued between the two who had stopped moving again. At first glance, the spectators probably wouldn't be able to determine who has the upper hand, but Moore who was already known for his swordsmanship in the first place might be seen advantageous. Ardis's true forte is swordsmanship imbued with mana. Needless to say, body strengthening, making footholds and jumping in the air limitlessly, and using flying swords enables more attacking methods for him. In that sense, Ardis not being able to use magic right now would certainly mean a disadvantage. Ardis's current swordsmanship is probably only 70% of what he can do when he can enhance himself with mana. But even without using mana, Ardis's swordsmanship that was trained through many battlefields is top notch. He can easily defend against Moore's sword and even counterattack. Rather, it's Moore who should be praised. Even if Ardis cannot fully unleash his true strength, the match had gone for longer than three minutes. Moore struggled against Nedulos in the other world but, it's not like his experience with the sword is a show. If he was born in the other world, no doubt he would have become a famous swordsman. But of course, that's only if he can survive. Ardises unintentionally spilled some words while crossing swords. What survive? It's nothing. Moore asked more clearly regarding Ardises' words that had no context. But Ardis just dismissed it along with a sword aiming for his leg. But Moore's sword would intercept and block its trajectory. As if dancing with blades, the two repeated movements of attacking, dodging, defending and counterattacking. The show of the two not willing to let even one step filled the arena with cheers. For a while now, Moore had been continuing hacking at Ardis without stopping. It meant that Moore's swordsmanship is just that good but, Moore also revealed that it isn't the only factor. By the way. Your original appearance is that right? Idle chattering while their swords didn't stop. Moore's words caused Ardis's A's to narrow. If you're different from your original appearance, a strong blow from Moore shook Ardis's sword slightly. There should be some misalignment between your body and your swordsmanship. It is a clever inference. Just as Moore said, Ardis's current body is much different in age than his originals. His stride, his arm length, his body weight and even the height of his vision. Ardis's swordsmanship that was tempered through the years was not with his current body as a baseline. The movements imprinted in his mind will cause a discomfort because of the incompatibility, and that would be a gap in a fight. But that's if there's a change to his body suddenly. I mean, I've been in this form for quite long already. Ardis had been in his younger form for quite a while already. It's not strange that he would be more used to it after more than seven years. Although there's still some slight discomfort. He didn't intend to let it be a flaw when he's fighting, and it hadn't affected any of his battles so far. Despite so, Moore still aimed for that insignificant disparity, of course with the ability to make it happen. With an angle and timing that Ardis considers obscene, Moore struck at a position where misalignment between his reach and viewpoint would likely happen. Sorry for fighting with handicap sand but, I can't see a way to win if not for this. Moore continued striking while aiming for the cracks where Ardis would even have the slightest discrepancy. I shall take this one. Don't worry, I don't think it is as a handicap. Why thank you. Moore swung hard at Ardis, holding Ardis's sword down. Ardis albeit slowly, his body is certainly growing, and he now looks like 16 or 17 on the outside. On one hand, there's the activeness of youth but it also can't be denied that he's lacking the drained body of battlefields like Moore's. Ardis normally would have been able to cover for it by using mana and raising his physical ability, but now that using magic is forbidden, his body is no more than a young swordsman's. Although he didn't intend to lose in swordsmanship, Moore certainly had the upper hand when comparing raw strength. Making use of the fact that Ardis's body is still not at its prime. Moore continued formulating attacks basing on that. I see why he can be a commander, as Ardis felt impressed at his strength. Ardis not being able to use mana is not a terrible inconvenience. If it's a match when they first met, Ardis would have probably easily won against Moore. However, among all participants of the Lotus Cup now, Moore is the one who understands Ardis's abilities the most. Exactly because that he has a good grasp of Ardis's strength that he wouldn't be taken by surprise. Exactly because that he knows Ardis's original appearance, he could come up with the idea of aiming at the disparity between Ardis's body and his swordsmanship. Those two are the advantage that Moore had that no other participants had. I have made my preparations. Of course, 
I will have some chance, just as I thought. Moore continued attacking utilizing the information he knows and the rule of the Lotus Cup as his backing against the difference in strength that would be hard to fill normally. Moore's sword style would be power if choosing from either power or flexibility. Of course. Ardis knows how to use a power sword style too. But his current body doesn't have enough arm strength to fully utilize it. If so, then Ardis's best bet is to retaliate with a flexible sword style. Ardis quickly gave up trying to fight back with strength, but to use speed and swordsmanship to counterattack. That would probably be the most intense and most beautiful counter that had happened so far in the Lotus Cup but that wouldn't continue for eternity as well. Ardis retreated five steps behind after deflecting away Moore's slash. Firming his grip and taking a small breath, he focused and dived deeper into his consciousness as he thought it is time to settle the match. Oi, why not take it easier? He must have realized Ardis's change in atmosphere. Moore tried to call out with an easygoing voice. It's a rare grand stage. It's wasteful to let it end just like that right? There are not many chances to be fighting under so many cheers and gazes, you know. Moore tried to prolong the match by convincing Ardis. I won't fall for that. But Ardis wouldn't fall for it. It's obvious huh? Moore clicked his tongue having his intentions seen through. Now that Ardis cannot use mana. It's not just arm strength that Moore has an upper hand in, stamina would be the same. It's easy to imagine that the longer the match, the more advantageous Moore would become. But of course, even if Moore becomes more advantageous, the chances of winning only increases ever so slightly. But, Ardis sent his praise inwardly to Moore who stuck to it even though it is such a slim chance. That's exactly why. Closing the distance in a blink of an eye, Ardis swung his sword from the side aiming for Moore's thigh. Moore who barely managed to react to it slipped a shield between the sword and his leg. A dull sound rang as the sword was blocked. That's quick. Not giving a chance to Moore who was complaining to counterattack, Ardis already moved on to his next move. Weaving below his own sword by ducking, Ardis spun a half revolution clockwise and got through Moore. In the midst of that, Ardis incorporated another attack at Moore's left shoulder in a spinning motion. You. Moore who had barely managed to avoid Ardis's ever-changing sword had his stance crumbled. On the other hand, Ardis already went to his next move. After aiming for Moore's shoulder, Ardis had already gotten a position diagonally behind Moore on the left. On top of that, as Moore was still facing forward, it can be said that Ardis had taken his back completely. She, Moore's panic in his face manifested in words as well. He must have realized that he wouldn't make it in time even if he turned around. He tossed himself wholeheartedly forwards while his back still facing Ardis. Exactly like diving, Moore tried to get away from Ardis at all cost but, of course that wasn't allowed easily. Ardis pursued not letting the chance slip. Ardis has his own share of agility even without physical strengthening with mana. On the other hand, it doesn't seem like Moore's thoughts caught up with the sudden development. Rather than logic. He must have thrown himself forwards as a warrior's instinct to save himself. But the thoughts behind that movement is so simple that it's impossible to shake off Ardis. It's the end. Way I, Sto. Disregarding Moore's panic cries, Ardis' sword approached. Managing to turn around halfway, Moore's sword that was trying to deflect it hit nothing. Ardis easily weaved through the uncertain parry and stopped his momentum just as his sword approached before lightly hitting more in the neck. You. That would be a vital wound in an actual fight. Even if it's a dulled blade, if Ardis swung at his full power, even more wouldn't get by unscathed. That's it. Match. The judge's voice that had announced the end of the match reverberated in the arena. The moment when Ardis's victory was evident in everyone's eyes. The entire spectating area was filled with cheers. Chapter 184 Chapter 184 I thought I had some chance there though. After the match is over, Moore complained while walking beside Ardis on the way out of the arena. I even had a bunch of conditions that favors me. It's so depressing. Unlike his words, Moore didn't look bothered at all. Of course, he would still have the taste of defeat but... It's not like he has any regrets having gave his all. I have my share of experience fighting with monstrosities for 20 years behind me. There's no way I will go down easily. Rather rare for Ardis who is usually uncaring towards his opponent, he consoled more in his own way. That's also because that he recognizes Moore's abilities. For you to say monstrosities, I can't fathom it. Well, 
I guess it must not be that rare considering it's a world with stupid strong demonic beings here and there. Moore must have recalled the Nebulos and also the water demonic being in the other world. Moore looked exasperated as his shoulders dropped. It's not like he's weak. In this world standard, even among elite swordsmen, Moore can be considered better than them. As far as Ardis knows, people that can match Moore's strength is at most near, Ted of Bright Stars of White Knight, and the escort of Marieda. Nicole. There's just a fundamental difference in living conditions between the two worlds. For anyone from the other world, even if they're not warriors but merchants, they could probably make a name for themselves as warriors in this world. That's why Ardis in his own way tried to cheer up more. If you were born in the same world as me, then I bet you can become even stronger than me. It's just the difference in raising environment. I'm sure the Duke was impressed with your performance too. There's no need to be dwelling over the match. Now you just have to sit back and watch the rest. It's going to be exterminating program later after all. The semi-finals and finals. Moore looked strangely at Ardis who made a metaphor like that against elites participating in the Lotus Cup. But in reality, Moore's match with Ardis's match was more or less like the finals of the Lotus Cup. I didn't think you were a person like that. Really? I mean, I'm good towards my friends. Yes yes. I pray I will never become your enemy. Together with Moore who shrugged, Ardis left the arena. At the nobles' seatings, there was a man sitting on a luxurious chair glaring at the arena without moving. Displeasure was apparent on his face, the dangerous feeling emitting from his expression was increasing. He's the authority in the army, the organizer of the Lotus Cup, Marquis Holgan himself. Was it not to your likings? Master? There was a white-haired old man behind asked. It's obvious that he's a noble's servant with his appearance, didn't the plan went perfectly? He's someone who had supported the Marquis for more than forty years, he's one of the few people who knew all about his master, even his surface and underside. He also knew that Marquis Holgan had manipulated the match-up in the back to make the two participating under Duke Nyrestia's name to clash, but even though one of them were eliminated just as planned, he thought it was strange that the Marquis still seemed displeased, just as planned. Yes, that's right. The plan of making either one of them entering under the Duke drop out went well. But, what is it? The old man asked about his master's annoyance. What do you think about that fight? Let me see. I can only give amateur comments but, it wasn't a pretty fight. That's right. It wasn't an elegant fight to show. Although he agreed with the old servant, his voice still seemed displeased. The Marquis spoke again after a short while of silence. But they were strong. The words were filled with irritation. Certainly, they have the constitution to have the Duke's backing, but are they really significant to worry about? You might not know it but, that's dangerous. Although I heard about more Greystar's strength, I didn't think it was to this degree. He might have even gotten to the finals. In that sense, it was fortunate to have him eliminated. But the problem now is the countless sword sorcerer that advanced. In a martial arts tournament where magic is forbidden, even though his showing in the previous battles, I was looking down on him being a magician but that guy is dangerous. Repeating the same thing, the Marquis emphasized the danger. Is it to that degree? Already reaching his middle years, the Marquis hadn't been on a war for a while already but, he had experience taking command of soldiers during his young days against the Empire. Although the Marquis isn't someone very proficient with martial arts, as a commander, after retiring from the front line, he was still able to see many strong warriors in the army. If that Marquis had emphasized his appraisal on that magician, then no doubt the young magician is more of a threat than he imagined. Yeah. There were sometimes overwhelmingly strong warriors that would sweep through the battlefield like Azuras. He's the same category as those. I don't think even Cameron can stand a chance. What? The magician will win against Cameron, the champion candidate for the Lotus Cup this year. The deputy leader of the 3rd Army Division, the one known as the strongest in Marquis Holgin's faction, the old servant was surprised hearing that. Bad. It's really bad. The Marquis looked really anxious. Even though it's a precious time when my daughter is a candidate for the next Empress, I can't afford to show an embarrassing side to His Majesty and His Highness. The reason why Marquis Holgan exerts powerful influence in the army is mostly thanks to many strong soldiers taking his side. It's thanks to them monopolizing the stage known as the Lotus Cup and winning every year. But if the champion is an outsider mercenary, and on top of that, a magician, 
his reputation would become nothing. It's nothing better than a nightmare for him. Then in order to quell this nightmare, the Marquis must make his move. Isn't there no other choice but to make him retire from the finals? The old servant seeing his master's intentions voiced out. That's right, we will have him retire. But he's strong, any sub per people wouldn't cut it. Yes, I shall arrange elites. I don't mind it even if it's forceful. I will do something about silencing the incident. Don't cheap out on money either. Get both quality and quantity. Don't ever make a move unless both is gathered. Acknowledged. The old servant bowed respectfully, and left the spot, letting another servant take his space. The nobles seatings a few blocks from Marquis Holgins. Duke Nyrestia who was spectating the fight between Ardis and Moore together with his daughter, Minerva sighed deeply, as expected from them. The duke spoke with his daughter who was watching the match while holding her fist tight the entire time. Yes, their swordsmanship were both excellent. The young noble lady's words were filled with respects towards the two. It is clear the cheerful face is her genuine feelings without a shard of lie. Although his loss, Morkun's sword was brilliant too. He might have even made it to the finals if it's the initial match-up. Seriously, that Marquis Holgan would only do unnecessary things. Taking a breather there. The duke took up a wine glass and wet his throat, but I must say, Ardis Kun's sword was even better, although having seen it previously, his swordsmanship is really wasteful considering he's a magician. Of course, in front of Shizu's swordsmanship, there's no equal. Minerva seemed proud about it like gloating over her own achievements. Sword magic lies on the path of the sword. NN, what's that? The duke asked after hearing a line from nowhere from his daughter. It's what Shizu said before. Sword magic is just one of many sword techniques. It's nothing more or less than swordsmanship at its core. To enhance and support the existing swordsmanship is what sword magic is essentially. I see. In other words, excellent sword magic will need excellent swordsmanship. Huh. Yes. Witnessing Shizu's performance, I'm only now understanding it. Minerva now understood well why the first thing Ardis wanted her to learn is swordsmanship despite she wanted to learn sword magic. Ardis was a swordsman in the beginning, and still a swordsman now. Even when transported in the other world or even in the Lotus Cup, Ardis had not used once his sword magic. It's probably because that his strength at its core isn't from sword magic but from swordsmanship. Refine your swordsmanship. Sharpen your sword techniques, sword magic is nothing more than a part of the two concepts. Minerva finally realized that learning sword magic from the start is impossible. Ardis will probably still instruct Minerva on swordsmanship in the future. And amidst that, there will surely come a time he will impart one of the many sword techniques, sword magic to her. That's why the first milestone is becoming an excellent swordsman. Setting a goal for herself. Minerva's determination was heard in her mutter. Chapter 185 Chapter 185 The night spreads in the sky, less a pedestrian can be seen walking down the streets. Excluding a certain corner of the entertainment district, all parts of the town are shrouded in silence. The moonlight that shone through the clouds periodically illuminated the two. Oh, look at the time. Whose fault is it? Whose? Ardis stared into his golden partner who muttered while looking up at the sky. But I mean, it's too good of a chance to let up. Even so, that didn't mean you have to sweep one end to the other. The third day of the Lotus Cup. Although more lost to Ardis in the quarterfinals himself, his performance was more than acknowledged by the Duke. And since there was soon to be an empty position in the Duke residency, as the guard captain was about to retire due to his old age, the Duke extended an offer to Moore, and Moore who didn't yet have concrete direction accepted it. After that, a party of more getting appointed as the guard captain and Ardis winning is held in the duke's residency, and of course, Ardis as one of the main characters had to participate as well. Although they couldn't return to the forest by the day is still out, if it's just a dinner, then it wouldn't be so late. It's easy to imagine they can make it in time before the city gates closes. And Rona who had been on standby napping in the training grounds of the duke's residency during the match in the day was allowed into the party venue thanks to Minerva and taking that as an approval, Rona completely discarded the concept of self-restraint and threw himself into the pile of food. As he leveled one table after another, the duke who thought it was interesting ordered the cooks to bring more, and then it became a show of Rona continuing to stuff the dishes that came out of the kitchen continuously until all of their ingredients ran out, and it was already too late in the night by the time they realized. Thanks to you doing that. 
We're totally late in schedule. It wasn't even all. Look, I even brought out the fruits and confectionaries out as takeaways like this. Rona who counter-argued with Ardis showed the contents of the bag hanging from his neck. The bag was filled with baked confectionaries and sweet fruits. You're still intending to eat more after that? It's a souvenir, a souvenir. Don't you think Philia and Rihanna will be happy? Ardis sighed deeply, and reminded his partner. Don't only bring them sweet food. It'll be a bad habit for them, it's alright. After all, only one tenth of these are for them, the rest? Of course for me, oi. Ardis didn't understand what was Rona's point for arguing that it's a souvenir anymore. Even as he looked towards Rona with an exasperated face, the partner in question only hummed with happy strides and changed the topic. Wouldn't the inn already closed by now? It's bad to wake the innkeeper up now after all. But then again, the gates are already closed. No choice. Let's climb the city walls somewhere secluded. Ardis and Rona left the main street. Walking down the street where there were no foot traffics, they arrived at some residency blocks where it's totally silent. The surrounding atmosphere suddenly became strained, and Rona called out to Ardis to catch his attention. Al, I know. Although walking as if nothing was happening, Ardis's consciousness was sharpened. Of course, without Rona saying, he could feel the presences surrounding them. That's quite a lot. The responses he got with mana detection was a lot. Surrounding Ardis and Rona in all directions, they were slowly inching closer. They must be really unwilling to let Al show up in the semi-finals. As for who, Rona didn't clearly say it. After slowly walking while leading the bunch of pursuers, Ardis and Rona stopped at a place that's obscure enough. Judging that they will definitely come attack, Ardis drew the skies of myriad colors from his waist. At the same time, as if on a signal, all of them rapidly enclosed. From the shadows of buildings, above the roof, from the other side of the street, more than thirty people appeared with weapons in their hand, charged at Ardis and Rona full of killing intent. What? They're all second rates. Rona muttered as if lost his interest. After all, assassins that couldn't even hold back their killing intent aren't foes to be reckoned with. They're probably intending to overpower with numbers. Ardis replied with a slight contempt. Certainly. If there were enough numbers despite second rates, the opposing side wouldn't get by unscathed. Even if it's against a veteran mercenary, five or six should be more than enough to finish the job. But then again, that only works against normal veterans. Have they known in advance the name of the one they're trying to go against? The feats unbounded by common sense accomplished by that person. I leave my back to you. You, P, delegating each other's roles. Ardis took skies of myriad colors in his hands and faced against the assailants ahead. Easily dodging the blade that came his way and a stroke from his sword. Seeing the first one fall over in the corner of his vision from a grave wound, he directed his sword towards those in the back. The assailants that panically tried to take distance was suddenly met with another sword from the side. When did the assailant with a surprised expression found a white blade in a shape through his neck. Even though another tried to take distance, there was another yellowish-green blade that stabbed through him. Ephraim were easily losing both of their comrades. One of the assailant looked around in panic. And what he saw were twelve flying swords shimmering in the darkness. Of course, Ardis had not brought all twelve swords on him. Ardis used to carry three swords on him before but, the current Ardis only have skies of myriad colors on him. Using a special technique, Ardis had managed to draw out twelve flying swords. Of course. There's no way the assailants would know, they would only realize the swords came from nowhere. The blades reflecting the dim moonlight found themselves in the assailants' vital spots. Thirty is too less. Ardis manipulated the flying swords while giving a taunting comment, the swords aimed for the assailants like invisible hands. Wah, Fizga, F fast. You are. They're not flying with just a straight path. Sometimes hacking, sometimes bashing, sometimes piercing and sometimes slashing. The lump of steel known as a sword moved like it has a will of an elite swordsman, mixed with feints. They aren't easily handled by the opponents. Flying swords that can race through the air, in front of the assailants that had never experienced going against them, their lives easily were robbed. Only one minute had passed since. A corner of the street were painted with the blood of the assailants. My side here is done already. Rona approached while saying after cleaning up the assailants behind them. Looks like you're used to opening gates too. Yeah, thanks to that I can go without carrying swords. The flying swords that returned by Ardis's side as if sucked into a thin opening in the air 
disappeared from there. The Twelve Swords served their role and disappeared without leaving a trace. Though it's so small only swords can fit through. Ardis's voice was filled with irritation. Won't that solve itself with time? Once you get a hang on it, then making it bigger wouldn't be a problem. And being able to store swords on the other side is quite beneficial now already right? Thanks to that, cleaning up a bunch of them is faster too, huh? There's still one remaining. Without Rona pointing it out. Ardis can already notice the presence. About 30 meters away, there was another mana signature about a human size hidden. I will be right back. Replying shortly, Ardis moved in swiftly to catch up to the last remaining person. Although it wasn't a strong mana signature, sneaking around at a time like this, it can't be a normal citizen. Seems like it had noticed Ardis's movements too. The target quickly retreated, as if you can run. But it is already too late. If he wanted to escape from Ardis's pursue, he should have escaped when Ardis was occupied with fighting. Even if he tried to run now, Ardis can easily sense his location with mana detection, and shaking off Ardis that can make footholds in the air is impossible. Ardis chased after the shadow in the alley who tried to disperse his tracks, predicting his course. Ardis descended from the night sky right in front of the shadow. Higher. He must have not think that Ardis would circle to his front. A surprised cry was heard from the shadow. Seeing that figure, Ardis's skies of myriad colors that was in a trajectory stopped in place. Who are you? Ardis's confusion was natural. The person he thought would be in a same dress up as the assailants was actually a young girl dressed up in a normal town folks outfit. Chapter 186 Chapter 186 The medium short hair that had a brown color blended in with the night. The brown pupils were looking at Ardis with surprise and guard. Although she was wearing a common outfit in the capital. Her appearance looked too dirty, giving a wilting impression. Her outfit looks like a normal town girl, but even if she looked like that, Ardis won't easily let his guard down. It's easy to imagine questionable people disguising as normal town folk, and in the first place, no normal town girl would be walking alone in the night here. He can easily tell that the girl in front of him wasn't any normal person. Who are you? The blade of skies of myriad colors was directed right at the girl's throat as he interrogated but not even showing any fear, her eyes were looking at Ardis's without wavering. That itself was the proof that the girl wasn't any normal town folk. After all, rather than screaming for help when a blade was aiming at her neck, her gaze was instead sharp and looking for gaps to escape. It's obvious that she's trained in some way, but on the other hand, the girl's physique confused Ardis the most. What's up Ardis? Haven't done yet? His golden partner glimmering in the moonlight had caught up from behind. Greeting Ardis as he approached, he looked at the person on the end of the sword and asked rudely. Who's this stick figure? Exactly, Ardis's confusion was because the girl's body was too skinny to the point that she looked like she had some disease. Of course. There are individual differences in physique regardless of gender. There are skinnier people from poorer family, and chubby people from blessed family. But the girl in front of him was slim to the point that she looked like she would fall over at any time. The outlines of her elbow joints could be easily seen, and her ankle peeking out from the hem of the skirt was also excessively thin. And she had been swaying from time to time already, it's obvious that she hadn't lived well. And above all, with that thin physique, even if she wore like a town girl, she would still stand out. Even if it was to blend in, that itself had made it worthless. It was because of that discrepancy that Ardis was terribly confused. No idea. Ardis replied shortly with exactly how he felt to Rona. Neither Ardis nor Rona spoke for a while, and a period of silence flowed for a while. As the silence continued, the girl swayed for two more times. You, are you with the guys that came at us just now? Ardis asked again while his sword was still forward. The girl, while silent shook her head a little. Where are you from? Who employed you? But it seems like she doesn't intend to answer any of that. The silent period continued. Aiming for us? The girl again shook her head. Since she had no killing intent at all, Ardis could tell that it wasn't a lie. Then surveillance, huh? Another silence. But as Ardis tried to peer deeper, an out-of-place noise was heard. It was the noise of a stomach rumbling. And the source is the girl. The sound reverberated needlessly loud in the silent alley of the night. Everyone there became speechless. On one hand, there's Ardis and Rona looking at each other with a strange expression, and on another hand, there's the girl with a composed face despite it was so loud. The strained atmosphere lost its strain, and the meaning behind the silence changed slowly. Then as if losing his motivation, Ardis sighed and sheathed his sword, 
Then Rona asked from the side, Is that fine? Well, she doesn't look hostile. With various meaning imbued, Ardis answered Rona's question. If Ardis says so, Ardis gestured Rona who seemed like he didn't care either way to come closer. Rona, NN, what? Approaching closer without a doubt, Ardis saw a moment and swiftly stuck his hand into the bag on Rona's neck, and without any hesitation pulled out several of the baked confectionery and fruits. Ah, Al. That's my snack. You ate your fill already right? Leaving aside Rona who was complaining, Ardis offered the bunch to the girl. Here, take it. The girl who although still remained silent, her face was spelling out what the heck are you saying? You're hungry right? Despite these, it can fill your hunger for a little. Just take it. It was now the girl's turn to be confused. I don't know who's the one hiring you but, you should get away from someone who can't even feed you. Though it might be my unnecessary meddling. Stuffing the food into the girl's hand forcefully, Ardis warned her as well. I will say this first, there won't be any mercy if you're coming at us like those guys just now. I don't care if you're just following around, but know that I won't spare any sympathy if you're hostile. Remember that. Leaving aside the girl who stood there, Ardis turned around to the direction of the city walls, and Rona panically followed after. Looking back and forth towards Ardis beside him and the girl behind, she might be an enemy. Is there a need to do that? Rona asked as if not able to comprehend Ardis's action. Why not might as well deal with her? She wasn't hostile though, but isn't it annoying? Even without hostility, she's still an enemy right? Certainly, it will be annoying, but it's not like we can just go and clean all of them up right? And her employer might not be an enemy. There's a possibility she's watching us under the Duke's orders. Ardis argued with a reasoning that he didn't believe himself. Isn't it impossible for the Duke to hire someone like that? She's stumbling all around. She wouldn't be able to do anything when it's necessary like that. Even if it isn't the Duke, there won't be an end if we gone for all of them just because they're monitoring. Well, certainly there are a lot of eyes on us, rather on Al whenever we come to the capital. And since they're clashing into each other sometimes, their employer must not be the same person. Well, that much people with interest in Al just mean that Al is becoming popular. Yo. Celebrity. Don't tease me like that. Ardis and Rona who had arrived in a corner of the capital verified that there aren't any presences nearby before leaping over the city walls. Although it is a wall about 10 meters in height, it's not even an obstacle for Ardis and Rona. Ardis who had landed outside the capital walked towards a direction where the light from the gates wouldn't reach. Regardless of who it is, we will just deal with them when they come attack. But I don't have any intentions of picking a fight with someone I don't even know is a friend or a foe. Also, Ardis's words cut off. The girl just now wasn't that much different in age than the twins or Minerva, and such a girl was risking her life to earn. Despite so, seeing her thin body that was a proof that she couldn't even eat well, Ardis's heart felt a little pain. There were probably many children that have to sully their own hands in order to live and eat. It might not be far-fetched to say that the children had no choice but to sully their own hands. Ardis isn't a saint, nor a king with indomitable political power, nor a god. He's unable to smash all misfortunes and absurdities, nor did he have the sense of justice to do that. But he thought that he would protect those that are in reach, and save those that he can. He knew that it is hypocrisy. The reach of his hand is limited. The people he can save is only a small portion, and for the current Ardis, the twins, Philly and Adriana are his most priority. Ardis recalled the time when he first met them. The two at first was on guard against everything, and not even able to have a meal properly because of that. The twins that time and the girl just now. For some reason their images overlapped in Ardis's eyes. He understood that it's a cheap sentiment. But he can't help that he can see them overlapping. Since Ardis judged that the girl wasn't hostile, he reached his hand out on a whim. Although late, Ardis regretted. He should have left that without saying anything. Even if she's not hostile towards Ardis now, that girl was only someone being used, and a disposable one to boot. She would probably come at Ardis if it's an order from her employer without hesitation. It might even be tomorrow that he would cut that thin body in two. Ardis regretted sympathizing against someone like that on a whim. Also, no, it's nothing. Replying vaguely towards Rona who asked. Ardis stopped talking. To not have the girl's employer change his mind and aim for Ardis's life, Ardis prayed inwardly. Really? Leaving Rona who asked despite so in silence, Ardis walked towards the forest. Al had become quite soft now huh? Well, it might be a good thing, I think. Hearing the soft muttering from behind, 
Ardis pretended to not hear it as he continued walking in silence. Chapter 187 Chapter 187 Two days remain for the Lotus Cup. Only four among 32 initial participants were still on the stage, and of course, among them was a mercenary, Ardis. Naturally, the organizer, Marquis Holgen wasn't pleased with that. Thanks to that, Ardis was faced with assailants last night. Anyways, I don't think that'll be the end of it. The last two days, don't let your guard down. After telling more about what happened yesterday, he warned Ardis, Ardis didn't think it'll end like that either. After all, the surrounding gazes were incomparably more than yesterday, and there were certainly people watching him in the dark. In any case, unlike the dark streets in the night, there were many eyes in the arena. Ardis wouldn't expect anything to happen. After all, they couldn't be planning to do something in broad daylight with so many audiences. But as a consequence, all Ardis was experiencing were only annoying harassment. Something like his chair was missing, the meal prepared for him had strange smell, and only Ardis was subjected to a long lecture about strangely detailed precautions. If only they would make my life easier and just do it more properly. Although he could easily fend them off if they actually attacked him, Ardis couldn't do much about the strange harassment. Despite each of them individually trivial, there's still an annoyance when piled up. What a bad personality. Of course, it was needless to say who was the one who gave the orders. But well, even if they do pranks all day, what I'm doing isn't going to change. The person in charge of carrying the rack of weapons strangely dripped on nothing. Many sharp bladed weapons were thrown at Ardis's way as the rack overturned, but Ardis easily avoided all of them without sparing a glance as he continued down the corridor to the arena. Among four that remains in the semi-finals, three of them are affiliated with the army. Ardis being the only outsider certainly was standing out. Although it might be an exciting development to see an outsider advancing in the Lotus Cup for the spectators, the army itself, rather Marquis Holgen wasn't at all fond of it. Of course. The opponent Ardis is going to fight next is from the army. Certainly it was the captain of the assault platoon or something. Ardis recalled what he heard from Moore. Apparently his personality is lively and fearless. Uncontrollable wild animal. It's a very straightforward personality that would not stop until all his foes is annihilated. Choosing the same sword as usual, after getting used to it with a few test swing, Ardis looked at the person in question. Though he looks different than what I heard. According to what he'd heard prior. Ardis expected him to be a muscular and tough-looking guy, something along the lines of Ted, the leader of Bright Stars of White Knight, but his opponent in the middle of the arena didn't suit the descriptor he heard at all. Rather, his surrounding atmosphere was calm like a farmer rearing sheep. Either way, there's no judging a book by its cover. Only bad outcomes await if he would get deceived by someone's appearance. He had seen many scenarios of it and Ardis himself failed many times during his younger days because of that too. And in reality, his opponent was holding a halberd, a weapon that required the most strength to swing. The weapon that is the shape of an axe and spear combined, the blade shaping like an axe, and the back having two sharp points, a total of three damaging points are on that. Because of that, it's possible to perform many forms of attack but, on the other hand, it just meant that it's difficult to use it at its fullest potential. If he chose something like that, he must have the confidence to use it in an actual fight. There are magnificent muscles without unneeded fat on his thin body. He's not an opponent to be underestimated. Why are you so slow? Come out already. An angry yell from the judge interrupted his thoughts. The judge that was waiting together with his opponent on the arena was looking at Ardis hostilely. It seems like it's a different person than the judge yesterday. Ardis frowned a little as he continued to the middle. My goodness, this is why mercenaries are so. The judge grumbled without hiding even one bit of his displeasure. It's not words and behavior a fair judge should express even if they thought so inwardly. At the very least, the previous judge didn't seem to be displeased with Ardis and his judging was fair too. But it's not going that way this time huh? In the first place, Ardis is a nice or for Marquis Holgen, enough for him to send out assassins for Ardis. Though, it's not like there's any proof that the assassins yesterday were sent by Marquis Holgen, but at present time, the Marquis must be the person who hates him the most. And someone like him sending out a new judge isn't unexpected at all. Listen here, no magic is allowed. Do you understand? Using magic means disqualification instantly. Even as he narrated the rules, 
the judge were mostly directing them towards Ardis with scorn. Ardis definitely wouldn't expect a fair judgment from this judge. On the other hand, the opponent was looking at Ardis without any shred of intimidation. Ardis couldn't see any scorn or laughing behind those eyes. Although the opponent this time is a tough nut to crack, he's still Marquis Holgan's man. What Ardis would do hasn't changed. Begin. Then the start of the match. In that instant, his opponent's face totally changed. Uh, 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 the expression like a meek sheep just now suddenly vanished, replaced with an intimidating face. The distance of five steps behind each. A total of ten steps between them were closed in rapidly. He's fast. The same time as his surprise, his bodily reflex moved him in action to block the incoming attack. Ardis's sword intercepted the halberd in hopes of changing its trajectory. Just before his sword managed to reach the halberd moving quickly, it suddenly showed a strange movement. His opponent's wrist twisted, and responding to that, the halberd turned and the two sharp tips switched place with the blade. The curve of the two tips were like ice picks, although blunted, they are still considerably narrow. And naturally, all the force behind the weight of the halberd and the swing would be focused in that one point. And its target, is the sword that Ardis held, right up at the center. What Ardis was holding in his hand was just a common sword unlike skies of myriad colors. Even a heavy iron made blade probably wouldn't withstand one strike from that. Even though their weapons are made from the same materials. The weights are too different. His attack that was aided with centrifugal force would utterly shatter Ardis's sword if it hit square on. From the beginning, Ardis was surprised at his opponent aiming for his weapon without any precursor. Although Ardis knew he was going to stab, Ardis couldn't tell he was aiming for the sword. Leaving aside if there's a large gap in strength between them or the quality of their weapons, doing that as the opening act is too reckless. After all, breaking a sword would need his full strength and to do that would mean a wide swing with his entire body. Although it'll be fine if it succeeded, failure would mean leaving a significant gap for the opponent. And presently, Ardis's opponent was right in the motion of a full swing. It didn't seem like he was even thinking Ardis would dodge. Don't look down on me. It might have made the match if it's against others. Despite being caught off guard by his intentions, Ardis is still a swordsman that had stood in many battlefields. He can handle this much. Ardis parallelized his sword with the trajectory of the halberd, softening its blow before retreating. New Yuya, pursuing him, his opponent pulled up the halberd at the end of its course forcefully, correcting its trajectory. What recklessness. That action that would definitely strain the muscles of his arm made Ardis feel tingle in his back. Ardis immediately kicked against the ground to take more distance. The halberd of his opponent ran through the spot where its target was at. Taking a distance and then a breather, Ardis who expected his opponent to do the same instead had his expectation shattered as his opponent stepped in again. Raya. He was akin to a hungered wild beast. Before the match started, the calm face was the intimidation towards Ardis, and the eyes that were calm as the waveless ocean were the joys of finding a new prey. So you're that type huh? He's someone who would show his true colors fighting. What he heard from Moore must be referring to this. If so, Ardis gave up retreating. After all, this kind of opponents have nothing on their mind but pushing through with brute force. He would only fall to his opponent's pace if he continued to retreat. Ardis closed in with his turn to attack. Since his opponent's Mai is wider, Ardis fighting at range is a disadvantage. TL, Mai, or interval, is the engagement distance, effective range. While slashing, Ardis advanced another step. He's now at a distance swinging a halberd is difficult, a sword's Mai. A normal opponent would probably try to retreat now. But the assault platoon commander wouldn't. Rather. He would challenge himself and participate in the exchange. The reason behind that is probably with his weapon. His halberd has a shorter handle than a normal one, it's probably shortened to ease handling it. On the other end, the blade was made bigger, and heavier than a normal one. A fight where he considers reach and distance was not in his eyes in the first place. The second, and the third clash between their weapons. Even as that continued, the assault platoon commander would continue his onslaught pressuring Ardis. That's probably his way of fighting. Knowing how his opponent fights would ease Ardis's judgment. Ardis's experience shaking hands with a death god many times in battlefields are not for show. There were three approaches for his current situation. The first approach would be waiting for a gap and counter-attack as he deflects blows, 
or luring him to a physical trap while avoiding his attack would be the textbook solutions. But his reason in the Lotus Cup was none other than crushing Marquis Holgin's face, and his current opponent is an officer of the target's faction. Then what he can do narrows down to one to beat him head on. It was the third approach to properly show to the audience the patheticness of his opponent collapsing after being exhausted. Chapter 188 Chapter 188 Ardis welcomed the lightning-sharp halberd from the captain of the assault platoon from the front. Impressive, but, Ardis stepped forward and used his own sword to deflect the trajectory. Diving straight into his bosom after seeing a gap, Ardis delivered a gut punch into his armorless abdomen. Leaving aside if he was wearing a full-plated armor, the assault platoon captain was wearing leather armor that emphasized mobility, but left many places unguarded. Yuga. A short cry of pain was heard from the platoon captain. You have too many gaps. Ardis's right foot stepped past the gap between his legs, and immediately pulled back. His heel was going to hit the calf on its way out. Ardis tried to make him fall over but, as expected from someone in the semi-finals, such an easy trick wouldn't work. Ra. The platoon captain leans forward and kicked against the ground before Ardis managed to swipe his feet, passing through Ardis. Sha. With only his upper body twisting, he swung his halberd aided with centrifugal force, aiming for Ardis's back. Again with the recklessness, Ardis easily avoided by going further past the direction where the platoon captain turned. A dull sound of air being ripped apart can be heard behind him. It's obvious how much force was behind the halberd. After readjusting their position for a few steps, Ardis's opponent. The platoon captain finally spoke like a human for the first time. Ha, ka, ha. Not bad, brat. His face was full of joy, it's like he's a completely different person than the one before the match started. Who's the brat, Greenhorn? Ardis reflexively retorted after having called a brat. The platoon captain looks to be over 30 in age, and Ardis who in comparison looks below 20s is certainly the younger one here. But of course that's only if considering their appearance, after all, Ardis himself had lived much longer. Although some might catch on to something with what Ardis said, but it seems like the platoon captain wasn't a person to hear for little details. Ha, ha ha. Being feisty is good too. He was totally wearing a joyous face as he slashed at Ardis. Thanks for that, Ardis replied without a shred of appreciation. At the same time, the two sides kicked against the ground. Within a blink of an eye, the two's weapon clashed. Ardis is at a disadvantage clashing frontally. In terms of physique, strength, weight of their weapons, all of them are in favor for the platoon captain. Despite so, Ardis is not intending to let it be his downfall. There are countless ways to win without a frontal strength contest. Oria, along with a war cry, the platoon captain swung down the halberd overhead. Ardis could easily predict its trajectory and dodged it nimbly, although he could dodge it by a hair breadth. Seeing from how his opponent fought for the last few exchanges, Ardis knew that he could forcefully twist his weapon unreasonably. The more exaggerated his evasion maneuver is, the less chance he would have to counterattack. But Ardis didn't think it was a big problem. The platoon captain's fighting style that can be said uncontrollable has too many gaps to aim for even if Ardis isn't looking. Certainly his offense is very intense, but his defense are too clumsy to even call it a defense. If he's up against someone weaker than him, or equivalent, that might have worked but unfortunately it isn't such a situation now. There, aiming for the gap that manifested between his attacks, Ardis swung down at the halberd hard. Utilizing the weight of the halberd, Ardis caused the weapon to slip out of his hands. The halberd that escaped from his hands easily spun several times before hitting the ground, even though blunted, it was a heavy weapon hitting the ground with considerable force. Making a heavy sound, the halberd stuck itself into the ground. According to the rules of the Lotus Cup, a participant losing their weapon would mean defeat instantly, and of course, since the platoon captain only has one weapon, the halberd with him. It'll be Ardis's win if the halberd escaped from his hands. With loud cheering from the spectators, many spectators standing up, Ardis who wanted to lower his sword suddenly sensed the killing intent and took up a stance again. Oroa, the platoon captain that should have lost just now picked up his halberd and rushed at Ardis. That expression didn't change one bit from before, it's still one that's enjoying the fight. It didn't look like someone asking for a handshake after the match to Ardis in any way. Oi. Hold up. Ardis tried to call out to stop him even when he was forced to continue the fight. Seemingly not lending an ear to what Ardis said, 
as if drown in the fight. The platoon captain continued swinging his halberd with no degradation in his speed continuously. Judge, how's this going to be? And as usual going all offense with no regards to defense, Ardis complained to the judge but. The judge gave no bother. TCH, it comes to that huh? It seems like this judge doesn't see it as a loss even if his opponent lost his weapon. But of course, that only applies to the platoon captain. It's easy to imagine that he would announce Ardis' loss if Ardis lost his weapon. It's unknown whether Ardis' opponent is continuing to fight despite knowing that. But seeing his face and his conduct so far, Ardis thought that he only wants to fight. Although he felt it before the match started, it seems like the judge is evidently holding a grudge against Ardis somehow. Even though Ardis expected that the judging would not be in his favor. He was surprised to see that it was to this degree that it can be said cheating. Ardis's sword once again caught on the halberd, and lobbed it off the platoon captain's hands. But the announcement never did come. The platoon captain picked it back up as if nothing happened, and continued to slash at Ardis. I wonder what kind of excuse are you going to make? As expected, seeing the weapon drop for the second time, even the spectators could tell something was wrong. The first time had already resulted in disturbance. But seeing the second time, the spectators could tell what the judge's intention was, as they cursed at him. The match is already over. What the heck is that judge looking at? He's cheating. But the judge didn't bat an eye even when the spectators were hurling curses. Rather than being resolute for getting showered with angry voices, the judge had probably gotten an order from the beginning, and he must have understood well that this would happen. Ardis smacked down the halberd into the ground a third time and the platoon captain similarly picked it up for the third time, as the booing from the audience became more intense. There's no need to ask who sent the judge. But it's obvious that the aftermath is hard to clean up. Ardis could never begin to understand what Marquis Holgen was thinking. Was he that desperate? While dodging the attacks from the platoon captain, Ardis muttered, Well, the thinking can be later. The problem at hand is to clear the current situation. Even if the platoon captain won in this match, it was obvious that he cheated. The spectators wouldn't be convinced, and the one to blame would be the organizer, the army, and lastly Marquis Holgen would definitely get caught in the fire. Crushing the Marquis's reputation would have probably been fulfilled at this point of time. Despite so, Ardis didn't plan to pull back now. And of course he didn't have any intentions to lose. Ardis recalled the four winning conditions stated in the rules, a hit that would be counted as vital. It's not hard for Ardis to do that, but even if he did that, it wouldn't count if the judge doesn't acknowledge it. And seeing how the judge favors the platoon captain so much, Ardis knew that it wouldn't be counted in any case. The other way is to knock his weapon away, the method that would be the most apparent even to the audience. But presently, the platoon captain had lost his weapon for a total of three times, yet the judge showed no signs of announcing Ardis's victory. If he could have won in that way, he would have won a long time ago. Another is to make the opponent give up. However, his opponent would even pick back up the weapon that was dropped and continue fighting. Rather than him being consciously doing it, it's more like he had totally forgotten about the Lotus Cup while too caught up in fighting. So it's likely that his opponent wouldn't give up. Then the last choice would be incapacitating his opponent. As expected, if his opponent fell on the ground unmoving, then there's no choice but to acknowledge Ardis's victory. Although it's also possible for his opponent to lose because of cheating, in the first place, it's already cheating not acknowledging the platoon captain loss. There's no time to waste. If he took more time, the platoon captain's stamina would probably run out, but there's a possibility the judge would do more if it dragged on. It's a judge that would not let Ardis win even if it meant antagonizing the entire audience space. There's no knowing when the judge would suddenly announce Ardis' loss for no reason. Then his only choice would be to decide the outcome before that happens. Having said so, Aerua, his opponent is someone capable albeit totally unable to defend. His attack never stopped once. His speed and weight are top class. His stamina must be bottomless as well, seeing how his attacks were just as sharp and fast as the beginning. I will go with that. Ardis made his decision and continued defending against the platoon captain's attack while looking for the timing. One, two, three attacks. Not stepping back once, Ardis stood against him while dodging and deflecting. While making a show that would make the audience cheer. Quite some time had passed. But that moment finally came. You, 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 you. The moment when the platoon captain put his entire weight into that attack, Ardis dived in deep, 
grabbing onto the platoon captain's right hand which was holding the halberd, Ardis pulled it to himself while stepping in further, performing a half spin, Ardis found his way into a position like piggybacking the platoon captain, and utilizing his opponent's momentum, Ardis kicked him upwards. The platoon captain that had lost his footing spun in the air with Ardis's back as the axis. At the same time, Ardis pulled his right arm harder, causing the platoon captain to hit the ground after doing a full spin. Don't die, Ardis delivered words that was either a warning or a prayer, as the next moment the platoon captain's head found itself hitting the ground with a thud before everything went silent. Chapter 189 Chapter 189 The sudden and unexpected development caused even the angry voices directed to the judge to die down. The audience probably didn't know what happened either. After all, it looked like the platoon captain who was attacking without stopping suddenly found himself up in the air. Eh? What happened? Don't know. It was so sudden, but it looked like the countless sword sorcerer threw him. No way, it's impossible for him to throw someone larger and fully equipped. Maybe it's possible if he used magic, although the majority were tilting their head at what happened. There were also people that as knowings on martial arts. <clears throat> That's interesting. He used his opponent's momentum and threw him. Using himself as the axis and changing the direction of the force like a water wheel. I see, it makes sense. I heard there was a country that developed techniques like those. Is he from there? With a technique like that, I can probably do it too. While analyzing what happened calmly, they were greedily trying to find enlightenment that can help themselves improve. Ardis while looking at the platoon captain slowly took some distance. Although Ardis didn't think that he's dead, at the very least, he won't be able to move after getting hit right on his head with that force. His opponent had fallen on the arena without moving. Ardis still remained standing on the other hand. In other words, the match is over as his opponent is incapacitated. It's an outcome where no one can argue Ardis's victory. However, the judge still kept quiet without saying anything, and after a minute of silence from the judge, the audience that were murmuring seeing the platoon captain on the ground became impatient. Oi, what is that guy doing seriously? What the hell? Is that even a judge? Isn't it the outcome decided already? Quickly announce the end already. Don't you dare try to match fix. Change the judge. Once again. The entire arena were filled with angry voices. Although it was already obvious just now that the judge did not announce Ardis's victory when the platoon captain dropped his weapon, the situation now is clear for anyone that Ardis's victory is unarguable. And as expected, the judge's eyes started to look panic. Sweat can be seen forming on his forehead. However, even while being showered with insults from all sides, the judge didn't move a muscle, or rather, he couldn't move. Ardis noticed that his gaze was looking at the nobles seating for a moment. Seeing where the judge looked, there was the figure of Marquis Holgin with his hatred-filled gaze. I mean, the Marquis must have told him don't let him win no matter what but. What is he going to do in this situation? The angry voices from the audience were getting louder as time passes. It would not be long until riots happen from the audience if nothing is done. Oi. Judge, Ardis called out to the judge who was enduring all the fire. Is that fine, leaving that guy there? Ardis asked while pointing at the platoon captain on the ground. The judge seemed confused at that. He's probably still alive now but, if you left him there like that, there's no knowing what will happen. Even though it's best he receives treatment soon, you wouldn't announce the result. There might still be time now. But if that guy died because of you dragging on the time, are you going to be the one responsible? Wah. The judge's face color turned green at that question. It's natural. After all, the opponent that faced Ardis is the captain of the assault platoon in the army. He's not someone to be replaced easily. With his abilities, he can be said one of the cornerstones of the army. If a person like that died because he was untreated, whose responsibility would that be? Of course, there would be people blaming Ardis but, in the match, any matters regarding life and death will not be pursued publicly. After all, the organizer, the army had announced in advance and there was also a contract that all participants would have signed upon entry. In reality, there would probably still be people blaming him for that, but at the very least, he won't be held guilty publicly, and the judge too. Normally he would have no reason to be responsible over a death of a participant, but the situation now isn't normal. After all, he had obviously judged unfairly to the point he isn't even a judge, and because of that, treatment was not given to the platoon captain collapsed on the ground. If that platoon captain died because of that, 
the responsibility will surely lie with the judge. How it's going to be, I don't mind either way but, are you going to wait? I mean, he might regain consciousness if we waited long enough. And well, he might also never wake up again. At Ardis's words that had essentially forced him to make a choice. The judge was terribly in panic. It seems like his desperation was really at its limit, as he looked at Marquis Holgen at the nobles seating for help. Isn't he looking at the nobles? Are you some brat's lackey? That was probably evident to the audience's eyes too. More angry voices flew towards the judge. As that happened, the Marquis at the nobles seating screamed at a servant nearby angrily, before disappearing into the back. And after a while, a messenger ran towards them and whispered to the judge. It's probably the Marquis's orders. The judge that had been showering in insults by the audience looked like he found salvation, and while glaring at Ardis, he put his right arm up and announced the words that the audiences were waiting for. That's it, match. That moment, everyone in the arena cheered. Rather than congratulating Ardis, it was more like the cheers of winning against a noble that tried to manipulate the outcome of the match. Of course there were those that praised Ardis. However, for Ardis, his intentions to participate in the Lotus Cup was never that. The Lotus Cup this time had a judge from the army that was obviously unfair, and on top of that, looked like he was ordered by some noble. And since May had witnessed it happen, the blame would surely be directed towards Marquis Holgen who is the organizer and sponsor of the Lotus Cup. After the judge gave the declaration, multiple people ran towards the platoon captain on the ground. Some that looked like healers chanted magic, before carrying him away in a stretcher. Seeing him getting carried away, Ardis muttered to no one. Well, there's only one match left. Walking away to return the borrowed sword without even a glimpse of fatigue. He left the arena that was filled with cheers. There were three people watching Ardis leaving the arena from a corner of the nobles seating. He can even win against this odds huh? I knew he was capable but, I didn't think he could win against that. Isn't it a natural outcome? Isn't it unbefitting of the acting head of Nyarestier Duchy to not discern Shizu's true strength? Even after seeing it for himself? There was the figure of the young lady of Nyrestia smiling proudly against the duke's opinion. More. Is it me or my daughter is being a little disrespectful recently? Is this what they call rebellious phase? The duke asked for an opinion from the male escort behind him after getting a reply from his daughter. Your Excellency. Please don't drag me into family matters. But please don't worry as Ojusama is a gentle lady if it doesn't concern Ardis. So your excellency might need to endure until the Lotus Cup ends. What? You won't take my side. You're going to be the next guard captain for my house right? The duties of a guard captain doesn't encompass mediating a parent-child relationship. By the way, since I have no doubts in Ardis's victory from the beginning, in that sense I agree with Ojusama. Yeah yeah, I really don't have anyone on my side huh? The duke shrugged intentionally, but a smile was on his face. The two beside him also knew that it was a joke. I'm already aware that Ardis Khan's abilities aren't normal. But in a situation that magic is forbidden, and on Marquis Holgin's set-up stage, I thought he wouldn't be able to avoid a difficult fight. Certainly that was too much. It was obvious to anyone's eyes that the organizer favored the platoon captain. Even though enemies, I sure hoped they used their brain rather than being an utterly stew. K-H-M-M-E, rather than being so rash. More panically corrected himself as he was on the verge of swearing. Even Minerva who was snickering at him agreed at the judge's obvious action. It is as Commander Greystar said, that judge is just too much. Would he still be the judge for the finals? I don't think that can be the case. He had made all the audience his enemy. He probably wouldn't ever appear in the Lotus Cup again. It would be good if we can recommend a judge to. That's impossible. That Marquis wouldn't stay quiet if we did that much. His hands must be full now trying to hide from his highness. Is that so? It's going to be fine. He had obviously overdone it this time. The other house is probably going to tell on the prince too and the worst case even his majesty would come to know about it, at the very least, the judge for the finals would probably be better, but well, but, what is it, Minerva asked the duke, it's Marquis Holgen we're talking about, he probably have another hand, no way, more tried to cheer up Minerva who seemed to have clouds above her head, it's fine, Ojusama, that Ardis is not going to lose that easily even with a trick or two right, it's Ardis after all, yes, you have a point. As if recalling Ardis's strength suddenly, Minerva suddenly regained her energy. Yes, that's right. That must be the case. Shizu won't lose even if it's a disadvantageous situation. 
The surrounding adults watched her as she proclaimed confidently while her fist tightened. Chapter 190 Chapter 190 The Final Day of the Lotus Cup The last remaining day of the tournament that was held every day, Ardas showed himself as one of the last participants in the arena. The audience seatings were packed, and there were even people forced to stand and watch the annual big event. On top of it being the finals, Having someone not of the army in the finals had also played a great role in attracting audience. Ardis's opponent in the finals is the vice commander of the third division, Camlan. He's someone who had advanced to the finals of the Lotus Cup twice albeit haven't claimed a championship for himself yet. He's seen as one of the powerhouses in the Lotus Cup this year, and according to his past track records, he had advanced to the finals with a dangerous fighting style. So you're the countless sword sorcerer that had dealt with the foreigners during the war huh? What if I am? His opponent called out to Ardis first when they were at the center of the arena. I have seen your matches so far, I know you're not a normal magician. I'm sure you have participated in the Lotus Cup seriously and not to make a joke out of us. Nope, I totally came here to make fun of you and embarrass you though as Ardis retorted in his mind. But the army has its needs too. Although I feel sorry, Camlan's words cut off suddenly, and his expression clouded. But immediately after, he raised his head back up with resolute ties towards Ardis. I can't afford to lose here. Of course, we're not fighting to lose after all. Although Camlan's words intrigued him a little, Ardis replied as a matter of fact. Are both sides ready? The judge confirmed with the two the last time. It was a judge different from the semi-finals. As expected, the judge that time was hated by the audience, so there's no way he would appear now. If that judge were to reappear in the finals, then today's match would probably be a booing parade by the audience. It's a wise choice to have swapped him for someone else, though of course. The judge this time is probably also Marquis Holgan's man. There's no change in Ardis's mindset to not let his guard down. Ardis inspected his opponent, Camlan. He looked to be in his late thirties, the age when a warrior shines the brightest. He's taller than Ardis half a head, and his slim body was packed with muscles like armor. Not oversized that it would sacrifice speed and not thin that he would be lacking strength. It is a physique most balance in any warrior's eyes. His weapon is a bastard sword that can be wielded with a single hand or both hands. There was a shield with a size small enough to not hinder his movements affixed at his left arm. Leather armor that emphasized mobility was on him. Even while protecting vital spots and his joints, it is designed to provide the minimum cover to not hinder agility. Seeing his equipment, I guessed that his fighting style emphasizes on speed. At the very least, Ardis didn't think he's a type to power through everything. Both sides take position. As according to the judge's instructions, Ardis took five steps backwards. Well then, what kind of tricks will they be pulling this time? Ardis muttered to no one but himself. After all, there were assassins on the day before the semi-finals, and even the judge during then wasn't fair. There were actually also people that were surrounding him after the semi-finals but Ardis decided that it was too bothersome to deal with them and lost them in the forest instead. Marquis Holgan who had tried his best in trying to harm Ardis many attempts definitely wouldn't back down now. There must be a trick somewhere. Ardis who was on alert heard the signal from the judge. Begin. Ardis and Camlan both moved at the same exact time. But their movements were more like trying to get a feel out of each other. Ardis advanced half a step and matching that, Camelon advanced half as well. It was Camelon's side that went on the offense first. Just as Camelon's arm moved, Ardis already started his evasion maneuver. It was a horizontal slash that mostly had no precursor that came at Ardis. It would have been a hit against normal soldiers but it isn't a speed threatening to Ardis. So, Ardis dived lower and tried to approach Camelon from below. But as expected, his opponent is a championship candidate. Camlan's bastard sword changed trajectory and chased after Ardis. Ardis quickly abandoned the offense and used his sword as a shield and retreated the opposite direction. The sword that missed Ardis sliced the air instead. Ardis moved first as the two once again closed their distance. After making a feint, his attack aiming for Camlan's legs were deflected away by his bastard sword. After three exchanges, the two took some distance again. What a shame to have you as a magician. Well, thanks for the compliment. Camlan's impressed words were replied by Ardis rudely. There were no signs that the two were even remotely serious yet. Camlan changed his grip on his bastard sword into two hands. Probably acknowledging Ardis's strength, 
he plans to start attacking seriously. It's the same for Ardis having gauged his opponent's strength. Certainly he has that much to be called a championship candidate in the Lotus Cup. His abilities are much greater than the Assault Platoon captain in the semi-finals. However, it's not enough to be a threat to Ardis, he concluded. It's at a level where Ardis can say he will be a good match against Moore or Ted from Bright Stars of White Knight. Ardis as well fortified his grip on his sword against Camlin. Will it be a swift match, or will it be a long one in order to show the difference in strength to the audience? Just as he thought what would be the best way to damage the Marquis. Ardis's A's caught something unbelievable. What? Mana that would normally be absent during a match in the Lotus Cup was nesting in Camelon's sword. But there was no one other than Ardis who could notice that change. After all, there's close to none who can actually see mana in this world. Although it was a commonplace in Ardis's world, it's an abnormal ability in this world. As far as Ardis knew, the ones who can do this in this world is himself and near only. It's unlikely that there are people among the audience that can tell or rather, there's probably none. That's exactly why there's an armband that all participants need to wear to seal mana that is obvious to the audience in the Lotus Cup. But the armband. Camlin as well wore an armband similar to the one on his arm right now. But the strange thing was the mana was even flowing to there. As Ardis wondered what was happening, he noticed more mana flow. In Camlin's shield, even his armor started to have mana flowing through them and then mana that strengthened his body started flowing. It's probably magic that enhances his equipment and also a body strengthening buff. Camlin's armband stayed silent, rather, staying silent is not the correct description. After all, the armband itself was involved in the flow of mana, but for the people who cannot sense the flow of mana, the armband on Ardis's arm and Camlin's arm might as well be the same. So that's what they're going with. Ardis suddenly understood. Although he doesn't know what was the armband that Camlin wore, Ardis knew clearly what his enemy's intentions are. A fight where Ardis has his mana sealed while Camlin receives support and strengthening through magic. That's probably Marquis Holgan's plan in its entirety. Ha ha. The moment he understood Marquis Holgan's aim, an unusual laughter was heard from Ardis. The armband on Camlin's arm looked similar to Ardis's but it was a totally different thing. There's probably a magician hiding somewhere in the arena to provide strengthening buffs to Camlin. The armband that should have prevented that interference didn't, and the audience who couldn't tell the difference would never know they cheated. On the other hand, the armband on Ardis is probably the one that works properly. His mana is sealed thanks to the armband, and if he tried to remove it, he would be immediately disqualified. Although there are still some question yet to be answered, the situation basically sums up to Ardis not being able to use mana against Camelon who is receiving support from various magic. The difference in the presence of mana is great. On top of easily enhancing one's bodily functions by almost twofold, if counting in the equipment enhancing magic as well, one can easily win against an opponent even if he's inferior. In reality, the difference between demonic beings and beasts are the fact that they can wield mana. It's a demonic being exactly because it can use mana. If someone put something like the armband on Ardis's arm now on a demonic being, it would probably regress to not more than a fierce carnivorous beast. The difference in being able to use mana is vast. Although it might differ from species, in a fight among the same species, the side that can use mana is evident to win against the side that cannot. Ha <laughs> ha. Ha 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 ha, Ardis's dry laughter continued. I see, I see. That's how you're coming huh? That's right. It's an obvious method. It's a situation hopeless to win thinking normally. The audience could only see Ardis suddenly started laughing without any reason. The only ones who can understand what Ardis said is probably people who can sense the flow of mana, or those that are related in the plot. Marquis Holgan himself. His men, the magician who is providing buffs to Camlin from somewhere and probably the judge who is also an accomplice. Camlin himself is probably briefed beforehand as well. If not, he would have been surprised by the sudden buff supplied on him. And what he meant by although I feel sorry before the match started is probably referring to this too. I see, it's certainly a fight that is impossible to win normally. Normally it is. Although I just said so, his expression wasn't anxious. Rather, there was a smile. It's not a smile of desperation. It's not a smile of giving up on winning either. But rather it was the trembling of a real fight that he had not experienced for a long time. A situation normally impossible to win. But even if he's being supported with magic, 
Ardis was still intending on winning, in a situation where he can't use mana against someone that's receiving magic buffs. With that much handicap given, Ardis finally for the first time had a chance of losing. After arriving in this world, it was a real fight that Ardis hadn't experienced. His sight, hearing, smell, and thoughts as if casting off all unnecessary elements became sharper. Although his life is not on the line here, just the point of not intending to lose is raising Ardis's tension. Finally against a foe at the same level, Ardis narrowed his eyes and said, Fine, I shall pick this fight. Chapter 191 Chapter 191 Even though his tension was high, Ardis's mind and thoughts were calm. He closed the distance in order to verify his suspicion earlier. His speed was unbelievable for someone not with the help of mana. Despite so, his opponents had an upper hand. No matter how fast Ardis was, Camlan who was being strengthened with magic buffs could easily react to that. Ardis's swords were swung with the least preparation motion. Mew. However, it was deflected by Camlan's bastard sword despite the speed. As for Ardis, he already thought that it wouldn't work from the beginning. Ardis followed up closer at the gap showed up as Camlan defended. However, the mana isn't going away huh? Ardis has the mana sealing armband on him now. Leaving aside its effects on the wearer, it's supposed to nullify all magical effects within three meters according to the explanation in the rules. If that's true, Ardis's armband would overlap and nullify the mana around Camelon right now. However, even though Ardis was at a distance where they're exchanging swords, the mana on him didn't disappear at all. Strange, Ardis thought as his sword continued to move. Ardis could see that Camlan's armband has mana in them. He is sure that it's another magical tool that imitated the looks of a mana sealing armband, but the problem lies within what effects it has. Judging from the situation, it probably has some functionalities to hinder the real mana sealing armband's effects. Even if there are many magical buffs on him, if all of them get nullified when Ardis is close, there's no point at all. Rather, it would create a huge disconnection between his mind and physique when that happened, causing his senses to go wild. As expected, they should have done some countermeasures against that. Camlan's bastard sword ripped apart the atmosphere as it targeted Ardis's head. Whoa. Ardis immediately ducked down as the bastard sword passed above him. Ardis felt a terrible chill down his spine. Even if it's a blunted blade. It's still a mass of steel swung by someone magically strengthened. On top of that, the sword itself is enhanced as well. If it hit, Ardis probably wouldn't survive. However, since the Lotus Cup is a martial arts tournament where weapons are allowed and no magic is allowed, Ardis had closed the distance knowing the danger. Dodging Camelon's sword barely, Ardis counterattacked being extra careful to not burden his sword too much. Since his sword would break if he tried to parry Camelon's attack frontally, a misstep would be fatal. Despite the mental burden on him, the sword exchanges that he barely manages was awaking his warrior instincts with joy. Although Ardis was counterattacking at any gaps he sees, he was still at a disadvantage. Under the immense pressure, Ardis suddenly felt something amiss. What? Camlan would sometimes stop attacking and back down unnaturally. After exchanging attacks multiple times, he wouldn't pursue despite it being a good chance but take distance. Ardis thought it was just him being careful at first but, as expected, Ardis suspected something as he continued to do that. With that suspicion, Ardis was able to make an inference as he examined the armband on Camelon. The mana radiating from the armband has weakened. The effects of Camelon's armband is probably to hinder with the nullify all mana within three meters effect of Ardis's armband. But that's not a perfect solution, either. Ardis had realized that the mana on Camelon's armband dwindling when he is in range. It would regain its strength if Camelon took distance, and weaken again if Ardis is in range. Although it's not for sure, Ardis threw that Camelon's armband wouldn't be able to keep its effects for long if Ardis is in range. Even without knowing the exact workings of the armband, Ardis could make that inference easily. Of course, Camelon must have known that in advance. That's why he would retreat after every few exchanges. Ardis made a guess that it needed to be continuously resupplied with mana. If so, if its mana decreases when Ardis is close enough, it just means that Ardis have to keep him in range. It would normally be nothing more than a reckless thinking. His opponent having a bastard sword and himself both enhanced with mana. Even if the both weapons are made with the same materials originally, Camelon's bastard sword is now undeniably harder than Ardis's sword. If Ardis failed to receive an attack properly, 
His sword would definitely break. It will be something he has to keep an eye for carefully. Ardis's next attack aimed at Camelon's left leg, but Camelon's reflex which was strengthened with mana could easily respond to that. The shield on his left arm moved into trajectory to block Ardis's sword. TCH. Ardis immediately pulled back his sword. Even if his opponent only tried to deflect his sword, Ardis might still break his sword if he swung at the enhanced shield wholeheartedly. In this battle, there were too many limitations that Ardis had to keep in mind. He couldn't use mana, and he cannot properly attack as well. He had to stay in range at all times to hinder his opponent's strengthening. In other words, he will have to fight constantly on danger where a mistake would spell defeat. However, something like that I have known in advance. Muttering by himself, Ardis increased the speed with his attack. He could keep up with Camelon who was strengthened with mana. What a fearsome magician. You are. While exchanging swords, Camelon praised Ardis. However, the fear on his face was apparent. That's not quite right. With an emotionless face as usual, Ardis replied. That was not being humble but a fact. After all, there were much more fearsome opponents in Ardis's world. But I don't have the intentions to lose either. Camelon swung his sword down while crying out. Ardis dodged it by sidestepping, and stepping forward one step. His sword was swung aiming at Camelon's right wrist. Camelon's strengthened body moved the shield on his left arm and blocked Tardis's sword. Camelon's wholehearted swing downwards with the bastard sword was forcefully pulled up into another trajectory. For Ardis who doesn't hold a shield, it would be an attack that forces him to back down normally. But Ardis don't have an option like that now. While exchanging attacks like this, Ardis had verified the mana in Camelon's armband is decreasing. But if he took distance now, Camelon's armband would be recharged. If that happened, Ardis would get nowhere in this match. To break the stalemate, Ardis knew that he would have to stop whatever effects that Camelon's armband had. As if you're escaping. Camelon who tried to take distance again was pursued. What? Camelon's eyes were dyed with surprise, then in the next moment anxiety. To not let him escape, Ardis continued to advance as Camelon tried to retreat. Ardis would step forward every time when Camelon tried to take a step back. Of course no distance would be made. TCH, that's your plan huh? Camelon clicked his tongue realizing Ardis's intentions. The mana within the armband on Camelon is getting weaker by time. Of course Camelon wouldn't let Ardis draw closer quietly as well. He had to force Ardis to retreat no matter what with his bastard sword. It isn't an easy feat to continue advancing while dodging attacks. In a normal situation, Ardis would be able to dodge sideways with spare margin but, if he did that now, he wouldn't be able to catch up. And of course, backing down to dodge is not an option. As he had to keep moving forward to keep up, attacking by bending forward is naturally not possible. Ardis continued to dodge Camelon's bastard sword that would end the match in a single hit with the bare minimum motion. Even as the bastard sword continued to shave Ardis's several strands of hair off and the intense air pressure that Ardis felt by his shoulders, arms and even his face every time it passed through, Ardis never stopped closing the distance. Using all nerves in his body, Ardis felt like he was walking on a tightrope across a valley where no mistake can be made as he continued dodging all while sometimes aiming for Camelon's waist or knees to dull his movements. Eventually, the time arrived. It was probably a long time for the two participants, but the action where Ardis continued to chase down Camelon who was trying to escape was in fact not long at all. As the offense and defense continued to happen, Ardis sensed a definite change with his eyes. The mana residing in Camelon's armband had completely exhausted. Shit. Camelon's face distorted with pure anxiety. That moment, Camelon's movements became dull to the point that it was visible to the naked eye. That's because the body strengthening magic he was supplied was cut off. At the same time, the mana strengthening his equipment disappeared as well. The effects of Ardis's armband had fulfilled its original role. There's already zero distance between Ardis and Camelon now. If Camelon still can't manage to get away, it would return to a pure physical fight without any involvement with magic. Ardis's sword pointed towards Camelon who had a face with apparent unrest as he declared. And this is the checkmate. Chapter 192 Chapter 192 The fuck is that? In one of the nobles seating of the arena, one particular noble was red to the face with anger as he smashed the wine glass down into the floor. One of the highest authorities in the army, 
It is none other than Marquis Holgan who is also the Lotus Cup's organizer cursing. If Camlin loses, Marquis Holgan and the army's reputation would eat dirt. The Marquis's voice volume increased with unrest and anxiety. Never. Something like that can never happen. His irritation instead directed to the old servant behind him. Don't you have any idea? Even if you ask me. The Marquis was anxious to the point that he came up with a reckless idea. That armband detonated. At the worst case, the countless sword sorcerer can be eliminated, and we can call it off as an unfortunate accident. However my lord, if he is basically sticking to Camlin, the man required for that wouldn't even reach. It's true that the armband that Camlin wore had the capability of hindering the effects of the mana sealing armband that other participants has to wear. But at the same time, there's also a mechanism to self-destruct in case for a situation to destroy evidence. Just as the Marquis said, it's possible to detonate the armband using that mechanism and drag in the countless sword sorcerer as well. However, that itself would mean sacrificing Camelon, and on top of that there's a need to provide enough mana to the armband. Presently, as the countless sword sorcerer is not willing to leave Camelon alone, detonating it is impossible. I know that much. Then force some distance between them. Use some suitable excuse to separate them but that would be. The judge is also one of Marquis's men. If on his order, it's definitely possible for the judge to halt the match and make them take distance. But knowingly the situation is in favor of the countless sword sorcerer and halting the match would look bad, and if Camelon's armband exploded right after that, only the dumbest person wouldn't realize something was up with the organizers. It's not at all a good hand to play now. No buts. Don't you dare tell me what to do. But if his lord is insisting on it, the old servant couldn't say no as well. I understand. I will give the orders right now. Just as the old servant was about to leave the room, one of the escort passed on the message that there was a visitor. Don't you see I'm busy now. Put them at some later time. The Marquis howled at the escort soldier with anger. However, the visitor is an aide of the royal family. Of the royal? Can't you tell them to wait until the match is over? The Marquis was confused at the unexpected visitor. Yes sir. I'm afraid that it is an emergency matter. You, at this time, no choice, let them in. Leaving aside if only a normal officer, as expected, he couldn't chase away someone coming with royal orders. If a royal aide had come to visit, it would mean that a royal member had instructed him to do so. It's not possible to chase him away without hearing his matter. The escort soldier immediately guided the aide into the room. After exchanging greetings, the aide immediately went into the main topic, which was something that the Marquis would have never imagined. His Highness is summoning your Excellency. His Highness? The Marquis had evident confusion. Could it not be after the match? No sir. It's immediately, as I've been told. Mew. The Marquis was quiet at the aide's words. Leaving aside other countries. The Crown Prince of the Nagra's Kingdom holds immense power. Although he couldn't dismiss the Crown Prince, the Marquis should be able to delay the meeting by a while with a reasonable excuse. However, for Marquis Holgin presently, the Crown Prince is someone he must not irritate right now. Marquis Holgin's daughter is currently one of the fiancé candidates of the Crown Prince, Prince Cast. Although the other two candidates are not giving up, the Marquis's daughter still holds the upper hand. However, the marriage is not set in place yet. That's why the Marquis couldn't do anything that will displease the Crown Prince in this period. Do you happen to know what matter is it to have my presence needed? As he asked so, the aide opened his mouth statically, and said words that surprised the Marquis as a matter of fact. I hope you can explain yourself, is what his highness wanted me to pass on. Why? He explain? It was not something he wanted to hear as the Marquis's face turned green. What explain? Why would His Highness wants an explanation from me? Me being a lowly servant would never know. However, however, it's unsightly to do any more pranks is what His Highness said. I'm afraid that it would be better to not do anything more than this. Wow. The Marquis became speechless. His body was trembling and stumbled slightly as the older servant supported him from behind. Why would His Highness? The Marquis muttered as if moaning in pain. Behind the Marquis who was shaking his head with an expression of not understanding, the old servant closed his eyes seemingly with remorse. It's easy to understand. The Marquis had done too much. Being a noble in itself would mean having shady connections under the table. And a royalty isn't exempted from that. But rather, the higher one's position in the monarchy, the darker side they have under the table. 
The Crown Prince would never give such a vague order out without meaning behind. Even the fact of hiring people to assault the countless sword sorcerer, being a Marquis, if he couldn't do that much, he wouldn't be able to keep his position for long. Using their position and power to manipulate the odds in their favor, it's something all nobles do. But that itself has its limits too. With the judge that was present in the semi-finals and his evident unfair judgment, that had probably crossed the crown prince's line of what is tolerable. And in the finals, it's easy to imagine he would incur the crown prince's wrath with something that couldn't even be on the level of unfairness. Even if there's no way to verify that there's direct interference using magic, it's still possible to investigate what the Marquis had done. Being the next king, the broadness of the intelligence network that the crown prince has has no reason to be inferior to Marquis Holgins or Duke Nyrestia's. Please head over to His Highness swiftly. We can't let His Highness wait after all. The aide hushed on the stunned Marquis Holgin with an expressionless face. On the other hand, during that time, Azardus was chasing down Camlan. Shit. Camlan was desperately trying to get away, but Ardus would naturally not allow that. If he wanted to do that, he should have done that when he still had mana in his armband. Being engaged in a close quarters combat with Ardus without the aid of the armband, there's no way Camlan can get away from Ardus. In other words, if Ardus wouldn't distance himself from Camlan, there's basically no reason the odds will tip over to Camelon's side. Ardis had now completely grasped the initiative. However, I cannot lose here. Camelon has his purpose too. However, if only anything is solvable with only purpose and stubbornness, then life wouldn't be so difficult. Opponents would get stronger the more fights one got into. Camelon tried his best with his skillful swordsmanship and heavy attacks but, Ardis had kept at a distance where none of them could reach. In a situation that he lost his magic support, there's no reason Camelon can win. You can surrender to you know who would. Ardis would sometimes hit Camelon's neck and his chest, trying to break his fighting spirit. But as expected, there's no way Camelon would admit defeat honestly. For Camelon, he's already backed up into a wall. To uphold the reputation of the army, he could never lose here. Of course, Ardis didn't expect the judge this time to judge fairly too so he had intended to continue until Camlan is physically unable to continue. Well, I have my ways if you're like that too. Honestly speaking, Ardis's purpose wasn't to win in the Lotus Cup. If he can achieve his original reason, then winning or losing doesn't matter at all. Sorry but it will be a long performance. Ardis's attack increased in count. Although individually not heavy, their speed aren't normal. Ardis already dished out three attacks before Camlan can do one. And soon, the bastard sword was blown out of Camelon's hands naturally after being on the defensive for so long. Shit. Camelon reached his hand out to the bastard sword. However, Ardis's sword smacked hard at that arm. Another punch in the gut of Camelon whose face was already distorted in pain. That would have counted as a fatal hit normally but of course the judge ignored it with a poker face. Ardis swung his sword the second time at the arm which still tried to reach out to the fallen bastard sword before the bastard sword was kicked away out of Camelon's reach. Wow, but of course that wasn't the end. Ardis continued his flurry of attacks on Camelon. On the other hand, Camelon had lost even his weapon to counter-attack. He could only try to defend against Ardis's one-sided attack desperately using his shield. It was a strange sight to see in a martial arts tournament. You can always surrender, but well, if you want to continue without a weapon. I can be your opponent till the end. Camlan who was only defending cursed at Ardis despite himself. Guo, cowardly. Whose mouth is that coming from? Even within a battle, Ardis said so with an exasperated expression. If debating about cowardness, the match continuing on even though the outcome is already set at this point is already considered cheating on his part. Even if the majority of the audience aren't warriors, they should be able to tell that the fight they're witnessing isn't normal. As a proof. Rather than cheers, there were angry voices from the audience. Of course, the target of the audience wasn't Ardis but the judge who still wouldn't announce the end despite the match being like this. If this continued, it'll probably end in the same situation where Ardis can only win if Camlan is incapacitated like in the semi-finals. But that is also within Ardis's expectations. If you're up for it, I can be your partner until the end. With a smile ridden with bad personality, Ardis increased the intensity of his attacks. Chapter 193 Chapter 193 Ardis's swords continued its onslaught on Camelon one-sidedly. Relentlessly clinging on to Camelon who's trying to escape, Ardis continued aiming only for his arm, 
abdomen or legs. His attacks started to focus on his lower body. Ardis would fit in a kick sometimes as his sword continued to swing aiming for the knees or the calves. Even if it's a blunted sword, the weight and speed behind it is not light. If Ardis had mana here, Camlin's legs would have been severed long ago already. But luckily or unluckily, Ardis's swing without the aid of mana didn't hold that much power. Although there wasn't any bloodshed, the damage on Camelon was accumulating on parts of his body not visible to the outside. Ak, his fatigue must have caught up as well. Camelon who can no longer support himself up collapsed on his knees. He tried to get back up in hurry. However, Ardis's sword swung heavily at his ankle. Next, G Camelon once again collapsed on the ground. Although I don't have anything personal with you. Ardis continued to stop his attempts at standing back up as he said so coldly. I will have you sit right there until the match is over. You are. Despite Camelon not able to understand Ardis's words the first time, he was finally able to realize Ardis's intentions after getting hit down so many times whenever he tried standing back up, losing his weapon. Even if he's hit in a vital spot, the judge who would pretend to see nothing won't ever acknowledge Ardis's victory. Ardis didn't care about it. Ardis just have to show that the difference in strength is obvious to anyone's A's in the prolonged match. The longer the match goes on, the more embarrassment Marquis Holgan who is the one behind Camelon will suffer. With this much audience around to witness, and the Marquis essentially being made fun of, his prestige surely wouldn't hold well. Even if he might never win officially in this match, Ardis had already fulfilled more than enough of his purpose. You were making fun of us. That's right. As Ardis immediately answered silently inside his mind, he continued to stop Camelon whenever he tried to get back up. The weaponless warrior would collapse on the ground again every time he tried to stand up. On the other hand, there was a young magician standing while holding a sword with one hand as if reaping weeds in his garden swiping at the warrior's legs mundanely. No one would believe it is the finals of the Lotus Cup that can be said the biggest martial arts tournament in Nagra's kingdom. It's obvious even to a child that who's the stronger one. Despite so, there was the judge who wouldn't say anything. It's natural that there are displeasures and angers from the audience. Without giving a thought to his accomplishment, Ardis continued to stop Camlan from standing up. Several tens of repetition must have happened then. Eventually, Camlan who is scarred to the point that he didn't attempt standing up again. What happened? Finally admitting defeat? Although Ardis tried to provoke him intentionally, Camlan had no response. Ardis used the back of his sword and tapped on Camelon's head. It was a surreal scene. In the audience's eyes, their difference in strength are like seeing an adult and a child fight. Camlan had lost his intentions to continue fighting already. Even if no blood was shed, his legs would be in tatters already. Even if Ardis wasn't strengthened with magic, and even if Camelon was wearing protective gear. The count of him getting hit on the legs are still substantial. It's not strange for Camlan to have a fracture or two by now. Just as he pondered what else to do next in order to win, he heard a man's exasperated voice. Spare him from any more, will you? It wasn't a voice from the audience. Just as Ardis turned around to the closer than expected voice, there was an unfamiliar person behind the judge. It was a middle-aged man with a lush beard. Why you are? The judge who turned around suddenly panicked. It seems like he's someone superior to the judge. This match, it's the countless sword sorcerer's win. Leaving aside what rights he had, he declared Ardis's victory easily. And of course, the judge didn't sit quietly with that. I it's troubling for me if you make decisions abruptly like that. I am tasked to be a judge in this match, even if you're our respected advisor. Please refrain from doing dash. Just as the judge tried to argue back, the advisor man's atmosphere changed. A threatening glint showed in his eyes, and glared at the judge before shouting. You're saying you are the judge? Yuck. A short cry can be heard from the judge because of the advisor's pressure. Is there even meaning for a judge if they're unfair? A judge is human too. It's no helping that they're preferential to their side. But if you're not even saying anything when he's like that, it's nothing but that you have already stopped being a judge. How long has it been that he lost his weapon? How many times his vital spots are hit? And in this situation where even his intentions to fight is lost, is there a point in continuing? When will this match end? Until one side lost their life. Since when a match of Lotus Cup is decided with killing, the advisor's voice was loud. His voice had reverberated in the arena that had quieted down due to the sudden intruder. The advisor was making it loud intentionally for the audience to hear. His words are correct, and at the same time, 
It was a whole representation of the audience's feelings. T. Thatsum, the judge who cowered peeked at the nobles' seatings but, there was no figure of Marquis Holgin around. The Marquis is not here already. His Highness is terribly angered, you see. I'm here on His Highness's intentions. Wah! T. Thats. The judge panicked more than before and became speechless. He must have caught on to something, as the judge closed his mouth and refrained from saying anything. And so that's it. Countless sword sorcerer, spare him from any more beatings. Camlin is just following his orders too. Although it might be a foreign concept for a mercenary like you, a soldier can never go against their orders. Hearing that, Ardis obediently took his distance from Camlin. Ardis had nothing personal with Camlin in the first place, and he was pondering how to end the match too before he came. Rather than an inappropriate result, Ardis had nothing to complain if he was declared the winner. The advisor nodded lightly seeing Ardis obediently pulled back, before raising his left fist up in the air, and declared with all of his voice, the match is over. In the name of his highness, the crown prince, the champion of the Lotus Cup is hereby the countless sword sorcerer, Ardis. At that moment, Ardis's championship in the Lotus Cup is decided. Exploding cheers from all direction by the audience came at once as they showered on Ardis. It was the first time recorded in history that someone outside the army had won in the Lotus Cup as the cheers continued on. Chapter 194 Chapter 194 Ten days after the ending ceremony of the Lotus Cup, after his lessons with Minerva at the Duke's residency, he decided to stop by at the guard's office for a while together with more welcome, though this office is just a shabby storeroom. While having a bitter smile, Moore handed over a cup with water to Ardis. How unlike you to be humble like that. I mean, it would be pretentious of me to not be humble against a respected figure that has the titles of sword magic user, three great demons subjugator, and now even Lotus Cup champion. No matter how many titles you add on. I'm just a lowly mercenary. In terms of social ranking, aren't you as a guard captain of the Duke's house better? Say that after trying to hide your teasing smile. Ardis and Moore were lightly joking around. Although they haven't known each other for long, they were still close enough to easily joke around with an easygoing atmosphere between them. Well, take a seat. You don't have anything else to do while waiting Ojusama to release Rona right? Offering a seat to Ardis on the long bench. Moore as well took a seat. It's commonplace for Roju Sama to dote on Rona these days. Waiting for him every time is probably annoying for you but, Rona himself must be really happy. But Rona that guy, he's getting fatter recently. Ah, that. I mean, it's natural after eating that many sweets. Moore had an awkward response hearing Ardis's spurt of the moment of complaining at Rona's unbecoming. As an awkward atmosphere started to form in the office. Moore thought to change the tropic to the Lotus Cup. By the way, did you hear about Marquis Holgin? Yeah, the gist of it. The Crown Prince was not happy or something. He did too much after all. Even if it was for the sake of saving his face, his interference in the semi-finals and finals was overboard. Moore continued to have a bitter smile. And apparently the mana sealing armband in the finals was tampered with too. Rather than tampering, my opponent was something that looked like it but totally different. The one that I wore had the right mana sealing effect. But he had multiple buffs from magic when I had to fight with none. As he heard about that part of the story for the first time, Moore's expression distorted. You, is that even something winnable? I had a tough one thanks to that though. It didn't look like that from my side. In any case, the army's reputation is in the dirt now. Thanks to a certain magician somewhere defeating all their elites. So was it all according to your aim? Ardis didn't answer but had a smile. Oh how scary, as Moore muttered before narrating what happened with the Marquis after the incident. Because of his misconduct, the Marquis was forced to bear all the responsibility. Apparently there was an order to the Marquis to surrender his territory to his heir and be under house arrest and all of his political power is also nulled. As for his heir I think he's 22 this year. He's still young and, the successions must have been out of the blue as well, so he must not be prepared for it yet. I think they will be occupied with fortifying their foothold for now. Even if they do manage to stabilize, their power would have dropped a lot. The Marquis house suffered great damage from the scandal this time. Of course their trust in the army was ruined and their authority had considerably dropped as well. At the very least, there's no mistake that the Marquis's daughter would no longer be a candidate queen for the crown prince. Regardless, it's not like Minerva would be reconsidered as a candidate again, and the person herself isn't hoping for that either, 
so Ardis didn't care much regarding that. You're not satisfied with that much? No way. Ardis denied Moore's words of attempting to read his mind. They're not like demonic beings that Ardis can dispose of just by his sword. On the surface, Marquis Holgan's crime was made to be overly interfering with the judging process of the Lotus Cup. The assassination attempts on Ardis and Minerva and even the matter regarding the mana sealing armband in the finals weren't disclosed to the public and probably wouldn't ever be told. Although being punished to step down as the Marquis just for the Lotus Cup might seem overboard but, it's likely what the Crown Prince and the upper echelons of the kingdom had decided after taking account of his other misdoings that are not publicly disclosed. Or maybe Duke Nyrestia had pulled some strings too. Rather, it was too much. It was Ardis's thoughts on his punishment, with Ardis's strength. It's possible for him to take revenge directly on the Marquis too. If Minerva were to lose her life, Ardis himself would have stepped forward no matter what the Duke or more would have said. But it's not like Ardis likes to antagonize a country or its royalty. If they're willing to punish the Marquis rightfully, then Ardis has no reason to go against the law. There's the matter with Oju-sama as well. I don't think His Excellency would stay quiet just yet. Moore spoke of the predicted future sensing what Ardis was thinking. Duke Nyrestia would probably mercilessly trample on the successor of Marquis Holgan now that their house has lost most of their foundation. A noble's fight should be kept between the nobles. Those things are better left with the Duke. His anger is justified. He has rights to exact his revenge. Although if his successor didn't have any relation with the assassination attempt on Minerva, it might seem unjustified for him to be bearing the brunt of it. However, him succeeding Marquis Holgan would mean that he must resolve himself for the responsibilities as well. But either way, nobles, or rather the royalty are terrifying. Moore shrugged while saying, Why? The Lotus Cup's real organizer is the Marquis Holgan house right? But suddenly, it became something the Crown Prince owns. From Moore's story, all organizing party for the Lotus Cup were apparently punished and the rights to organize Lotus Cup falls to the Crown Prince now, meaning the future Lotus Cup will be hosted under the Crown Prince name. Ardis seemed convinced as he recalled something. There was the advisor that suddenly took charge of the finals and announced the result. The man made the fact of by the name of the Crown Prince, His Highness clear during his announcement as well. Although it didn't seem significant at the time, it was most likely the proclamation of the Crown Prince taking charge. That proclamation easily cleared all the audience's irritation. And by kicking out the original organizing party, the Crown Prince party was seen in a good light. In other words, the old organizers, the army and Marquis Holgin suffered greatly, while the Crown Prince benefited from it. On top of that, now that future Lotus Cups are organized by the Crown Prince, his authority in the army would increase as well. While shaving off the power of another noble, the crown prince had skillfully manipulated it to increase his own. The crown prince had taken advantage of the chance that Ardis made. So I was used like a pawn huh? Is it irritating? Not really. Our purpose is different, and if the crown prince doesn't do anything extra, there's nothing I would say. That's reassuring to hear. What? Did you think I would make a move on the crown prince for just choosing me? I mean, you would probably beat them down even if they're royalty. Don't be stupid. They aren't like demonic beings. Just killing them would make it more cumbersome. It's better to stay far away from any political figures. But you seem to be fine around Ojusama though. It's not like Minerva is a political figure right? There's a chance she might be so in the future though. At the very least, becoming a wife of someone like that is not entirely impossible. Moore's voice died down at the end. A year after the assassination attempt. Minerva who didn't show herself under the pretense of recuperation. Though no one would know that rather than recuperation, they were all transported into another world. In any case, the fact is that the rumors of her being scarred by the assassination was spread, and that had certainly affected her marriage prospects. However, despite the rumors, she's still a daughter of a duke, there's probably no chance she would be marrying into a house of lower peerage. Regarding the dent in Minerva's marriage prospects, Ardis can be said totally unrelated. Rather, if Ardis weren't around during the attack, then it's likely that she wouldn't have returned from the other world. Despite so, Ardis still felt a little painful knowing that. Now that he had known her for a while, Ardis couldn't easily treat it as someone else's problems. A few days later, the reason why he couldn't flatly refuse Minerva's request was probably because of that too. Chapter 195 Chapter 195 A pristine white building centered in the capital. 
The church standing in the center courtyard was enveloped in a solemn atmosphere. As only believers would visit to pray, there weren't much foot traffic, it felt like it was the only place separated from the busy capital. However, anyone who is familiar with the church would realize the atmosphere surrounding the church is different today. Although still solemn, it felt like the people in the church were busy and in a hurry. Sister Salt, are your preparations finished? A priest with plump ears called out to one of the girl walking by in the corridor. Yes, Priest Sama. A sister at her prime age replied. It was a beautiful girl with light red pupils and pinkish hair. Although a little short, her lovely appearance would be able to captivate any men. The sister whose name Salt was called stopped her tracks and replied with a faint smile towards the priest. My preparation for the rite is completed. All that's left are my belongings. I see. Then if you have time after that, can you help out Sister Julia? It seems like they're lacking hands there. The priest with the special characteristic of plump ears nodded after hearing Salt's answer, before mentioning the name of another sister that needed help with the preparation. I understand. I will head over immediately after finishing. Sorry about it but... Thank you. No, it's a large-scale cleansing rite after all. It's natural that more preparation is needed. The cleansing rite refers to the ritual where one visits various holy sites of the goddess in order to rid impurities from their soul. It was originally a voluntary expedition that believers would go on their own accord in order to obtain blessings from the goddess. However, the cleansing rite is also simplified after being spread among the nobles and citizens. Now it is considered a practice that can elevate the class of someone's soul, those that had undergone a cleansing right worth or to have a purer soul. That is why for noble young ladies that have not married yet for certain reasons, it is seen as a method to raise their own value. Certainly the scale this time is unprecedented even in our records, at least for the last few ten years. The one going for the cleansing right this time is the lady of the Duke Nyarestia house, one of the most powerful nobles that is said to have royal blood. The lady that is now 15 years old was in recuperation for a year, and was rumored of being cursed. Although she was once seen as a powerful candidate for the future queen of the crown prince, now she's even being shunned by the sons of other high peerage nobles. The duke must have thought of this idea in order to raise the appraisal of his daughter. That is why he had requested the church to hold a cleansing rite that was unprecedented in scale in the last few ten years. Because of that. The cleansing rite this time will involve five priests, 18 monks, 16 nuns, and on top of that, there will be escorts for the duke's daughter, and also servants for other matters, tallying up to more than 200 people in the expedition. And that is why the preparation had been a disaster. The church in the capital was lacking hands, and even help from other churches in nearby towns or villages were called over. It's just as expected from a house of Duke. Even just the escorts is almost a hundred people including the private soldiers and mercenaries. It's nothing short of an amazement. Though I think it might a little excessive in my opinion. Although saying so, the plump-eared priest didn't seem to be disproving of it. After all, he is included as one of the five priests on the cleansing rite, as it was an exceedingly rare chance. Even him who was known for his calm nature was excited at the honor, as for me, I can meet Ardis San again since a while already, so I'm actually looking forward to it. Salt's expression softened a little while mentioning Ardis's name. It had been almost six years since her first meeting with Ardis in her student's days. One side being a mercenary, and the other being a sister of the church, it's rare for them to meet each other but, since Salt would request Ardis as a personal escort two or three times in a year, it can be said that they had a long relationship, although Ardis would turn soury whenever it's about the goddess, other than that, they have been maintaining a good relationship with each other, the countless sword sorcerer. However, the plump-eared priest seemed to frown a little hearing Ardis's name, Priest Sama. Is there something? No, it's nothing. Since we will be going through demonic beings' territory during the cleansing rite, I was hoping that nothing would happen. As the priest tried to cover it up, Salt proclaimed proudly, I'm sure it will be fine. After all, Ardasan is the countless sword sorcerer who subjugated the three great demons after all. I heard he had one in the Lotus Cup recently too. I'm sure no demonic beings will be a problem if Ardasan is there. Is, that so? The plump-eared priest made a smile forcefully hearing such salt. Just about the same time, in Ardis's house located in the Corsa's forest, the countless sword sorcerer in question was having a troubled face as he looked at Nia for help. Nu, no, 
I will follow you, please bring me to. It was Philia and Rihanna pulling at Ardis's arm from both sides, Nia. It's not something I shall interrupt, I say, although Ardis called out to Nia with a troubled face. The servant with sky-colored eyes declared her non-interference policy. Why did something like this happen? That was because of the request that Ardis accepted this time. In this request, Ardis will be serving as an escort for Duke Nyarestia's daughter, Minerva, who will be undergoing a cleansing rite in three different locations in the kingdom. Since there will be many priests, monks and nuns, people related to the church, it's a job that Ardis personally didn't want to accept. However, since it was Minerva that he would be escorting, and also because of a request from Duke Nyrestia and more, even the person herself asked with a please with an anxious expression, Ardis became unable to refuse. At the same time, he heard that Salt was also one of the nuns joining, so that had affected his decision a little as well. In the end, Ardis accepted the request of being an escort for Minerva for the whole period of the cleansing rite, but the problem lies with the period. The three different locations in the kingdom for the cleansing rite is not exactly far from each other. However, it still needs time to visit all of them. On top of that, there will be a large gathering of more than 200 people taking part. It's a route that would probably only take 10 days for a party consisting only of mercenaries but, the more people tag along, the slower their pace would be. Also, lodging for everyone would naturally be limited as well. That is why it is expected to last a month. This time as Ardis signed the escort request, Philia and Rihanna who heard that suddenly changed in face colors. It would be the first long absence that Ardis will have after returning from the other world, although it hadn't been a problem with his short absence so far, hearing that it would be an absence of a month, the twins insisted themselves following as well. I can fight already, please. I won't be a baggage. It's true that the twins had strength to back them up. In the year that Ardis wasn't around, the twins showed immense growth. They had learned how to cast hearts without chanting, and after training in the forest with actual combat, they had been able to win against twin swords already. Although they aren't as powerful as Kyrill yet but, the two are probably unmatched as sorcerers at their age. By the way, Kyril had gotten stronger to the point that he can win against three Richters in the past year. Although Kyril is in his third year in the academy, soon to graduate, he can be said unmatched in the academy. In terms of actual combat experience, it might be that his experience even exceeds the lecturers. Returning to the main problem, Ardis compromised with the twins pulling at his arm from both sides. I know about that too but Ardis had seen the two's growth as well. However, no matter how strong they are despite their age, Ardis couldn't afford to let them tag along in the escort request this time. They are seen as children in normal eyes. Ardis is supposed to be an escort here but, if he brought them, he would be criticized of bringing more people to escort. However, it's only Ardis who understands that the twins no longer requires any escort as they have their own strength. The other mercenaries and escorts would naturally be displeased. But in the first place, Tagging along will be, Ardis muttered softly while his body shook being pulled from both sides. The most problematic factor is that there will be many priests and church-related figures there, which are all the goddesses believers who think the existence of twins are preposterous. Ardis already had to take care of the twins' safety, there's no need for him to toss them into a bunch of people who thinks twins aren't human. No matter how Philia and Rihanna complained, no matter how inflated their cheeks would be. Ardis is hard on his decision that they wouldn't be following this time. However, him just saying no probably wouldn't convince them. Well, it's about time I thought to bring you two to the outside world. Yes, really? That's why Ardis appeared to compromise. However, that's after you two can defeat Tarukta. E. That's impossible. Ruktas are, a little. At least let it be a twin swords. No, you two able to defeat Tarukta will be the condition that I will bring you two outside the forest. Even for Kyril, I looked after him until he could defeat Tarukta on his own. After Kyril can do it on his own, only then I allowed him to travel in the forest by himself. Kyril's strength is now leagues beyond then. If he didn't step into the deepest part. Kyril probably wouldn't be in danger strolling in the Corsa's forest. Though in Kyril's case, he defeated the Rukta on his own. You two will be defeating a Rukta together. This is the most I can compromise. Is it okay? You, you, you. Yes. It seems like their memories had faded. Now the twins would act spoiled in front of Ardis and Nia. However, it seems like they still know when to back down. 
they wouldn't be pestering forever unlike other spoiled children. Knowing that Ardis wouldn't agree, it seems like they learnt when to back down too. Just endure this time okay? I promise I will bring you two together once you can defeat Tarukta. Un. Yes. The two nodded a little reluctantly. No need to be disappointed. Nia who was watching from the sidelines comforted the twins. The twin swords are no longer foes you to fear. I am confident that Tarukta would not be one soon. Let's see, it will probably take just about a month, about the time Master returns that you two will achieve it. Really? Near, we can win too. Fume. It will be a little strict, but it will be a fact if you are willing. Philia and Rihanna as well became motivated suddenly as they proclaimed. Yes, I will try. I will make sure to defeat Tarukta before Ardis returns. Um, that's the spirit. Seeing them like that, Ardis was relieved. It's no longer possible to describe them as childish as the twins are close to their age of becoming. Their height had already reached Ardis's shoulders and they had already grown feminine curves. Although they might still be a little active despite their age, thanks to Kyril, their common sense and speech are good. Ardis thought that it is probably about time that they be independent. The same time when Ardis felt happy at their growth, a sensation similar to loneliness spread within himself as he closed his eyes. Chapter 196 Chapter 196 The day when the young lady of Nyrestia Duchy departs for the cleansing rite eventually arrived. With an expedition more than 200 people including escorts and church officials, although it took some time for them to depart, they still managed to leave the capital on schedule. The carriage where the young lady rode was surrounded with private soldiers from the Duke family then mercenaries on the outer layer. The other carriages carrying priests and other officials had mercenaries as well while sandwiching the duke's carriage. In the middle, Ardis unlike other mercenaries were right beside the duke's carriage with the private soldiers. It is the proof that he is trusted by the young lady. The carriage was the only one different from the others with various ornaments and decorations. One can discern that there's someone prestigious riding it. From a security standpoint, it might not be the best idea but it's essential for the effect of announcing that she's going on a cleansing rite for the masses. What's important with the cleansing rite is not doing it but be seen doing it. There's no meaning if the young lady doesn't stand out. In the luxury carriage, there were two people sitting opposite of each other. One of them is naturally the duke's daughter. Normally thinking, her close female aide as a fellow passenger would be natural. However, the only other passenger on the carriage wasn't a person of the duke's residency. For whatever reason, there was the figure of Salt tilting her head inside her mind without showing her confusion on her face. Between the Duke's daughter and the Saintess candidate, there was another creature, a golden-colored beast coiled up. Cure. The beast yawned grandiosely. Within the silence, the Duke's daughter spoke first. Sorry if it bothers you, Sister Salt. They are still afraid now after all. Um, please don't be mindful of me. In the first place. It was the duke's daughter who invited the beast onto the carriage. Leaving aside the mercenaries who are used to it, there were probably no girls that would be fine after seeing a carnivorous beast spanning over a meter along. On top of that, they were close to the point of contact, even an adult male wouldn't want it. The duke's daughter was for some reason patting the beast in question without fear, however, all her servants were scared to the point of unable to stand up. That's why. Only the duke's daughter herself was riding in that carriage but, in the end, the only other person who didn't fear the beast, Salt was nominated as a passenger. Salt didn't fear the beast at all. After all, the beast was the one who saved her when she was in danger, and the partner of a mercenary that she's close with. In any case, I'm glad to have sister Salt here. The other party is the daughter of a credible bloodline. Normally, an ordinary sister wouldn't be allowed on the same carriage. However, because Salt is a known Saintess candidate. The Duke's family didn't express their displeasure, at least on the surface. In any case, the difference in status doesn't change. It's not someone Salt can converse with easily. You shouldn't force yourself to. The Duke's daughter seemed to be worried about her, as she replied a beat late. I'm alright, I'm not forcing myself here. Then the tropic ended, and silence visited once again, although it wasn't to the degree of being awkward. Just as Salt started to feel uncomfortable, the Duke's daughter as if recalling something grabbed the basket beside her seat and showed it to the beast. I've brought some sweets from the head cook, baked sweets or kneaded sweets, which would be better. It seems like she was planning to feed the beast as well. Just as Salt thought that she was treating the beast quite well, 
A human voice came from the beast. I like baked ones more. Salt wanna eat too? Eh, eh? Salt and the duke's daughter had round eyes at the same time. Then, the same question came from both of them in different phrasing. Rona, you are fine with speaking? Rona Sama, are you fine with speaking? Eh, eh? Again, question mark appeared on both their head. Then they looked at each other. Then between them. There was a suppressed snickering noise from Rona. You could have told me earlier if you knew. The Duke's daughter who was pouting at Rona showed an expression befitting her age unlike her serious face from earlier. Seeing her real face, Salt felt the strain on her shoulders lightened a little. I didn't know Sister Salt knew about Rona too. Likewise, it was a surprise. But if Sister Salt knows about Rona, then do you happen to know Shizu? Rather Ardis Sama? Yes. The first time I met Ardis San was when I was still a student in Mariul's academy. It's an embarrassing topic but, I challenged the Gorsa's forest with classmates while being conceited, and were rescued when we were in danger. It's already been five or six years since then. As Salt recalled, it was truly reckless of her. Although it still felt fresh in her mind, it had been almost six years since then. The ringleader between them. Hans Rick had already become a non-returnee of the war with the Empire. Salt is different from back then. Having undergone training daily, her healing arts are incomparable than before. Having more experience, she no longer finds herself lost in preparing for rites. Being acknowledged as a fully-fledged sister rather than an apprentice, she's no longer treated as an amateur. However, the only thing that didn't grow much in that period was her height. I wasn't the yet right. It's about few months after that we first met. Rona added on, and Salt returned her mind from reminiscing. Is that so? So you two have known each other for longer? The Duke's daughter for some reason looked jealous. What about Oju-sama? When did you meet with Ardis san It was about two years ago for me. I'm still receiving periodical lessons regarding swordsmanship. That's why he's my Shizu. I met Rona then too. Salt confirmed after hearing an unexpected word. S swordsmanship is it? Yes. Although it was an immediate answer, Salt asked again. Oh Jusama, you are? Yes. Despite how it may seem unladylike. Ah, pardon me. Although it was surprising to hear a young lady learning swordsmanship, it was even more surprising to hear Ardis San teaching someone else his swordsmanship. As she thought that her words had slipped, Salt quickly corrected herself. Q Kaku, that's right. I'll teaching a noble young lady swordsmanship wasn't a thing I'd imagine in a thousand years. But anyways, it just means that Al had interest in Minerva. Ah, not that kind. It's about Minerva having potential to be taught. Regardless of knowing what Salt thought, Rona described his partner with joy. I hope that's the case. The Duke's daughter seemed a little anxious while saying, It's Al we're talking about. He's not going to teach anything to someone without potential. Even if it's a daughter of a big shot noble, Al would probably just say who cares and move on. Ah, that really sounds like what Shizu would say. As the Duke's daughter was convinced somehow, Rona quickly changed the topic. Well, rather than that, let's eat the sweets. I'm hungry already. Fufu, that's true. It's the baked sweets that the head cook made after all. Leaving it to harden would be a waste. Taking the sweets out from the basket, the Duke's daughter fed it to Rona's mouth. Triple A, N, M N N N, so sweet. Rona's tail was waving left and right inside the narrow carriage. His tail was hitting back and forth next to Salt and the Duke's daughter's seat. Would Sister Salt like to have one too? E e, gladly, Oju Sama. Thank you for your consideration. The Duke's daughter smiled gently towards Salt who was still having a hardened expression. Please call me Minerva. It will be a long journey, after all, and there's only Rona and me here. No one would say anything. At the elegance and prestige, Salt was once again forced to feel the pain and difference of their education. The Duke's daughter is fifteen this year. It is the same age when Salt almost died in the Corsa's forest. Thinking about the difference in league of her common birth and the Duke's daughter in front of her. Salt felt a little miserable. Understanding that her offering was a method to shorten their distance, Salt confirmed with a mix of happiness and confusion. Is it really fine? As long as it's only in front of Shizu and Rona. I understand. As expected from a duke's daughter who can properly divide private and work, as Salt promised. And so, until we return to the capital, thanks for having me, Minerva-sama. Please call me Salt as well. Yes, thanks for having me. 
Salt Sama. Salt similarly replied with a smile at Minerva who was beaming. Chapter 197. Chapter 197. With nothing particular of event happening during the journey, they had made it to the first site without any troubles. Although they're heading towards a holy site, it's in reality just a remote place. There wasn't any people of the church living around nor any grand building. Although there was periodic cleaning, it's a place that people would visit only once in many months. The expedition was heading towards northwest, near the kingdom's border with the coalition. Resting a night at a nearby village after five days of journey, they departed on the next morning. Arriving at the destination before the sun completely rose, the monks and nuns were cleaning the surroundings in order to prepare for the ritual. Eventually, the preparation were finished at right afternoon, and the cleansing rite were carried out in a solemn atmosphere. It's the first time for me to experience such a large-scale cleansing rite. What about you, Priest Dret? While looking at the people already moving on to preparation of leaving and cleaning up, the plump-eared priest tasked the other priest beside him. That's right. Although I had been in several cleansing rites already, it's the first large-scale one I had. As expected from the Duke's house I guess. The priest whose name is Dret recalled his experiences with cleansing rite and replied. Although it was a cleansing rite for the Duke's daughter, she didn't have to do much actually. It only took her a few minutes to cite the ritual incantations and pray on the altar that the monks had prepared. The only thing troublesome was the preparation for that and the traveling process. Originally, monks that go on a cleansing rite are responsible for their own safety, but with a duke's daughter here, that's not possible. That's why. There were a bunch of escorts and servants surrounding the carriages when they traveled and the preparation work are all left up to them. There are voices within the church condemning about what is the point of a cleansing rite if everything was done by others. However, a cleansing rite for any noble young lady is usually a very good deal for the church, so there aren't actually many who would make a big deal of it. After all, the people from the church also needs to eat. Just like how an outfit store sells dresses, the church earns its living by selling the product cleansing rite. The cleansing rite this time was paid in a grand sum by the duke's house. The amount is enough to run the church in the capital for almost a year. It just meant how much the duke valued the cleansing rite for his daughter. Even if it meant having troubles with mobilizing that many priests and monks, there was no reason for the church to decline. Is the withdrawal preparation going well? Yes, although it is large scale, there are also many people with us. The duke's house is lending their manpower too. So it's going well. Satisfied by the answer from the plump-eared priest, Priest Dredd continued. If there's still time, we should give a chance to the escorts to offer their prayers too. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm sure the escorts would be pleased too. For the usual common folk, cleansing rite is not something they consider at all. After all, there's no reason to take rests from their job and go for a dangerous expedition for a cleansing rite. Although for mercenaries, it wouldn't be much of a problem if they're with their parties, but it would still mean a loss of their potential income. So there aren't many who are willing to do it voluntarily unless they're really devout. However, it's decided that the escorts and private soldiers will be visiting all three holy sites as part of their job. While earning, they can undergo the cleansing rite as well. There's no mistake that they would be gracious with the chance. Thanks to Priest Dredd's generosity, while the withdrawal preparation were being carried out, the escorts were given a chance to offer their prayers in a small group at a time. However, among all the happy members who were offering their prayers, there was only one mercenary escort who didn't leave the Duke's daughter's side. Black hair and eyes, a young man dressed in a short purple robe. He's the magician who had won in the Lotus Cup recently, known as the Countless Sword Sorcerer in the capital. The plump-eared priest hid his frown immediately and walked towards the magician who was conversing with the duke's daughter with a smile. Ardis San, was it? Yeah, you're? The magician who turned around and faced the plump-eared priest threw him a question. I'm a priest of the church in the capital. It's quite a while already but, we've met when you took an escort request for Sister Solt. Sorry, I don't recall you. It seems like he didn't remember the plump-eared priest. It's alright. It's only the second time I'm meeting you here. It was also a short period after all. So, you have anything with me? If it's about the escorts, then you should find someone from the private soldiers. No, it's nothing important. Did you hear that the escorts are also given a chance to offer their prayers to Goddess Sama? While the countless swords sorcerer visually pointed over at the captain of the private soldiers, 
The plump-eared priest stated his business briefly. Yeah, I heard it from Seoul just now. Arda Sam wouldn't be offering a prayer. Although other escorts were moving in conjunction to take advantage of the chance given, only the countless sword sorcerer didn't show any sign of doing so. I have to be beside Minerva. Although the countless sword sorcerer answered with an excuse of protecting the duke's daughter, it was evident from his face that he was displeased. There are other escorts too. There's no problem if it's just a few minutes right? Nope, I will refrain. However, the countless sword sorcerer declined without even considering the words from the priest. Why is that? It is a rare chance to offer appreciation to the goddess Sama right? Shizu, please don't be mindful of me. Rona will be accompanying me after all. Although the duke's daughter offered a compromise hearing that, the person himself seemed even more displeased. It's not like everyone worships the same figure. Sorry but I'm one. While the countless sword sorcerer seemed really irritated, the golden beast at his legs barked and covered his words. The countless sword sorcerer met eyes with the beast, and after a short while of silence, he once again refused the offer from the priest. No, I will refrain after all. Don't be mindful of me. Is that so? I understand. I apologize to have been rude. I will be excusing myself then. The plump-eared priest caught on that any more persuading is useless as he backed off. What happened? Did you find something interesting? The plump-eared priest must have showed on his face after returning to Priest Dret after excusing himself from the Duke's daughter. Priest Dret seemed to notice it as he called out to him. No, it wasn't anything actually. You certainly don't seem like that. I will be listening if there's something bothering you. Thank you. It's quite difficult to have everyone understand the benevolence of God to Sama. Speaking of his experience with the countless sword sorcerer, Dret seemed a little troubled as well as he consoled. That's true. It's sad to think but there are also people who don't understand the heart of our goddess Sama. However, they shall one day surely come to realize it too. In the end, we can only preach the teachings of goddess Sama. It's all right, I'm sure. The day he understands would eventually come. Yes, I can only hope so. However, unlike his words, the cloud in the plump-eared priest's mind didn't clear up. The tone and the anger that the countless sword sorcerer showed when he spoke of the goddess. It's evident that he does not like the goddess at all. It's not only the conversation he had just now that he felt something. A few years before, the countless sword sorcerer seemed to look at the people praying in the murals on the church's wall with hatred. That was like a gaze going against the goddess. While the plump-eared priest's thoughts continued to wander around there. Dret's words suddenly made him realize something. However, it's not like everyone worships the same figure huh? It sounds like he's worshipping someone else other than the goddess Sama. T that's. The plump-eared priest felt a shock going through his body. The unorganized pieces of discomfort fell together, and led to a single answer. At the same time, he felt cold sweat down his back. Impossible. There is only one god in this world. In other words, goddess Isra is the mother and the root of all. However, the plump-eared priest also knew of the existence of another god besides the goddess. In the ancient times, the evil god, Gress who was defeated by the goddess in the War of Gods. At the same time, he thought of the believers of the evil god, the existence of evil beings who are brought chaos onto the world. What is it? You don't look well. N no. I'm fine. Putting more strength into supporting his fumbling self, the plump-eared prize forcefully directed a smile towards Dret and decided to keep the scary thought to himself. The thought that the countless sword sorcerer is one of the evil god's believers. Chapter 198 Chapter 198 The time when Ardis was away from home to escort Minerva. One person was walking from the capital into the Gorsa's forest. It is Kyril. On off days of the academy, Kyril had accepted the job of teaching the twins common sense and words as a home tutor, that had continued for the year even when Ardis went missing. So it's the third year since he started. The travel to the forest that he feared of at the beginning became commonplace now. The malady that severs thine mind and the beckon to Maharoba, mold on sheep sleeping haze. He released it towards the beast stalking him from behind the bushes with a dangerous glint. The neurotoxin manifested from the magic covered the area, and forcefully put the creature into sleep. The horn on the beast that was peeking at him stopped moving. Without resisting against the sleeping magic that Kyril released, the targeted beast's consciousness flew away. However, 
Cairo could never let his tension down. It is the most dangerous when one thinks it is over. It is what Ardis taught him many times when Kyril was being thrown around like a rag in his training. Kyril heard the rustle of leaves while his focus never dropped. Just as he turned to the woods on the right, there was the figure of another beast of the same type that he just put to sleep. It is a six-footed beast with a hard skin. That's what the mercenaries refer as twin swords. The two chins on its head curved inwards having the sharpness to tear its prey into pieces. Was it trying to intimidate, it grinded the two chins together as it drew closer to Kyril. The penetrating pebble of, although Kyril immediately tried to attack, the twin swords moved faster. No matter how Kyril is known for his speed casting in the academy, the twin swords within 10 meters would surely reach first. While continuing his chant, Kyril kicked up the bunch of dried sticks on the ground towards the twin swords. True to his aim. The sticks that were kicked towards the mouth of the twin swords were snipped by the two chins. It can be said a twin swords' instinct is to snip anything that comes in between of their chin. Although it was only a short moment he was able to buy, managing to delay the movement of the threatening chins would be more than enough for the current Kyril. The unwavering heroism of the night dash, Dissel, Earth, while holding down the twin swords with the staff in his hands. His chant finished. Even for the twin swords that has tough skin, its abdomen is vulnerable. The sharp spear of stone stabbed from the ground easily penetrated its weak spot. Although the twin swords' legs struggled in the air after being pierced in the abdomen, anyone can tell that it's a meaningless struggle. Its movement dulled by the minute. It would probably turn into a corpse soon. Phew. Kyril sighed grandly with cold sweat down his back. He was reflecting that although he was able to deal with the first twin swords quickly, he was ambushed by another. Kyril fears surprise attacks the most as he did not have the ability to detect enemies with magic like Ardis. Even though Ardis had taught him martial arts, Kyril is not at the level to be able to fight in close quarters with a wild beast. Dying if he let his guard down didn't change even after going through the forest for two years. The moment he finished his sigh after fending off the twin swords, suddenly he heard rustling from the bushes on his left, and then the sound of something slithering on the ground. Rukta? Something slithering in the forest would make him think of Rukta first. Rukta is a huge snake that can easily swallow a whole human. Although it's considered weak among demonic beings, it's still a strong foe compared to the other beasts in the forest. However, it's not something Kyril cannot handle after having two years of experience in this forest. Despite so, it's not like Kyril came here to subjugate it. Taking on a meaningless fight would be foolish, and on top of that, he might still encounter other beasts on his road. Fights that can be avoided should be avoided. Luckily, in the surroundings, there's a fresh twin swords corpse and another one fast asleep. If the Rukta is looking for praise, then it would probably go for the two twin swords rather than Kyril who is running away. Time to get away. Kyril quickly made a decision and sprinted out of there. Facing forward in the forest, he kept his focus in getting out of there as soon as possible. After eventually getting enough distance, Kyril slowed down his pace. It's not following, right? While calming his breathing, he focused all his senses into his ears. He felt the sound of his ragged breathing was more annoying than usual. Huh? There was no sound of a rukta slithering on the ground. What he can hear is only the leaves rustling in the wind and distant bird chirps. It's the usual forest. The noise that indicated the rukta chasing him nor a twin swords in a bush wasn't heard. However, Kyril tilted his head at the mysterious discomfort he felt. As he felt something was different from the usual forest in his hairs. He looked around. What is it? Not getting an answer even if he asked, Kyril felt an indescribable sense of discomfort wrapping around him. He focused more with his eyes, strained his ears, and felt the vibrations from the ground with his feet. Kyril continued surveying around for the unexplainable discomfort but, all he could see is the tall trees that covered the sunlight, and lushy green bushes everywhere. What he could only hear were the cries of animals that wouldn't be a threat and also the wind. Am I overthinking? Although Kyril still felt the discomfort, it's not like he can find out why even if he waited around. If he stayed around, it would be more dangerous for him. Although outskirts, the Corsa's forest is still known as a hellscape. After calming his breath, Kyril tightened his shoelaces and turned back for once. It is the usual scenery. While not able to answer the discomfort he had, 
Kyrill continued on his path towards the house with the owner absent. Outskirts of the Gorsa's forest There was Ardis's house situated in a place where only few mercenaries or explorers ever set foot in. In the familiar garden, Kyrill saw two girls a little younger than him crouching near a flower bed. It is the two students that Kyrill has, Philia and Rihanna. R. It's Kyrill. Welcome. The twins who had noticed Kyrill approaching waved their hands wide. The two that would be fourteen this year grew more feminine than the first time Kyrill met them. When they're still twelve, although their behavior still seemed a little younger than their age, it's still within tolerable zone of being deemed a little more childish than other fourteen-year-olds. With an adolescent appearance still retaining its adorableness, the energetic feeling of a wildflower decorated their faces. Honestly speaking. Kyril always thought they're both considered to be really beautiful. Although they were treated unlike human in the past and were thin, they could properly grow up under Ardis's protection, and have grown to have a good proportion. Even their bosom developed femininely. The fact that Kyril helping them buy clothing in the capital is actually a mentally stressing task was something Ardis nor near knew. However, Kyril had gotten close to the twins to willingly help them. Although his students, they're also like his younger sister at the same time. The twins waved as usual towards Kyril as he approached. Where's Nia San? In the kitchen. Kyril asked for the whereabouts of Nia from the two. It is because he needed to hand over the consumables such as spices that he'd brought in the capital to her. Nia is not around now. She went out to hunt for lunch. The twins replied Kyril's question with the absence of Nia. Is that so? Well. She'll return soon huh? Although when Kyril first started as a home tutor, there wasn't a case where Nia left the twins on their own in the house but, that wasn't possible when Ardis went missing a year ago. And that's why whenever Kyril visited once a week, he bought the minimum necessities for them. However, their daily food couldn't be carried over by Kyril alone. Naturally, Nia had to hunt in the forest, and as a result, the twins would be left alone at the house sometimes. The fact that Nia could do that is probably because that the twins would be fine on their own to a certain degree. On top of the fact that she had put barriers in the surroundings of the house so that beasts wouldn't approach, the twins had also learnt enough magic to protect themselves. Who? Eh? The words that Philia suddenly blurted out formed a question mark above Kyril's head. Who? Is there someone? He realized that not only Philia but Rihanna as well was looking behind him towards a certain spot in the dense woods. Prompted by the two peeking behind him with him in between, Kyril turned around as well. However, it is the silent forest as usual. There was not even a single animal. Philia Chan, did you see someone? Not glancing back towards Kyril who asked, Philia's gaze was locked at the forest. What about Rihanna Chan? Did you see someone too? Rihanna who was similarly staring in the forest shook her head and replied without her gaze moving. But it felt like someone was there. They're not here anymore though. Someone was there? In a place like this? Kyril couldn't tell if what Rihanna said was the truth. However, if there's someone else other than himself here, there's nothing guaranteeing that it wouldn't be an enemy. Kyril understood that it will be his responsibility to protect the twins as Ardis and Nia both aren't around currently. Let's get inside. And make sure to not leave the house until Nia San returns. Kyril pushed on the twos back towards the house and entered the house together before shutting the door while keeping an eye out. Chapter 199 Chapter 199 The Holgin Territory in the Western Nagres Kingdom The castle in the center of the city is decorated with luxurious furnishings suitable for nobles. Inside a room of that castle was a man sitting on a rocking chair. Master, the young master has returned from the capital. The old servant with white hair notified. There were five people in the room. One of them was sitting on the rocking chair. It is the previous Marquis Holgin. Another is the old servant who served the previous Marquis loyally. Then two armed escorts stood behind the previous Marquis. The last person is a person dressed like a spy kneeling before the previous Marquis. Tell him to wait for a while. We're having an important meeting now. Understood. I shall convey to the young master to wait in his room. The old servant exited the room after getting the order. So, since you've come here to report especially, you must have got something good? 
The previous Marquis continued their talk after getting interrupted by the old servant. I have determined the countless sword sorcerer's residency. What? Is that true? The previous Marquis who was taken by surprise leaned out unintentionally. Yes. I have managed to find the countless sword sorcerer's residency outside the capital. It is inside the Gorsas forest just northeast of the capital. Gorsas? In that kind of forsaken land? No wonder finding it failed numerous times. The previous Marquis bit on his nail in irritation. Explain in detail. Yes. Although I have tried tailing the countless sword sorcerer many times, he managed to shake me off every time. That's when I thought to change my approach, to target someone close to the countless sword sorcerer instead. That's when I found out there is a student in Mariul's academy who would purchase supplies and head out of the capital regularly. Then, although the student would return in that day, the supplies he had when he left wouldn't be brought back. It looked like he was delivering the supplies to somewhere, and just as I've tailed him yesterday, are you saying you've seen his residency in person? The previous Marquis overwhelmed the spy's report and asked. Yes, although it is still in the outskirts of the Gorsas forest, there was an opening and a house there in somewhere no mercenaries nor explorers would normally visit. There is no mistake that the house in question is the countless sword sorcerers. Magnificent. Good work. The previous Marquis stood on in an expression of joy. And it's not just that. What I've seen there, it will surely be use of your excellency. Who, <laughs> tell me. It is a pair of about 14, 15 years old dash, twins. Twins, you say? The previous Marquis was stunned at the totally unexpected word. Yes. The reason why countless sword sorcerer is living remotely in the forest is probably because of that. I am sure that he intends to hide the existence of the twins. Ho -o -o. I see, I see, twins ha. Huh? Starting to realize the meaning behind the news the spy brought, the previous Marquis seemed to get more and more excited. You have brought even greater news that I've expected. Let me have your compensation doubled. Just as the previous Marquis offered doubling the compensation, a knock was heard from the door. Father, it is me. The person who knocked the door said so and before waiting for a response from the previous Marquis, he opened the door and entered. It is a young man at least two folds younger than the previous Marquis. He is the current Marquis Holgin and the previous Marquis is actual son. I'm busy now. Didn't I told you to wait? There was the old servant standing behind the current Marquis. Seeing his expression, the previous Marquis could tell that his son ignored what the servant said and entered anyways. Why is father who is relieved of all duties and under house arrest busy? Shut your mouth. Even if I am relieved of my duties, my connections are still there. What kind of son are you to say something like that when I'm moving for the sake of our family? I have no recollections of anyone asking you to do that, father. It seems like you are plotting something again but... Please refrain from doing anything and instead tend to the garden or something. I will be handling our house. Who are you saying that to? Since when did you have the rights to belittle me? Not afraid of the previous Marquis even as he shouted. The son looked at his father with a cold piercing gaze and narrated the reality. It's since I have succeeded the house, so? Let me be honest, father. You are nothing more than an ex-Marquis now under house arrest. The acting head of the house is me. Please refrain from doing anything without my permission. Who do you think brought this house so far? You are also the one who brought it into demise. It was good that you tried to make my sister into the next empress. It was good that you made good use of the faction inside the army. However, the truth is that you failed. Thanks to that, Duke Nyarestia is now on our bad side. The crown prince is displeased and our rights of Lotus Cup was lost too. Whose fault is it that our house is now seen as a fallen noble? You cannot not know how much trouble I've gone through just to wipe up your mess. The previous Marquis was tied with words after being scolded violently. In any case, I don't wish for our house to become worse. Please don't do anything extra without my knowledge. The current Marquis Holgen is me. Don't forget that. He spoke everything he wanted to say and left the room. After his son left the room, the previous Marquis's anger exploded. Gu. It's all because of that hateful black hair. Kicking the rocking chair he was just sitting on into a corner, the eyes of the previous Marquis with ragged breath was lit with a dangerous flame. Unforgivable, unforgivable. A mere brat. I don't care if you're the three great demon subjugator or countless sword sorcerer, I will have you regret making an enemy of me. Convenient that you're hiding filthy twins. No matter how famous a mercenary you are, no one would stand with someone siding with the evil god. According to the teachings of the goddess, 
twins were the pawns of the evil god who had caused chaos in the world. The existence of the goddess which is believed by everyone no matter who cannot be ignored even by the royalty, even the Nagara's kingdom and its enemy. The Elamania Empire commonly believed in same goddess, ignoring the teachings of the goddess. The meaning of raising pawns of the evil god is something even illiterate commoners would know. There's a need to coax the church, and then expose the existence of the twins the countless sword sorcerer is raising. And naturally, the countless sword sorcerer would be seen as a heretic and his reputation would be destroyed. When that happens, no one would be willing to stand on that sorcerer's side. Even Duke Nyarestia would cut his ties to a heretic for sure. There's a need to visit the church. Ignoring the warnings of his son, the previous Marquis started plotting. Someone who is easy to manipulate, highly devout, and has a limited vision. The Holgin territory in the western Nagres kingdom. The castle in the center of the city is decorated with luxurious furnishings suitable for nobles. Inside a room of that castle was a man sitting on a rocking chair. Master. The young master has returned from the capital. The old servant with white hair notified. There were five people in the room. One of them was sitting on the rocking chair. It is the previous Marquis Holgin. Another is the old servant who served the previous Marquis loyally. Then two armed escorts stood behind the previous Marquis. The last person is a person dressed like a spy kneeling before the previous Marquis. Tell him to wait for a while. We're having an important meeting now. Understood. I shall convey to the young master to wait in his room. The old servant exited the room after getting the order. So, since you've come here to report especially, you must have got something good? The previous Marquis continued their talk after getting interrupted by the old servant. I have determined the countless sword sorcerer's residency. What? Is that true? The previous Marquis who was taken by surprise leaned out unintentionally. Yes, I have managed to find the countless sword sorcerer's residency outside the capital. It is inside the Gorsas forest just northeast of the capital. Gorsas? In that kind of forsaken land? No wonder finding it failed numerous times. The previous Marquis bit on his nail in irritation. Explain in detail. Yes, although I have tried tailing the countless sword sorcerer many times, he managed to shake me off every time. That's when I thought to change my approach, to target someone close to the countless sword sorcerer instead. That's when I found out there is a student in Mariul's academy who would purchase supplies and head out of the capital regularly. Then, although the student would return in that day, the supplies he had when he left wouldn't be brought back. It looked like he was delivering the supplies to somewhere, and just as I've tailed him yesterday, are you saying you've seen his residency in person? The previous Marquis overwhelmed the spy's report and asked. Yes, although it is still in the outskirts of the Gorsas forest, there was an opening and a house there in somewhere no mercenaries nor explorers would normally visit. There is no mistake that the house in question is the countless sword sorcerers. Magnificent. Good work. The previous Marquis stood on in an expression of joy. And it's not just that. What I've seen there, it will surely be use of your excellency. Who, tell me. It is a pair of about 14, 15 years old dash, twins. Twins, you say? The previous Marquis was stunned at the totally unexpected word. Yes. The reason why countless sword sorcerer is living remotely in the forest is probably because of that. I am sure that he intends to hide the existence of the twins. Ho -oo -oo. I see, I see, twins ha. Huh? Starting to realize the meaning behind the news the spy brought, the previous Marquis seemed to get more and more excited. You have brought even greater news that I've expected. Let me have your compensation doubled. Just as the previous Marquis offered doubling the compensation, a knock was heard from the door. Father, it is me. The person who knocked the door said so and before waiting for a response from the previous Marquis, he opened the door and entered. It is a young man at least two folds younger than the previous Marquis. He is the current Marquis Holgin and the previous Marquis's actual son. I'm busy now. Didn't I told you to wait? There was the old servant standing behind the current Marquis. Seeing his expression, the previous Marquis could tell that his son ignored what the servant said and entered anyways. Why is father who is relieved of all duties and under house arrest busy? Shut your mouth. Even if I am relieved of my duties, my connections are still there. What kind of son are you to say something like that when I'm moving for the sake of our family? I have no recollections of anyone asking you to do that, father. It seems like you are plotting something again but, 
Please refrain from doing anything and instead tend to the garden or something. I will be handling our house. Who are you saying that to? Since when did you have the rights to belittle me? Not afraid of the previous Marquis even as he shouted. The son looked at his father with a cold piercing gaze and narrated the reality. It's since I have succeeded the house, so? Let me be honest. Father, you are nothing more than an ex marquis now under house arrest. The acting head of the house is me. Please refrain from doing anything without my permission. Who do you think brought this house so far? You are also the one who brought it into demise. It was good that you tried to make my sister into the next empress. It was good that you made good use of the faction inside the army. However, the truth is that you failed. Thanks to that, Duke Nyarestia is now on our bad side. The crown prince is displeased and our rights of Lotus Cup was lost too. Whose fault is it that our house is now seen as a fallen noble? You cannot not know how much trouble I've gone through just to wipe up your mess. The previous Marquis was tied with words after being scolded violently. In any case, I don't wish for our house to become worse. Please don't do anything extra without my knowledge. The current Marquis Holgen is me. Don't forget that. He spoke everything he wanted say and left the room. After his son left the room, the previous Marquis's anger exploded. You. It's all because of that hateful black hair. Kicking the rocking chair he was just sitting on into a corner, the eyes of the previous Marquis with ragged breath was lit with a dangerous flame. Unforgivable, unforgivable. A mere brat. I don't care if you're the three great demon subjugator or countless sword sorcerer, I will have you regret making an enemy of me. Convenient that you're hiding filthy twins. No matter how famous a mercenary you are, no one would stand with someone siding with the evil god. According to the teachings of the goddess, twins were the pawns of the evil god who had caused chaos in the world. The existence of the goddess which is believed by everyone no matter who cannot be ignored even by the royalty. Even the Nagra's kingdom and its enemy. The Elamania Empire commonly believed in same goddess. Ignoring the teachings of the goddess, the meaning of raising pawns of the evil god is something even illiterate commoners would know. There's a need to coax the church, and then expose the existence of the twins the countless sword sorcerer is raising. And naturally, the countless sword sorcerer would be seen as a heretic, and his reputation would be destroyed. When that happens, no one would be willing to stand on that sorcerer's side. Even Duke Nyarestia would cut his ties to a heretic for sure. There's a need to visit the church. Ignoring the warnings of his son, the previous Marquis started plotting. Someone who is easy to manipulate highly devout, and has a limited vision. Chapter 200 Chapter 200 Hey, is leaving that girl alone really fine? Rona asked Tardis while taking notice of the presence behind them as they returned to their home in the forest. Finishing the escort request with Minerva, there was a person tailing them as they were returning to their house first time in the past month. Although the person tailing them might be thinking that she wasn't exposed yet, for Ardis and Rona who can detect presences with mana, it is as clear as day. I mean, she would probably turn back soon. Ardis replied as a matter of fact without a shred of worry. From how Ardis replied, it didn't seem like he was particularly seeing the tailor as a big problem. Only those that have considerable skill can walk in the causes forest that has predacious beasts like Rukta all around. On top of that, Ardis had an idea on who was it that was tailing them. She had also been following him around for the entire month when Ardis went out on an escort request accompanying Minerva on her cleansing rite. How long is she going to continue this? Ardis muttered to himself. The person that had been tailing Ardis recently is the girl that he'd met on the night of the Lotus Cup semi-finals. As they defeated the assassins sent by Marquis Holgin, catching her thinking that she was together with the assassins, They've let her go judging that she's not with them. As Ardis said that do whatever you want if you're just going to follow then, chasing her away now would mean going back on his words. Since Ardis didn't think that she would be so devoted to continue surveilling him, Ardis regretted what he had said that time. Well, she doesn't seem to be of any harm currently, and we will lose her on the way anyways. After the Lotus Cup, the girl had tailed Ardis on his escort request out of the capital. However, it didn't seem like she was combative enough to follow Ardis through the forest. After all, it's normal to see that she would turn back every time as she stepped into the forest. Nn, it looks like she gave up. Just as Ardis expected, a little after the girl entered the forest, her mana signature dropped in speed, then slowly distanced. She's probably returning to the capital like previous attempts. However, just as she was about to leave Ardis's detection range, 
The girl suddenly stopped moving. Ah, it seems like she encountered some beasts. Arda similarly stopped in his tracks like Rona and sensed on his own. There were mana signatures like beasts drawing closer to the girl's signature. This size, it must be a Rukta. And there's two. Dot ah, that girl's done. Not my matter. Rona's tone indicated. The girl is likely not a normal town girl. After all, having tasked to monitor Radis, she must have some skills of her own. However, Ardis thought that her skills must have been for against humans. Whether it would be used against wild carnivorous beasts that even experienced mercenaries has difficulties defeating is unknown. On top of that, there were two of them. Even if she ran, it would only mean extending her life by a few seconds. Ardis paid attention to the movements of the signatures. The girl who had encountered the Rukta immediately started running outwards of the forest. However, where she was heading towards was another Rukta. The girl stopped moving. The other Rukta slowly closed in from behind. Her life is like a candlelight swaying in the wind. Suddenly, her appearance stabbed at Ardis's heart. It only happened for a moment. Al, realizing something was up with his partner, Rona asked, while Ardis lowered the baggage on himself and said, You can return first. Hey, Al, you're not going there right? She's still a kid in my eyes. Ardis left those words that weren't even an answer to Rona's question and threaded back the path they came from. The girl's mana signature moved slightly even as she was sandwiched between two Rukta's. She must be trying to escape somehow. However, her movements suddenly dulled in the next moment. Can I make it in time? Ardis asked himself as he ran between the trees. Their distance was about 400 meters apart. No matter how the trees are being an obstacle, it's a distance that takes only a few moments for Ardis. However, a time that short is also enough for the two Rukta's to easily kill the girl. Eventually, the girl's mana stopped moving at one place. Since her mana signature is still there, she must have not died yet but, that might change too if another 10 seconds passed. Ardis clicked his tongue unintentionally, as two swords manifested from the cracks of space he made. It is the gate that connected between the two worlds that he had finally managed to make after experiencing traveling between the two worlds. Although it is only about a sword's width that Ardis's can create. Storing his flying swords would still prove to be an invaluable technique. Summoning the two swords and suspending them in the air, Ardis released the two flying swords like arrows. Thanks to the positional data that Ardis gotten with his mana detection, the two flying swords pierced the two Rukta's at the same time. However, since it's too vague to rely on mana detection, whether it will be fatal or not depends on luck. But at the very least, it will keep the two Rukta's busy for a few moments. That's more than enough for Ardis. Sure, the Rukta's cry of pain was heard. And a breath after that, Ardis managed to see them. He caught sight of the two Rukta's first, and then the girl collapsed in the middle with blood. One Rukta had the sword pierced in its neck, and the other had it in the torso. The Rukta that was pierced in its neck could only sporadically move at that point. It was a critical hit. It will probably die on its own even if Ardis didn't do anything further to it. As for the other, although its movements was dulled by a little, its gaze finding the owner of the sword found Ardis. The Rukta hissed threateningly at the new target. However, for Ardis, a Rukta is only a slightly larger beast. It's not even an opponent worth considering. Creating blades of wind its neck fell off in the next moment. Without even time for it to cry in pain, the Rukta stopped being alive, as Ardis approached the collapsed girl. Oi, still alive? As he called out, he verified the severity of the wounds. It seems like the girl had already passed out, as there was no response to Ardis's question. Her abdomen were dyed in red with blood, and the pool of blood continued increasing. She will definitely die within five minutes if left alone. My goodness. What happened? Al. A stunned voice came from behind. There's no need to see who it is at this point. As Ardis turned around, he said to himself after seeing the baggage that Rona carried. Nice timing. From the baggage that Ardis carried just now, Ardis took out a vial of medicine and opened its seal. A. Hey, you're using that? It's the highest rank restorative medicine that could be bought in the capital. With its potential of healing wounds of someone on the verge of death. It is considered a super expensive item pricing at 5 gold coins a vial. It's something mercenaries and explorers carried for an unfortunate occasion. It's such a waste. Ardis immediately poured it on the girl's wounds. Without any hesitation, as Rona watched aloofly, tossing away the empty medicine bottle, Ardis stood up while carrying the girl. What, 
your following, Philia and Rihanna will probably be unhappy seeing me return alone anyways. Rona followed with a face of having no other choice. Ardis moved to about the entrance of the forest and laid the girl there in view of the highway, and put up a magical barrier in the surroundings. Although it can only last for half a day, Ardis expected the girl to wake up before then. The barrier can defend against beasts of Richter's level but, in the first place, there's not many beasts loitering near the entrance of the forest anyways. Although not a guarantee, her life shouldn't be a danger here. Did your mind sway? Rona asked from the side as they went back towards the forest after verifying the girl's safety. Ardis couldn't answer his question. It's because he couldn't deny it fully. No matter her intentions, Ardis certainly wasn't keen of getting tailed constantly. If it was an adult, Ardis probably wouldn't have spared any thoughts. However, Seeing that her age is close to the twins and Minerva, it made Ardis troubled. I didn't know. Eh? Didn't know what? No, it's nothing. No matter if it's Philia or Rihanna, Kyril, or even Minerva. It felt like he was soft on children, as Ardis realized for the first time himself, who was robbed of his innocent childhood mercilessly. Then getting rescued by one man, protected, and given many things. Although he didn't know it before. It seems like that had given a large influence to his actions, perhaps he wanted to become like his respected benefactor by doing the same things. It's probably also because that he had arrived in this world where he has leeway to care for others, having came from a world where it took his all just to survive. After all, with death being so close by there, he didn't have any time to think about that before. The unidentified girl that he had saved just now and the young boys and girls he'd met in this world. Questions that could not be answered manifested inside Ardis. Even though they were all born as human, why is there such a difference just because he happened to be born there? With a mind full of questions that cannot be solved, Ardis hastened his pace towards the house where the people he should protect resided. If you just want to support me or have a particular novel in mind that you'd like to request please join my Kofi or Patreon the links are below. Once again thank you more more clan.